Welcome everyone to this World Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Trainees Day, Pediatric Ophthalmology in a Day. My name is John Ferris. I'm a consultant pediatric ophthalmologist in Cheltenham General Hospital, which is in the southwest of England. I'm also the surgical skills faculty lead for the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. Today was meant to have been a regional training day for the trainees in the Severn Deanery, uh, but I made the mistake of uh, inviting my good friend David Granite to give the final lecture of the day. David, as many of you will know, is one of the founding members of the World Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. And uh, being a New Yorker and now living in California, David always thinks bigger and better. So he looked at the program we'd put together and thought, John, this isn't just for a regional training day. Let's make this a global event for trainees. And as always, uh, David got his way and hence the creation of what I hope will be a fantastic day of education. We hope to be able to be joined by people from across the globe over the next eight hours. But if you're only able to join us for a short period of time, uh, don't worry, this will be visible uh, on uh, available on YouTube to watch uh, uh, at your leisure uh, at a time zone that uh, is perhaps more friendly. So. One of the themes of today really is to look at paediatric ophthalmology from a trainee's perspective. And of course, we can't cover all of paediatric ophthalmology in a day, but what we want to do and what I've asked my uh, fellow panellists to do is to focus on the aspects of their topic that would be relevant to a, a trainee rather than the minutiae that might be of more interest to paediatric uh, ophthalmologists. Uh, I'm going to be using the format that WSPOS have used successfully over 20 times since the pandemic for some of their amazingly educational uh, webinars. So WSPOS's motto is that expertise resides all over the world. And the panel today is testimony to that. So this morning, we're kicking off with our two good friends from Australia, Matt Spargo and Parth Shah, who'll be talking about pediatric cataract and pediatric glaucoma, respectively. We'll then move on to a joint talk that I'm doing with Rebecca Jones, who's one of my current trainees, looking at the experience of uh, the paediatric clinic in a single day in, in November, just to show the breadth of practice that we as paediatric ophthalmologists can encounter in a routine clinic in a small district general hospital. After a coffee break, we're going to be joined by Kathy Williams from the Bristol Eye Hospital, who's a world expert in the field of cerebral visual impairment. And following on from that, Andrew Dick, Professor Andrew Dick, who is, uh, an, again, an internationally renowned expert in the field of uveitis, talking about paediatric uh, uveitis. After lunch, we will have the tour de force of the founding fathers of uh, WISPOS. Ramesh Kakanaya from uh, Hyderabad will be talking about the burden of uh, global blindness uh, in children and how the LV Prasad and their sister hospitals have been uh, addressing the sort of high volume of cases that... Uh, uh, they encounter in that part of India. It'll be followed by Ken Nishil, uh, uh, who will be talking about pediatric corneal problems and many trainees, you know, concerned if they're working in casualty departments, the child with the red eye, the photophobic eye, how to deal with, with that. Uh, and then David Granite will be reprising a lecture that he gave a number of years ago, which I find absolutely fascinating, how to uh, deal with a, perhaps an uncooperative child in, in clinic. And one of the things that trainees worry most about when they're encountering a children for the first time is how to interact with kids and how to examine them. And David uh, will be giving us his top tips for e examining children. And we're going to close the day with a presentation on strabismus surgery training. I'll be joined by Yining Strube from Canada and David Granite, and we'll be talking a little bit about WISPOS's plans for uh, improving the quality of strabismus surgery training across the globe and also announcing arrangements for a live uh, digital and um, virtual surgical uh, workshop that WISPOS will be running in March and we'll be looking for trainees to volunteer to take part in that groundbreaking event. So without further ado I'm going to pass over to Matt Spargo Matt uh, is a fellowship trained paediatric ophthalmologist in Cheltenham and Birmingham. Uh, he then come back to Sydney where he is a consultant at the Sydney Children's Hospital and he's in charge, he's the training programme director for the registrars at the Prince of Wales Hospital. Matt, thank you so much uh, for join us, joining us and uh, we're looking forward to your presentation on paediatric cataracts. We will have 10 minutes at the end for questions, so for people watching, please 
ping the questions uh, to us. Uh, I will uh, collate those and put them to Matt at the end of uh, the, the talk. Thanks, Matt. Thanks very much, John. I'll just share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, thank you again uh, for the kind invitation to talk about paediatric cataract to the trainees at a, at a trainee level. Um, I had an amazing experience over in uh, Cheltenham and Birmingham and in Oxford, uh, learning from some uh, incredible consultants. And um, a lot of what I'm talking about today were, were messages and, and pearls that I learned from you guys. So it's a pleasure to be able to pass on some advice. So just some disclosures and acknowledgements, uh, no financial disclosures. I'd just like to acknowledge Mr. John Ainsworth, some of the images from this uh, PowerPoint are from him. Uh, and I thought I'd start with a case. So you're in your clinic and the GP gives you a call and tells you that there's a little baby at four weeks old. Mum and dad have brought the baby to the GP because they're worried about seeing some white things in the eyes. And uh, the GP says that there are some reduced red reflexes being worse in the left eye. Uh, you bring them in the next day and mum and dad are pretty anxious. This is their first baby. Um, and you open the lids and this is what you see. So you can see here that there's a pretty dense opacity um, in the middle of the lens. Uh, this child's been dilated with uh, a partial red reflex surrounding the opacity. And so this child um, has a cataract. And so today we're just going to talk about, you know, how do we identify the cause of, of the paediatric cataract? Um, how do you offer a solution to the family and what are the various options and a practical um, interpretation of the surgery? Um, and then how do you communicate with the family members? So starting with identifying the cause. Before you identify a cause for a problem, you really have to understand the cause. Um, and so we're just going to spend a little bit of time learning about um, paediatric cataracts. And a lot of this is related to congenital cataracts or infantile cataracts. Um, so when you know the various causes, then you know what questions to ask and you know what features to look for in the examination and what investigations to organise. So uh, most um, congenital cataracts are bilateral. Um, and of the bilateral that present, the majority are idiopathic. That particular number is probably reducing now with next generation sequence testing. Um, but, you know, there's still a numerous number that, that we really don't find the answer or the, the reason why the cataracts are present. The next major subset is hereditary and mainly autosomal dominant in most parts of the world. Then there are some ocular causes and, and then the systemic causes comes last. Um, and we'll talk, I'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, but they're, they're infrequent to have a systemic association with the, cat, the cataracts. Unilateral cataracts, often idiopathic or an underlying ocular cause such as persistent fetal vasculature or anterior segment dysgenesis. Um, and then some unilateral cataracts uh, have posterior lentiglobus or lenticonus, and those terms are often interchanged, and that's an, an outpouching at the posterior aspect of the crystalline lens. And then rarely unilateral cataracts are systemic. And so of the systemic causes, again, you sort of want to have a bit of an idea in your head what are the major subgroups of, of children or problems uh, who present with bilateral cataracts, um, almost always bilateral. And most of the time, the child already would have one of these diagnoses because most of these diagnoses lead to a child who's either failing to thrive or has a developmental problem or is obviously syndromic. But they can essentially be categorised into chromosomal causes, metabolic causes, maternal infection. And so that's quite important um, to ask about the antenatal history, craniofacial syndromes, um, renal causes and musculoskeletal. And then from an acquired perspective, so they're all the congenital or infantile cataracts, um, the acquired causes are typically can be categorised into these 
um, subgroups, and they usually occur in older children. So inflammation and most commonly being JIA, and you, you've probably seen children with JIA and, and cataract. Um, iatrogenic causes, so steroids, radiation, laser, or surgery. So, uh, for example, ROP laser occasionally causes cataract. Uh, trauma, children obviously suffer from trauma, and, and that's a common cause of cataract. And then never forget tumour. So like any um, approach to working out what's going on, you want to start with the history. And you've got the family there with you. Um, and in this case, it's a four-week-old. So you can ask the parents about the visual function. But remember, a four-week-old hasn't yet acquired the fixation reflex. So the visual function is not very helpful at that young age. But if the, if the baby was a bit older, then visual function would be really important. You'd ask, you know, did, did your baby smile at six weeks or... Have you noticed any funny eye movements such as a turn in the eye or do the eyes wobble? And have you noticed any funny photos with the reflexes in the eye? And so you, you want to use terms with the family um, that they can understand. So even though you understand the technical terms of strabismus, nystagmus and leukocoria, uh, you really want to use plain language. And then photography review is quite useful. So again, if the child presents a bit old, you know, they're a bit older and you want to, you're wondering how long that cataract has been present, um, you can have a look at photos. Uh, family history is extremely important given the, uh, how common hereditary cataracts are. Pediatric history. So with every child you see, they should get a pediatric history. Um, you want to know about the antenatal course, the perinatal course. Um, is the child developing well? What's their growth like, nutrition um, and immunisation status? Uh, and then medical history. So are there any known diagnoses? Are they known to a pediatrician already? Um, history of trauma, surgery, laser steroids or radiation. And then you move on to the examination. And, and the first step with the examination in children is your, your general inspection. And so much can be acquired just by looking at the child. And, and children, you really want to be least invasive to most invasive. So often you're your examination doesn't follow this particular um, sequence. And you, you really want to gain the key pieces of information first so that if the child's getting upset, you, you've got the key answers. But in a little baby, it's um, not so difficult. But general inspection, so you're looking for signs of systemic disease, obviously nystagmus and strabismus. Look for microphthalmia, particularly in the unilateral cataract. Um, and that can be associated with persistent fetal vasculature. If the child's again older than six weeks or so, and you expect them to have a reasonable fixation reflex by that stage, you'd want to assess their visual function. Um, you, these days with the eye care, doing the intraocular pressure is fairly straightforward in the clinic. You want to check the pupils to make sure that the retina and the optic nerve is functioning. So just because there's a media opacity, you want to ensure that the rest of the globe is is working or the, the other major structures. Um, red reflexes, so very important. So you really want to check the red reflexes when the child's undilated and also dilated. Uh, and so you can use your direct ophthalmoscope or your retinoscope um, or a combination. A portable slit lamp, looking at the cornea, looking for any uh, signs of enlarged cornea or changes at the cornea, looking at the iris for features of anterior segment dysgenesis. Um, and then you're going to look at the cataract morphology once the child's dilated, and I'll talk about that specifically in a minute. We always do a cycloplegic refraction with children and then a dilated fundus exam. And if, the, um, if there's no view to the posterior segment, then you're going to do a B-scan and, and check the anatomical structures or check that the anatomy of the posterior segment is um, normal. And then don't forget to examine the parents and the siblings. So just a bit on morphology of, of cataract, and, and you'll, you'll understand soon why this is important, but um, the morphology can occasionally suggest the diagnosis. Uh, it sometimes can predict whether a cataract will progress, and it can often predict the visual prognosis, particularly in these little babies where you're, you're not sure of the visual function yet based on its size, location, and how dense it is. And the easiest way to think about the morphology is to break it into three locations. Is it an anterior cataract, a central cataract, or a posterior cataract? 
And so when you're assessing cataract, it's, you know, it's relatively straightforward if it's a complete cataract, but most of the time it's not a complete cataract, it's an incomplete cataract. So you need to give, have some assessment and that also helps the geneticist as well. And so the, the different types of cataract, and I'll show you photos in a few minutes so you, you get a bit of a feel for what they look like, um, it can be categorised into those three locations. And you don't really have to know this at this particular level, but it's just useful to know that um, as cataracts become more posterior, they typically become more visually significant. And so generally the non-progressive cataracts are the anterior polar, assuming they're a reasonable size, a cerulean or a blue dot cataract, which you've probably seen in, um, in adults, um, or the polverulent, and I'll show you a photo of that. So this is an anterior polar cataract. Uh, it's, you can see that it's not very large, um, maybe two millimetres, maybe three, it's hard to tell. So uh, you'd be very inter interested to see what the red reflex was like undilated. This is a pyramidal cataract, cataract and this is a, another form of a, essentially an anterior polar cataract, a nice picture of an anterior signal OCT. This is uh, anterior lenticonus and um, typically seen in all port syndrome. You can see the outpouching uh, of the anterior capsule there. And so these can, again, give clues to the geneticists about underlying systemic disease. There's a nuclear cataract. Nuclear cataracts are often quite dense. They often progress very, you know, highly visually significant. A lamella cataract, that's what that one is. And again, they often progress and need to be removed. You can see that's quite large. You'd want to see how dense it is with the red reflex. It's a cerulean cataract, a blue dot cataract. And again, they are visually insignificant and do not progress. That's an oil drop cataract. So when you hear about galactosemia uh, and the oil drop cataract, that's what that looks like. There's a pulverulent cataract and it's named such because of the pulverized appearance. And that's like a, like a white dust or white dots that are in the, the fetal nucleus. And again, they don't typically um, progress. There's a Mittendorf dot. So we're now at the back of the lens and that's a remnant of the hyaloid artery. And you can see how visually insignificant that would be. And this is persistent fetal vasculature. And you can see there's a, a plaque at the posterior capsule there and some vessels. And, and these can be um, highly heterogeneous and the posterior segment can be involved. There can be contraction causing the ciliary processes to move in, uh, causing um, secondary angle closure glaucoma. Uh, so these are uh, often the eyes are microphthalmic as well. Um, uh, so these are a difficult entity to manage. Posterior subcapsular cataract, we've all seen those in our adult population. And this is posterior lenticonus. You can see that outpouching there. Uh, and they often progress. So investigations. Um, so typically, uh, depending on where you are in the world and how much access you have to a genetics department and genetic testing, um, depends on how you're going to investigate and who you, you are and who you are not going to investigate. Um, traditionally, if you don't have rapid access to geneticists and genetic testing, you, most people would not investigate unilateral cataracts. Um, but unless it was, for example, like a dense nuclear cataract where you might do a torch screen. Um, but things like persistent fetal vasculature, if it's unilateral, no need to investigate. Posterior lenticonus, lenticlobus, no, generally no need to investigate. If it's a bilateral cataract, probably no need to investigate if there's a positive family history. Um, and also the examination of the parents reveals typical cataracts and there's an absence of systemic disease in the child. Uh, also bilateral or unilateral anterior polar cataracts typically don't necessarily need investigation. And again, just to make that clear, these patients often do get genetic um, testing um, in many centres around the world, but if, if there's no access to that, then um, that would be the standard of practice. And so um, really your investigations, well, what we do is I, I liaise with the paediatrics team or the genetics department and 
alert them to the phenotype of, of this child and then I get their guidance about what investigations they like um, because typically I ensure that bloods are taken at the time of surgery. And traditionally, these were sort of the traditional investigations that were done. Um, and again, it's different now with uh, next generation sequencing, but the traditional gener um, investigations, there was a paper demonstrating that the, the diagnostic rate in the traditional investigative workup is extremely poor at the yield of 3.4%. And so we were, we were really looking for a better approach to diagnosing paediatric cataracts or identifying the underlying cause, which has led to um, next generation sequencing. And there are various panels that, that can be requested where um, numerous uh, genes have been identified looking or identifying the underlying cause, um, cataract panel, anterior segment dysgenesis panel. And it's really the, the gold standard. And you have to provide um, good phenotypic information because without that, uh, the geneticist is unable to really properly interpret what they're seeing. Um, and really the rates of pickup have just skyrocketed with this approach. I was reading that for isolated cataract, um, the pickup rate's now 70 to 85%. Um, and then there's a 63% pickup for underlying syndromic causes. And the other thing is that they're picking up inborn errors of metabolism that are amenable to treatment um, through diet or other therapies. So um, by identifying the diagnosis, then, then paediatricians um, can offer uh, the appropriate uh, treatment for these children. Okay, so that's find the cause. And that, that's, you know, that's key. That's really important. And then at the same time, you're going to offer a solution. And the first question should be, well, should the cataract be removed? And um, there's a few, thing that, few things that that depends upon. Um, first of all, obviously, the age of the child on the presentation. So let's say a child was four or five months old and had a unilateral cataract. Um, the, the level of deprivation amblyopia would be so severe by that stage that surgical removal of that cataract, if it was dense from... You know, day zero of life would would not really improve the vision um, in that child. So there's certainly situations where you're not going to remove cataracts. Um, is it unilateral or bilateral? Obviously, um, bilateral cataracts are much more significant. With unilateral cataracts, you've got generally one good eye. So certainly um, bilateral cataracts have to be dealt with if they're both visually significant um, and it's within a reasonable time frame. Obviously, safety of anaesthesia is paramount. So if a child is uh, extremely unwell or has lots of comorbidities, may not be safe for an anaesthetic at that time. Um, what's the visual prognosis? Are there other ocular anomalies? Um, so B-scan is so important. Um, and then obviously you also need to think about, well, what happens if I don't remove the cataract? So there are certain situations um, like mixed post, um, persistent fetal vasculature where if the cataract's not removed, there's a reasonable risk of angle closure and that suddenly an eye that doesn't see well turns into a painful eye that, you know, may need to be removed down the track. Um, and then uh, you, you're really guided by the density, size and the type of the cataract in those incomplete cataracts. So our non-surgical options are glasses. Almost always in paediatrics you can say glasses as an answer. Um, you can dilate the child usually madriacil, 1% in the morning and afternoon. You always want to check the pupils and the visual behaviour while you're doing so, though, just to ensure that it's working and making a difference. And these things are often temporising measures for borderline cases. So you might want to string out a child a few more weeks to reduce the risk of glaucoma um, and infant. And then obviously patching and penalisation. If there's any sort of media opacity, the brain is typically going to um, prefer the other eye if it's a unilateral or even asymmetric bilateral. And so that moves us along to surgery. And the in congenital cataracts, so in our example of the four-week-old, the surgical decision is not driven by the vision. You know, the, you need to make a decision about when to operate. Do I need to operate? How quickly do I need to operate based on how the cataract looks? And... Generally, if you can't see the fundus um, with the direct undilated or indirect undilated, then that's probably pretty significant. Um, obviously, you're going to check the red reflex 
dilated and undilated. As a, as a general rule, most cataracts over three millimetres, assuming they're in the centre of the visual axis, axis um, require removal, assuming they've got relative density to them. And then, um, and by density, I mean on the red reflex, you've got a very poor red reflex within that th you know, three or four millimetre um, cataract. And the smaller cataracts, less than two millimetres, um, you know, usually do not. And that, that's, this is a, a rule of thumb, obviously. There's always going to be exceptions to the rule. And then again, I mentioned before the location, um, the more posterior cataracts are, are more visually significant and knowing which ones progress, which ones don't progress can often be useful. So when to operate. So the reason we operate early, you know, as early as we can essentially, would be to avoid irreversible deprivation amblyopia. So every week you wait in these little babies to operate, you are inducing more amblyopia and um, reducing the visual potential for that child because the sensitivity to amblyopia at that stage of life is, is the highest essentially. And if you've got a unilateral cataract, um, that is even more uh, important because of the dominance that's created by the other eye. However, early surgery increases the risks associated with general anesthesia, but also with secondary glaucoma. So every week you wait, the risk of that child getting glaucoma uh, reduces. And so you can see here, this child has got unilateral glaucoma and has got phthalmos in that eye. Um, and once a child or a, an infant gets glaucoma, the prognosis for the vision uh, in that eye is significantly reduced. And the family starts on a pretty difficult course with often multiple um, interventions uh, and um, it can be quite a torrid time really. And you can see how this child is suddenly a child that probably that if a unilateral cataract that eye didn't have a, a, an amazing visual potential, for example, in a, in a left eye that sees very well, now looks quite different as well. So the psychological impact uh, that that can create down the track as the child gets older. And there's no clear evidence guarding the perfect timing of, of surgical intervention. So this is an excellent paper, um, and I'll mention it again at the end, but um, this is from a review of the literature from um, uh, the UK or UK group. And in the UK, the authors essentially agreed that most pediatric ophthalmologists would operate on the dense unilateral cataracts between six to eight weeks of age and then bilateral cataracts between six and 10 weeks of age. Um, and most surgeons around the world, I would imagine, would wait at least four weeks. Um, and those numbers up there probably vary around the world. Um, some places would be a little bit more aggressive and, and operate a bit earlier, particularly with unilaterals. Uh, but again, you're, you're taking on that risk of, of glaucoma the earlier you, you operate. Um, often bilateral cataracts, I think eight weeks is a potentially good sweet spot there. And then I can talk about um, some places we do simultaneous surgery, some places sequential surgery, and uh, just some advantages and disadvantages of each. So with a simultaneous surgery, the child only has one general anesthesia, um, particularly important for infants with comorbidities. Obviously, there's a rare risk of bilateral endophthalmitis and the operations need to be treated as two completely separate events. So trays, draping, different irrigating solutions from different batches, just to minimise any risk of bilateral endophthalmitis um, or TAS. Um, and then sequential um, cataract surgery, a more traditional approach, um, typically no more than a week apart. It's good to operate on the denser cataract first so that um, uh, if there's some asymmetric amblyopia, that gets treated while the other eye is waiting. The reason I say no more than a week apart, the um, significance of having one eye that's seeing well, well, reasonably well, compared to the dense cataract, um, again, incredibly amblyogenic, um, reduces the risk of bilateral endophthalmitis, but you've exposed the child to do two general anaesthetics and the mixed evidence on neurodevelopmental outcomes in that young age. So I'm now going to talk a little bit about um, some more practical aspects of the surgery. Um, and I think before we do that, or before I do that, it's important to understand what it is about the infant eye that makes the surgical approach different to adults. So if you can understand these concepts, I think you'll understand why the steps are different. 
So uh, essentially the, the R is significantly smaller. And you can see the capsule diameter is seven millimeters in a neonate versus 10 and a half in an adult. So that's the first thing, you're operating in a smaller space. The access to the globe is often difficult, getting the lids open, getting a speculum in. Um, rarely uh, the lateral canthus has to be extended to, to um, get better access. And sometimes there's microphthalmia. Uh, the AC is extremely shallow and there's a lot of posterior pressure. There's a hypoplastic and vascular iris, and you can get um, significant microchoria, as you can see here. Uh, so you have to deal with that intraoperatively. One of the major things about the infant eye is the lack of scleral rigidity, and I'll talk more about that. And children, uh, particularly very young children, have dense inflammatory reactions. And so post-operative management um, is different. So I'm just going to go through the steps or how each of the steps are a little bit different. Um, so if you can picture that you're doing a normal adult, adult cataract case, um, and I'm just gonna highlight sequentially as you would normally do in an adult cataract case, the various steps and which ones are particularly different. First is general anesthesia. So obviously not like an adult, which is under local, but you've got to put this child to sleep. And so you have to have an awareness um, of this child's safety for anesthesia and you might need preoperative medical assessment and liaising with the geneticist, knowing what bloods to order. And once the, once the baby's asleep, you do an EUA and you want to check the biometry, even though typically we don't put a lens in, but often you can use that to predict the contact lens that you're going to put at the end. Um, and also for some baseline glaucoma parameters. So you want to measure the length of the eye and the, that's the AL axial length and the HCD, the horizontal corneal diameter and the intraocular pressure. And the horizontal corneal diameter and axial lengths in, a, in an infant, if they get high pressure in the eye, their eye blows up like a balloon. And so if you've got a baseline measure of how wide the cornea is and how long the eye is, you, you know, or you can tell um, what's happening with the pressure over time when you measure again. And obviously you wanna look at both eyes very carefully. The wounds are different. So we typically just, in a baby, just create two small corneal incisions. We use an MVR blade. There are various gauges um, you can use. And there's two main approaches. You either, you've got two wounds. Um, you can either have a bimanual technique where you've got an irrigator and the vitrector in the other hand, or you can have an AC maintainer where the AC maintainer stays in one wound and you've got the vitrector um, in your hand. You don't typically need a keratome uh, unless there's an IOL to be implanted. And typically, if you are putting an IOL in, it's, it's easier if you can avoid making that larger incision until after you've removed the cataract. And the reason for that is um, uh, the anterior chamber stability. You don't want to have large wounds with um, areas where the fluid can come out. So moving on to anterior chamber stability, um, this is quite different. Uh, and again, it's due to a few factors, um, particularly scleral rigidity, or lack of, uh, and the AC will just want to collapse. Uh, the iris prolapse is more common, particularly if there's a large wound. So if, you, if you've done your wound, you've done quite a large wound for your IOL very early and um, the iris can come out. And there are a few tips to avoid these problems. So you use higher um, viscosity, ophthalmic viscosurgical devices, uh, obviously, we use an AC maintainer if that's the surgeon's preference. You want to minimise entry and exit from the eye. So if you are coming out with an instrument, um, you can inject some viscoelastic in the other wound or in the other side port so that you maintain the chamber because otherwise it'll just collapse. And you can ask your anaesthetist to keep the PCO2 at or below 30 millimetres of mercury and that can reduce that posterior pressure. The capsular excess is the next major Thing to deal with in paediatric cataract. Um, the first is access to the actual capsule. And I met, you saw that microchoria before. So you want to make sure that the pupil is big enough. Um, lots and lots of drops preoperatively. You might need intracameral phenylephrine. And then in a pupil such as that, you would need mechanical dilatation with stretching the pupil. Um, you can't use malugan rings in these little babies under six months. Uh, they're just too small. Um, iris hooks as, as a possibility, uh, but um, that can be tricky to manage the, the pupil. 
you can maximize visualization with tripan blue and, and maybe that stiffens the capsule because these capsules in these um, infants are incredibly elastic and the forces are, are totally different. And there are th probably three mainstream ways to manage the capsule in, a, in an infant. Um, there are other ways, uh, but these are probably the three most common. Um, this picture here is the two incision push-pull push technique um, uh, by Ken Nischel. Essentially, there's two stab incisions and then um, your rexus forceps are used to create um, basically various tears that meet in the middle and you've got a circular rexus. An easier technique is the vitrector rexus where you use your vitrector just to um, munch away and create a circular opening. Uh, and then as the child is older, and particularly if you're going to put a lens in, you want to make sure that you, you do a continuous curvilinear capsular rexus. Um, and really the two key messages there in these, in these babies um, or infants or toddlers or, or young children is because the capsule is so elastic, you really want to re-grasp a lot and you always want, well, almost always want to pull fairly centrally because otherwise it'll just run out. Another tip is to put in... Um, keep putting in more viscoelastic, heavy viscoelastic. We don't fake or emulsify in infants. Um, you don't need to hydro dissect. You don't need to rotate the lens. You use the, if you're using a bimanual, you've got your vitrectomy in your right hand, if you're right-handed and your irrigation in your left hand, and you pop the vitrector into the lens material itself and you start aspirating like you would for say cortex. Um, after an adult cataract case. And you start out at the peripheral part of the, the lens and you work your way around and it just gets sucked in. Now, um, with more solid cataracts, you might have to switch to cut mode on the vitrector and that deals with that and then back to aspiration. Most, um, uh, most surgeons these days uh, in babies uh, under six or seven months won't put in IOLs. Um, and many surgeons won't put in IOLs under two years old, and there's reasonable evidence out there, um, to, you know, backing that up, um, the infant aphakia treatment study and the IOL under two study. Uh, again, these are due to the inflammation, immaturity, and the ocular size, but those studies essentially showed that there was no advantage in visual outcome if you put an IOL in compared to putting these children into aphakic contact lenses. It didn't protect the child from, from glaucoma, the refractive outcome is highly unpredictable because there's a huge myopic shift, which you can't really predict well once you put a lens in at this young age. And, but the visual access opacification rate is, was much more common in the IOL group because the IOL essentially is this scaffold for inflammation and therefore you have to do further operations on the babies. Um, there was a thought that potentially the IOL had a positive impact on the family wellbeing to avoid contact lenses, but that wasn't found to be the case. However, there's ongoing controversy um, about this two-year-old mark because there are some other, you know, there's other, other research um, suggesting that once the children meet seven months old, this was the, these were the kids um, uh, who were operated on at the time of the infant aphakia treatment study uh, by a similar group of surgeons or the same group of surgeons who were slightly older and they retrospectively looked at this data, this case series, and they effectively found that um, in this group that those problems that you get in the younger babies, you don't tend to get at any higher rate in these slightly older babies. And there was no difference apparently in the seven to 12 month group versus the 12 to 24 month group. So um, you can have a read of that paper uh, and um, see what you think. But we did probably need more well-designed randomized control trials to, to really answer that question. Um, there are a few assumptions about all this. You know, you've got to, you're assuming you're not going to put a lens in, well, you've got to think, does, depending on where you are in the world, do I have access to contact lenses? You know, can I afford them? Is the distribution available? Do we have access to clean water, access to the specialist, optometrist, orthoptists? Um, uh, can the parents be educated and supported? And is there an ability to even insert the lens? Um, some parents aren't able to do it. Uh, some children can't tolerate it, um, and certainly that occurs as they get a little bit older. And then there's always a fake spectacles. And remember, when an IOL is in place, the child still needs 
specs because, you know, for near vision requirements and there's almost always an isometropia. So essentially the answer, well, the message is that IOLs are not this one-stop shop where you just put them in and forget about them because they often lead to visual access opacification in this very early age group. Um, and there's definitely a refractive shift over time that needs active management. Um, so moving on from the lens after we've not put a lens in, um, we have to manage the posterior capsulotomy and, and do an anterior vitrectomy. And the reason for that is again, from the inflammatory um, nature of, of, of pediatrics. So if you leave the capsule intact, it's going to opacify, so it needs to be removed. Uh, you can do it manually or you can do it with the vitrector. Um, but then if, if you do that and you leave the vitreous face in place, that also acts as a scaffold for pacification. So you need to do an anterior vitrectomy. And the vitreous is different to adult vitreous. It's much more, you know, it's, it's well formed. And so you don't typically get that, that terrible situation of vitreous coming up, you know, to all the wounds after you've, you've made a, a PCT or posterior capsular tear in, in, um, in an adult. It's a bit different. And you can approach these from the anterior approach through the corneal um, incisions that you made or, or through the pars planar um, posteriorly. And so that's often done if, if a lens has been put in the eye and you need to do the posterior capsulotomy and anterior vitrectomy. If, uh, if the child's older, you know, six, seven-year-old, you think they'll tolerate a YAG laser posterior capsulotomy, then you can avoid doing this. But if the, if the lens does start to opacify, you want to jump onto that laser quickly uh, because it, it will progress and it's quite dense. And so then the laser can't deal with it and then you're back in theatre. Uh, getting to, closer to the end of the case now. So um, we're going to suture the wounds because if you don't, the AC just collapses, the, they'll just leak. We use tenovicral typically because it absorbs. So you don't have to remove the sutures with a further general anaesthetic. And this step takes some time. So suturing um, often takes time because as you're, filling the eye to get the pressure right, the suture breaks and you've got to do it again. So you just want to take your time here. And then by suturing the wounds, you can sleep well at night. Um, ocular steroids and atropine right at the end, again, because these eyes are so inflammatory, some form of ocular steroid um, and then atropinize the child at the end of the case because you just want to minimize any risk of pupillary membrane or posterior sneaky eye formation. The post-operative care is different to adults. Um, again, you really want to treat these children with uh, a much more um, intensive regimen of steroids. Uh, so it might be something like two hourly of, of um, prednisolone acetate. Um, or, and you're going to might do that for a week uh, and then start to back off. But you have to be a little bit aware that even with topical steroids, uh, you are going to potentially induce growth suppression, Cushing syndrome, and hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis suppression. And that's been well shown now in, in a couple of studies. So punctal occlusion may reduce this risk, but you always have to be aware of this issue um, and have a bit of an understanding about that. We try to maintain dilatation to prevent um, posterior sneaky eye membranes. And so we give cyclopentolate or tropicamide depending on um, if the child or has a hypersensitivity to the cyclopentolate. And obviously we're gonna give um, our normal um, topical antibiotic as prophylaxis. And then once the surgery is over, that was the easy part, the real work begins. And this is the key, and I'm not gonna go into any detail in this section, but really the management of the vision post cataract surgery is what it's all about. And that is optimizing the refraction with good good refractive assessments and keeping contact lenses or spectacles up to date. Aggressively treat amblyopia, particularly in unilateral cataract, but often in bilateral, you, you know, there's almost always, there's gonna be asymmetry of the visual acuity. You wanna monitor closely for glaucoma, manage any complications early, and you really wanna care for this family because you're gonna be spending a lot of time with them because it, it really is a lifelong journey. And that moves to the last segment or last section of the talk, which is um, just a few pointers on communicating with the family. So uh, part of the brief was just to discuss how to communicate complex information. And I thought I'd start by, I think it's really important when you sit down with a family with a new diagnosis, 
uh, you want to have a quite a clear structure in your own mind about how you're going to approach it. And it's really useful to outline that structure with the family at the start so that they know that we're going to talk about each of these, these key areas. And so when you, you say, okay, we're going to talk about the diagnosis and then, you know, the various causes and, and then the treatment. And then as you, as you go to that section, you, you, you restate that heading, you know. So once you finish the causes section, let's, let's move on to treatment. And so it just allows the family to frame in their own mind what they're going through. It's imperative that you recognise the impact on the family. So, you know, you're dealing with the most precious thing in their life. So you have to show empathy. You recognise that they are extremely anxious and you, you acknowledge that. Um, you want to provide support, but you need to show confidence because they are looking to you to, to manage this and um, they're putting their trust in you to, to do the best job for their child. Always good to focus on the positives, but always be transparent about the risks. And just some practical tips that I think work really well. Um, and this is for any delivery of complex information. Uh, always important to get a private space. So never deliver information on a four bed ward. Um, ensure that the time is allocated appropriately. So don't, you know, make the family realise that you are not in a rush. You don't need to go anywhere. The, the next patient can wait, okay? You sit there until all the questions are answered. You use very simple language. Educational levels vary. Cultural backgrounds vary. Language varies. So keep it as simple as possible. Um, it's always good to encourage other family members or other friends to be present, just a few more sets of ears, because people get confused about what they heard. It's an incredibly emotional time. The provision of information sheets is extremely useful and models for explanation so that they can see what you're going to do. Use of websites and support groups, videos, if they want to watch what, what happens in the surgery, all that sort of stuff's available. If the patient's from a non-English speaking background, then obviously you need formal interpreters and information sheets, ideally in that language. Um, Utilise other health support staff. So hospitals are full of people um, who are there to help uh, uh, cultural liaison officers, social workers, you know, use these people. That's their job. Like I said before, you want to answer all questions and um, you really want to make sure that this family can readily access your clinic uh, in the future. Um, they may want to, they've thought more about it, they have more questions, they forgot to ask. You need to create that avenue to sit down again and, and just be available. So in summary, um, Pediatric cataracts are a rare but reversible cause of lifelong visual disability. So they're incredibly important and we can do something about them. You need to um, promptly assess them. So they need early assessment and diagnosis because if you wait too late, then the visual outcomes are poor. And so they need that early operative intervention. Next generation sequencing has revolutionized our understanding and, and will continue to do so. The surgical technique um, it's unique and it's tailored to the paediatric eye for those reasons that I mentioned earlier. Amblyopia is still the major limiting factor in successful visual outcomes. Um, and then families really do all the hard work postoperatively. They're the ones that are managing the contact lenses. They're the ones that are patching and, and, and you know, trying to do the best for their child. So you need to communicate extremely clearly with them, provide support and instill confidence. Um, there's a couple of references. Um, these are just excellent um, uh, resources for um, peer-reviewed, I suppose, or, or re review summaries of, um, of the literature on this topic. Thank you. Matt, just... thank you so much for an absolutely fantastic uh, uh, tour de force regarding the management of paediatric cataract. And I think your last couple of slides sum it up. Um, it's the relationship you build up with the parents. This is a, a lifelong you know, journey that this child is on. And one of the most rewarding things about being a pediatric ophthalmologist is to see these babies become toddlers and young children and following them through. And I'm seeing patients in my clinic that I first met 22, 23 years ago, now young adults. Um, but that's the initial meeting. Often the parents remember that day. It's in, in, indelibly imprinted on their mind so all those points you made making time you know uh, explaining the steps coming back to them is, is so you know so critically um, 
think, important. Um, but a couple of questions that have come through from the panel. You touched really on the controversy about IOL implantation, not so much in the small infants. I think most people agree that in the you know, four, five, six week old infants, most people are keeping away from IOL implantation now. But you did allude to the fact that the TAP study suggests that in those children, you know, three or four months What's of age. What's up? My name is Nick Number. Here for troubleshoot and in this video, to, I'll be showing you how you can disable your six week old infant. And we're really sort of waiting uh, further studies. Uh, and I know there are people listening to the uh, webcast, you know, who will implant babies in, in, in that age group. And I suppose we just have to wait and see what the, the, what the research shows. Mm. One of the questions that came through was the use of IOLs in unilateral cataract. Because certainly I've found that the unilateral cataract, once they get to a certain age, 12 you know, to 18 months of age, those children are very adept at flicking that contact lens out of their, their eye. Um, um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on the, the management of unilateral you know, cataract and implanting. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I think from, you know, in my thought process, if there's a unilateral cataract, it generally has to be dealt with more rapidly um, than the bilateral cataract. So you're doing surgery even earlier. And so you're increasing that, probably increasing that risk of glaucoma, where well, you are. Um, and if you put a lens in really early, then um, you're also pr you know, making that child prone to multiple operations with the evidence of increased risk of visual access of pacification for an eye that has a relatively poor visual potential because um, it's it, even with the best patching, it's never going to be as good as the good eye. Um, and I think if you're running into contact lens issues later, you've always got that option to put in a, a secondary IOL um, yeah. where you're going to have greater prediction of the refractive outcome once the eye's grown a bit more because, that you know, as you know, that first year of life, the rapid growth of the eye um, is, is, you know, can be quite... Yeah. I think the other thing we have to bear in mind is that a really aggressive patching, if you're chasing a good result, can actually uh, adversely affect the uh, visual development of, of the better eye. Uh, yes, yes. And that's yes. certainly been well known. You have to have that just in, in the back of your mind. A couple of technical eye, questions. Yeah. So one of the uh, viewers has asked about the posterior uh, approach to carrying out the, the vitrectomy, the concerns of getting vitreous incarceration in the scleral wound. Do you prefer sort of an anterior approach for your... Uh, vitrectomy and infantile cataracts? Um, I do. Um, I, I don't do a posterior approach, um, mainly because I haven't really learned that mm -hmm. approach. Uh, I think it depends which centre in which you train, uh, but uh, both approaches are, are really quite reasonable and I would defer to, uh, you know, another colleague who, who does do um, a posterior approach to, to answer that question. But, yeah, no, I think with the anterior approach, I, I don't usually have much of a problem with vitreous coming up so much obviously you've got your cutter on as you're coming up towards the wound but it, again it comes back to the fact that the vitreous is so different in pediatric guys than adults yeah uh intracamel antibiotics what's your uh, preference what to use um so typically it depends on the hospital and what, what's available one of the one of the kefs one of the the third generation kephalosporins um is what we tend to use um Kefuroxime or yeah. uh, something like that. I think it just it just depends on what what's available. And again, practices vary around the world. Yeah, I think the other really key thing that you emphasise, and I saw a child yesterday with bilateral congenital cataracts diagnosed by his mother, who's a vet, uh, had been missed by the midwife, even though she insisted at the, the time the mum said, "Look, you can see these cataracts there." Yeah. Uh, it is to really emphasize that the easy bit in a way is the operation and the hard bit is the journey afterwards and managing their refraction and the amblyopia and to get the parents on side and uh, feeling that, that you've got their confidence from the start is just key to that journey and I've certainly found over the years that the children who do best it's nothing to do my surgical ability, it's much more to do with the fantastic orthoptist, optometrist, and also the motivation and dedication of, of, of the parents. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the children that, that seem to do best. So that initial rapport that you develop is, is key to that. So thank you yep. so much for your time. Just before we let you go, Matt, we're asking this everybody today, uh, mainly for the benefit of our trainees, you're watching 
what's the thing that you love most about being a paediatric ophthalmologist if you were to what sort of sums it up for you why have you chosen you know, this subspecialty yeah uh, for your career thanks john um i think two reasons one is i i really enjoy the interaction with the kids um you know three or four or five six year olds who come into your practice um you just they say funny things you know you can really interact and play with them and um the relationship you can build with with young children if you know how to deal with them um, and David's talk should be terrific on that topic gives you so much you know there's so there's such delightful um uh little people children they're fantastic so I, I love I love kids is the first thing and then second and is that pediatric ophthalmology is one of the few subspecialties that offers a great breadth of ophthalmology um, where you can really um, do so much still and you're not really pigeonholed into one particular area. And so your skill set remains broad and you can, it, it, fantastic crossover to adults as well. And, and if you want to provide good adult ophthalmology in, in slightly regional centres away from the capital cities, then paediatric ophthalmology is brilliant. I wouldn't do Thank anything you. else any day uh, of Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Just before we path on to Parth, we've got some updates. We've got viewers from Egypt, Indonesia, Australia, Argentina, Russia, Mongolia, Sudan, and France. Uh, and you can see the Ken initials are awake at someone godly are uh, in uh, Pittsburgh. Good morning, Ken. So I'm going to path over to Parsha, my a good friend and uh, ex-fellow. Parth uh, is fellowship trained in Cheltenham and Birmingham and also with Ken Nischel in Pittsburgh. He's a consultant ophthalmologist at the Sydney Children's Hospital and the Prince of Wales and is the clinical lecturer at the University of Sydney. Parth's on call today and has got a child with ocular trauma to deal with when he finishes this lecture. So Parth, I will not detain you any longer. We're looking forward to your talk on paediatric glaucoma. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, and uh, thanks for uh, the kind invitation to speak on a topic, um, on another huge topic, I guess, but it's a really good um, segue from Matt's talk. Um, he mentioned pediatric glaucoma a couple of times. I think he labeled, um, labeled it as a disaster on one of the slides, and on another slide, he said it's uh, a very challenging condition. So that sums up um, part of what I'm about to talk about. Um, as, as with the theme of today, I've tried to uh, keep it uh, simple and uh, oriented towards trainees and um, talking more about uh, sort of an overview of pediatric glaucoma as a topic. Um, I have no financial disclosures in this talk. Uh, pediatric glaucoma, um, an overview of my talk, so I'm going to go through the various causes, um, highlight uh, the differences with adult glaucoma. I think trainees um, go through uh, learning a lot about and seeing many, many patients with adult glaucoma, uh, and they have a system in their heads about um, managing and assessing and managing patients with glaucoma. But um, unfortunately, uh, pediatric glaucoma is a completely different uh, kettle of fish. Uh, some practical tips about how to diagnose, um, including some tips uh, on uh, assessing a child in the clinic uh, and getting some clues about uh, whether or not they may have or, uh, glaucoma. And uh, I'll touch on some treatment. And um, as requested, I'll, I'll try to include tips and um, ideas about how to communicate with parents and the older child about this chronic condition. I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of the uh, mentors who I've worked with, um, uh, in particular for uh, some of the slides, as well as uh, teaching me about uh, management of complex pediatric glaucoma. So Ken Nischel from Pittsburgh, Joe Abbott from Birmingham, and Kim Tan, uh, my mentor and colleague here in Sydney. Uh, pediatric glaucoma is a relatively rare disease, but it does contribute to overall about 5% of all childhood blindness worldwide. Uh, a subset of pediatric glaucoma, which is primary congenital glaucoma, uh, has a rate of about 1 in 18,500 based on the UK um, population. The management is multidisciplinary and uh, often it involves pediatric ophthalmologists rather than adult glaucoma specialists. 
So what's different about pediatric glaucoma from adult glaucoma? Uh, well, um, first of all, the causes are completely different. Um, so in, pe in pediatric glaucoma, we don't talk about open angle glaucoma uh, or normal tension glaucoma. Uh, pediatric glaucoma is really all about pressure. Uh, we don't really talk about normal tension glaucoma in a child. Um, but the issue with pressure is that measuring pressure accurately can be tricky and often misleading. So although it's all about high pressure, the actual number is not as useful. The examination parameters that we use are also quite different. So uh, one important uh, thing about the physiology of the growing eye is that the sclera is very elastic. And with high intraocular pressure, the globe enlarges, and this process can occur until about age four years. So the presence of high pressure in an infant will lead to enlargement of the globe, and that's both the sclera and the cornea. And this, uh, when it affects the cornea, it can lead to rupture of decimase membrane. The reason why decimase membrane ruptures uh, is because it is not as elastic as the corneal stroma. So the stroma tends to stretch, whereas decimase membrane ruptures, and this causes a characteristic hub stree. The uh, term that's often used uh, to describe a large eye in childhood from pediatric glaucoma is bupthalmos. Uh, but uh, Ken Nishal taught me to try and avoid using that term, especially uh, when discussing it with parents, because uh, the translation of bupthalmos uh, in Greek is an ox's eye. And that's not something that really sounds um, very pleasant for a parent uh, looking after a child with glaucoma. So I tend not to use the word bupthalmos and you won't see it on my slides, but you will hear it talked about. Another difference between a, a pediatric and adult glaucoma is that uh, we often perform angle surgery in pediatric glaucoma. Uh, and up until recent advent of uh, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery in the adult world, angle surgery used to be uh, primarily reserved for pediatric glaucomas. And finally, we don't really rely on visual fields uh, in pediatric glaucoma, and we don't have much of a structure function correlation. We rely a lot on the structure and the signs that we see. The classification of pediatric glaucoma, um, this is a system from the World Glaucoma Association. Um, so the first uh, is primary congenital glaucoma, which I'll talk about a little bit more. And then the secondary forms of glaucoma, there are four subsets. So there's one subset dedicated to glaucoma following cataract surgery. And Matt, in his previous talk, uh, alluded to uh, this in a few of his slides. Uh, another classification is non-acquired ocular anomalies. And this can include common causes of glaucoma, such as axenfeld rieger anomaly, aniridia, and other anterior segment developmental anomalies, uh, often termed Peters anomaly. It can also be secondary to non-acquired systemic diseases or syndromes. Uh, and in these, we think about connective tissue disorders, uh, familial tumor syndromes like neurofibromatosis. And finally, acquired conditions such as steroid-induced, uv traumatic, tumor-related, or retinopathy of prematurity. There is another condition called juvenile open-angle glaucoma, which has a specific gene called the myosillin gene, uh, which is a separate entity. Uh, there is uh, this excellent consensus statement from childhood on childhood glaucoma by the World Glaucoma Association, uh, and it's available online. And I'd recommend um, trainees to have a look at that as it provides a really good summary of uh, childhood glaucoma. So primary congenital glaucoma, uh, it's characterized by a specific look of the angle. And uh, this is a picture from taken from the uh, consensus statement. And you can see that the angle structures uh, do not look normal. In particular, uh, the ciliary body band uh, is not visible, and therefore the trabecular mesh shock is also um, hidden behind this amorphous tissue uh, that's uh, present here in the angle. 
the term congenital uh, can be misleading because primary congenital glaucoma does not always present at birth and often presents in the first or second year of life. There are many genes that are implicated in this condition, and the major player uh, is autosomal recessive CYP1B1. This condition tends to respond well to angle surgery, and although more than one surgery may be necessary to control the pressure, uh, angle surgery uh, can lead to cure of this condition. Here's a patient who was referred to me uh, by a pediatrician for an isochoria. And when I saw the child, I could immediately tell that one eye was larger than the other. And when I mentioned this to the mother, she said, Path, I agree with you. I, I don't think my child has a Horner syndrome. And so you can tell that this, this, is, this child is just a few days old. This eye is clearly a lot bigger than the other eye. And the angle structure, I don't have a picture to show you, but it looked like that uh, picture that I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, the other signs that you can see uh, when the cornea enlarges rapidly um, and when it's more than 13 millimeters in size is this break in decimase membrane, which is usually horizontal and paired, uh, called a Harb's tree. You can see that uh, there's a scar here at the limbus where I performed a previous Godionobi surgery. Uh, and so it's important uh, to look for these clinical signs. And this is a, the same eye uh, with the transillumination. The anomalies, the most important ones to think about are Axenfeld-Riga, which are associated with FOXC1 and PIDX2 genes. Uh, Aniridia, which is a panocular condition related to the PAC6 gene mutation. Uh, and anterosegment developmental anomalies, previously known as Peter's anomaly. This child uh, that I've shown you a photo of has um, an eye that was like this from birth and uh, has a phenotype which is likely related to axenfeld Riga. The other iris is not normal, either has similar. As in uh, all pediatric diseases, we have to think about the possibility that the condition that we're seeing may be related to a systemic disease or a syndrome. Pediatric glaucoma, which is related to systemic diseases, can include things like a port wine stain or sturge weber syndrome, neurofibromatosis type 1, uh, ocular dermal melanocytosis, also known as nevus of ota, and other syndromes such as low syndrome, which is ocular cerebrorenal syndrome. Ectopia lenta, secondary to Marfan syndrome or homocystinuria can present with sudden onset angle closure. And congenital rubella can also present with uh, glaucoma at birth. It's interesting that. Uh, out of these conditions, there are two that can present with simultaneous congenital cataract and glaucoma, and they, they are low syndrome and congenital rubella. Here's an example of a child with a port wine stain, uh, which is extending onto the uh, episclera uh, of the left eye and causing glaucoma. Periocular port wine stains are often associated with ipsilateral glaucoma, often if they involve the eyelid uh, or there's an episcleral capillary vascular malformation. These children need specific surgical treatment to avoid hypotony. Now, assessing and managing uh, pediatric glaucoma. So I'll go through the clinical approach and first and foremost is the history. So when talking to parents about what uh, symptoms uh, to watch out for with glaucoma. The classic triad of pediatric glaucoma is photophobia, tearing, and blepharospasm. And either one or all of these may be present uh, in children with glaucoma. But it's important to remember that all of these symptoms, photophobia, watering, and blepharospasm, have a huge differential diagnosis. So a child who comes in with a watery eye um, is not always going to be a blocked tear duct. So any child with the watery eye, um, don't call it a blocked tear duct until you've checked that they don't have glaucoma. But if a patient comes in with a classic triad of photophobia, tearing, and blepharospasm, glaucoma has to be right up there. You ask the parent what they think, what you think, uh, what they think the child's visual function is. And that helps us to determine um, potentially how long the disease has been going on for. In terms of the family history, uh, any ocular anomalies or known uh, history of glaucoma is helpful. 
But often I see patients who have axenfeld rieger syndrome and you look at one of the parents uh, and they have the ocular phenotype but are unaware that they have this condition. Okay, so moving on to the clinical examination. Visual function, uh, so we measure age-appropriate visual acuity. We look for an enlarged eye, including an enlarged cornea. The corneal edema and haze is a critical factor of the examination and can often tell us about uh, the pressure. So the degree of iris detail that you can see tells us um, is a proxy of what the pressure might be. I showed you some examples earlier of Harb's tree, which is a distinct clinical uh, sign seen in pediatric glaucomas when the cornea enlarges, usually greater than 13 millimeters in diameter. Elevated pressure. And I've put the pressure actually lower down the importance of the clinical signs. And this is because intraocular pressure measurement in infancy and early childhood is often unreliable and cannot definitively contribute always to diagnosis and management of the condition. Uh, optic nerve cupping uh, is an important sign to look for. Uh, often the optic nerve can be difficult to visualize with the hazy cornea, but optic nerve cupping in pediatric glaucoma is reversible with treatment. Finally, a clue that there may be uh, glaucoma developing is progressive myopia on the refraction. So a child with aphatic glaucoma uh, may not necessarily present with uh, tearing or photophobia, but may have a rapid change in their aphatic spectacle or contact lens prescription. And this, this should be a clue towards the possibility of glaucoma. Finally, all of these uh, signs look for asymmetry uh, for in, in cases of unilateral disease. Just to talk a little bit more about measurement of intraocular pressure, it's important that the child is relaxed and they're not crying or squeezing their eyelids uh, when you're taking the measurement. The most common method of taking pressures in children now uh, in most centers around the world that have access to it is the eye care uh, machine. Uh, and the newer models um, also allow measurement uh, against gravity. Uh, Applanation may be possible if the child is sedated or in the operating room. But often in abnormal eyes, digital tonometry uh, with uh, both index fingers may be the most useful method of measuring pressure in children. So these children who are at risk of and who have glaucoma require serial examinations. And this can be um, quite traumatic for the child. Uh, They're often in the clinic every few weeks or months and they know what's coming their way. So if in a cooperative child, we can examine them awake, then that's ideal. But I often find that uh, the child who's asleep um, may be easier to examine. So a longer wait time in the waiting room, uh, or ideally um, ask the parents to uh, bring a bottle and feed the child or breastfeed the infant uh, and examine them immediately after. Uh, if the mother's comfortable, you can even examine the child uh, when they're actually feeding. Often an exam under anesthesia is, the, is required uh, for the diagnosis and the treatment of this condition. So I put in a couple of slides on the exam under anesthesia because that's something unique to pediatric glaucoma. And a lot of these children require multiple exams, and it's important that trainees be familiar with the signs to look for and become slick at doing it. Preoperatively, you may or may not wish to put dilating drops into the eye. If you're considering angle surgery, um, you may not dilate the pupil at all. If you wanna have a better look at the posterior segment, then one single drop of phenylephrine may be enough uh, to achieve that. And then you can install pilocarpine. Measuring the corneal diameter, then assessing the anterior segment. So the corneal clarity, anterior chamber, and iris and lens. Uh, this can be done with a portable slit lamp or a direct ophthalmoscope. Reviewing the optic disc with an indirect ophthalmoscope or the direct and performing a cycloplegic refraction. It's really important to be comfortable performing gonioscopy in infants. We all become comfortable with looking at angle structures in adults, but uh, if you examine a child who's uh, in the operating room for any other reason, um, 
have a look at the angle because it gives you an idea of what's normal and what's not normal. Infant angle um, does look quite different to a normal adult angle, even in normal lights. Uh, what we're looking for is a ciliary body band to uh, differentiate um, uh, primary congenital glaucoma from other um, causal or normal eyes. But the, as I mentioned earlier, if there's primary congenital glaucoma, the ciliary body band will be absent. We measure the axial length uh, to measure axial elong to look for axial elongation of the eye. And if there's no good view of the posterior segment, then a B scan may be necessary. Again, another point about intraocular pressure, IOP under anesthesia is not reliable unless it's done at induction. Inhalational anesthesia rapidly reduces intraocular pressure. Asymmetry between the two eyes may still be helpful in cases of unilateral disease if you're measuring the pressure after the child is asleep. So here's an example of the setup um, from the Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh of an EUA. Uh, so there's an indirect ophthalmoscope, a direct a retinoscope, portable slit lamp, a Perkins applination tonometer. Um, these are really useful um, discs which can help you measure the uh, horizontal or vertical corneal diameter. And uh, they're designed in a way that um, allows you to... In a newborn with a horizontal corneal diameter of more than 11 millimeters, or in a one up to one year old child with a horizontal corneal diameter of more than 12 millimeters, uh, it is likely that they have glaucoma. It's important to just remember some differentials for the signs that we associate with congenital or pediatric glaucoma. So a child with a cloudy cornea may have a corneal dystrophy, such as congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy. Um, or posterior polymorphous dystrophy. Uh, and an enlarged corneal diameter in the absence of Harb's tree may be related to megalocornea, which can be X-linked. One thing that I uh, often find myself reminding the trainees uh, is to remember to examine the parents and the siblings. Whenever you have a child with a uh, complex ocular disorder, uh, uh, which may be genetic in origin, always remember to examine the parents and their siblings. So you may be looking for syndromic facies and a specific ocular phenotype, which may be either related to uh, an asymptomatic disease state or a carrier state. For example, this is the mother of a child who I had treating, uh, who I'm treating with glaucoma, who uh, had not been diagnosed uh, as having axenfeld riga syndrome. Um, just briefly on axenfeld riga syndrome, it's a condition uh, that causes iris abnormalities. Um, the hallmark of the condition is a posterior embryotoxon, which is an anterior displacement of Schwalbe's line with adherent iris strands. This condition has a 50% risk of glaucoma, uh, which can be challenging to treat. Another condition that uh, we briefly mentioned earlier was aniridia, which is a panocular disease. Uh, despite the name being aniridia. Uh, these children develop glaucoma um, months or years after birth from progressive angle narrowing, and this may be uh, prevented by prophylactic goniotomy surgery. They also develop limbal stem cell failure and cataract foveal and optic nerve hypoplasia. So now to talk about management of pediatric glaucoma. Uh, as with adult glaucoma, uh, there are three main arms, medications, laser, and surgery. Uh, unfortunately, um, in pediatric glaucoma, we often um, have to surgery as a definitive treatment options. When talking to parents about medications, it's important uh, to go through with them a few basic things, uh, one of which is that all medications, when instilled even onto the eye as eye drops, can have uh, systemic penetration and side effects. So whichever medications you prescribe, it's important to alert the parents of the potential side effects to watch out for. To reduce systemic absorption, it's helpful to demonstrate nosolacrimal occlusion uh, and asking them to remove any excess that um, has not gone into the eye with the tissue. The mainstays of drops that we use in children are beta blockers, 
uh, and for the young infants, preferable to use the small, the lower dose of 0.25% timolol rather than 0.5%. Uh, and in some centers uh, and countries, a gel formulation may be available. Uh, Betaxolol um, is also an alternative. Uh, these children may develop a nocturnal cough rather than a wheeze, and it's important for the parents to be aware of that. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors can cause metabolic acidosis and growth suppression, uh, but can be useful in the management of pressure in these children. Prostaglandin analogs uh, are also safe to use, but can be pro-inflammatory, and I tend to avoid them in the post-operative setting. One important thing to remember is that alpha agonists are contraindicated in infants and young children due to central nervous system suppression. So please do not use bromonidine uh, or apoconidine in young infants with glaucoma. Oral acetazolamide can be used as a temporizing measure uh, until you get the child into the operating room. Uh, laser surgery, um, slightly different laser to adult glaucoma. So we're not talking about um, uh, selective laser trabeculoplasty, which we do with a lens um, into the angle. We're talking about transcleral cyclodiode laser. And this is a destructive form of treatment uh, to reduce intraocular pressure by reducing the ciliary body's production of aqueous. We tend to do this treatment for non-seeing eyes um, uh, as a heavy treatment to shut the eye down completely or to delay definitive surgery, such as a glaucoma drainage device, until the child is older. Uh, diode laser in children may need to be repeated, especially in infants when the ciliary body uh, can proliferate, re-proliferate. So the destructive form of treatment uh, to treatment reduce main intraocular pressure uh, by, by reducing by the ciliary body in a relatively normal structured eye or may require UBM guidance to identify the uh, exit, uh, which may um, not be where you think it is uh, in an enlarged globe. A new entity um, called Micropulse Laser. Micropulse um, is actually a trademark term by one of the companies, but it is uh, a slightly different way of delivering the same cyclodiode laser energy. Um, it's delivered also transclerally, but it is gentler on the eye and is thought to increase uveoscleral outflow rather than destroying the ciliary body. This may be uh, useful in some certain situations in pediatric glaucoma, uh, but it has not been widely studied. In terms of surgery, uh, there's a few things to talk about here. Uh, surgery is more challenging um, in pediatric glaucoma than in adults, and there's a higher failure and complication rate. And it should preferably be performed by a trained surgeon in centers where there's uh, sufficient volume to ensure uh, surgical skill and safe anesthesia. The options for surgery uh, could be angle surgery, uh, which may need to be repeated to treat more of the angle um, surface area. Trabeculectomy with mitomycin C, uh, which is similar to surgery performed in adults, or a glaucoma drainage device. Um, ideally, a long-term surgical strategy, including the surgeon's choice of procedure should be based on training, experience, logistics, and surgeon preference. Uh, and these are the these are from the World Glaucoma Association uh, consensus statement. Um, I won't talk about tube surgery or trabeculo trabeculectomy um, in this talk, as it's sort of beyond the scope. Um, and finally, some infants, unfortunately, um, with uncontrolled glaucoma, may require renucleation, but this is a last resort. The main thing to tell the parents um, and the older child is that multiple procedures are often needed and lifelong follow-up um, is essential and um, it can be quite a big burden. So just a couple of slides on angle surgery as you may not have seen these and it's unlikely that you would have the opportunity to possibly perform this sort of surgery um, in many centers around the world unless you're, a pediat unless you're uh, training to become a pediatric ophthalmologist. So goniotomy surgery um, requires a relatively clear cornea. Uh, my preference is to use a direct goniotomy lens. The positioning is critical um, and uh, the microscope is rotated and the head is rotated as well uh, so that uh, the 
angle structures can become visible while holding the gonio lens. So the positioning can be quite awkward and it takes time to get used to um, the, the correct positioning to perform this surgery. Viscoelastic um, may or may not be used uh, depending uh, on surgeon preference. Uh, a 25 gauge needle or an MVR blade is used to incise uh, the theoretical um, or what's described as Bartan's membrane um, across the angle uh, and you visualize the iris root falling away. You tend not to feel anything with the surgery. If you're feeling the needle um, going through tissue, then you're probably going too deep. Uh, in terms of the uh, needle itself, um, I've started using the newer disposable lenses, uh, which have become available following the widespread take up of uh, angle surgery in adults, um, as these disposable lenses uh, give a quite a good view of the angle structures. It's helpful to have a reliable assistant who's not looking through the microscope to cyclo rotate the eye uh, without pushing down or pulling up on the eye. And this allows more treatment area. I'll see if this video works. Um, so one of the um, things that I learned uh, when learning uh, goniotomy surgery is that it's really quite challenging. Uh, the surgery itself doesn't take long, but getting the view correct and getting everything into focus um, is critical. You can see here that with the 25 gauge needle, uh, the angle uh, is now, the iris tissue is now falling away uh, and trabecular mesh can just become visible. There's a little bit of heme. An alternative to uh, angle surgery is the trabeculotomy. Uh, which can be performed uh, in eyes with hazy corneas as it's an external procedure. A scleral flap is created like a trabeculectomy. Um, and as uh, Ken Nischel taught me, where white meets blue, Schlem waits for you. Uh, that's the uh, anatomical landmark that you're looking for uh, when performing trabeculectomy surgery, trabeculotomy surgery, sorry. Viscoelastic is inserted, and this, uh, divide, this instrument is called a harms trabecular tome. Uh, and it comes in both a left and a right. So up to 180 degrees of angle can be treated with that. Uh, it's uh, not my preference, but there are uh, there is another technique described uh, using a suture, a proline or a nylon suture can be um, uh, used to perform a 360 degree trabeculotomy. Um, moving on towards the end of the talk, uh, it's important to treat uh, the child as a whole. Um, uh, so the child with pediatric glaucoma uh, may also have uh, amblyopia with asymmetric disease. Uh, this may be due to an isometropia or sensory from the corneal opacity. And the corneal opacity may be due to um, acute edema or Harb's tree, or in the long term, stromal scarring may develop. Uh, it's essential to optimize refractive error in these children. And finally, um, in advanced cases, the optic neuropathy is what causes the vision loss. Um, as I've mentioned a couple of times in the talk, pressure is only part of the picture. Uh, we need to manage the glaucoma. The prognosis is related largely to severity or delay of presentation. Uh, and the older the child presents um, with the condition, the poorer the prognosis is. Some of the secondary conditions have glaucoma that, are, that is more challenging to treat. Maximizing the vision by optimizing the refraction and treating amblyopia. Now, genetic evaluation um, where available around the world plays uh, an important role. It can confirm or identify syndromic diagnosis, uh, the risk of glaucoma, as well as um, reproductive counseling, um, if appropriate. These children require many visits to the clinic and the operating room, and we develop a lifelong relationship with both the child, uh, parents, and often siblings. I wanted to mention the Children's Glaucoma Passport, which was developed by my mentor, Joe Abbott in Birmingham, uh, and his mentor, Pete Shah. And, um, we all acknowledge that living with childhood glaucoma is an enormous challenge and involving children and their carers on this journey 
helps to maximize their care, quality of life, uh, and gives them a voice in the treatment of this condition. So there's uh, the uh, Children's Glaucoma Passport is an A5 sized uh, document which contains several sections, including family and school, emergency contact numbers, uh, child's medical history, uh, eye treatment, systemic and ophthalmic. And um, this can be interchanged by different wallets and different cards in the wallet. Uh, there's a guide to eye drops, frequently asked questions, and a parent survival guide. So uh, I'm hoping that this will become more readily available at centers around the world. A few other tips um, to remember for the trainees is always consider the status of the fellow eye and whether this is an only eye, and that can help us to determine how aggressively we need to treat. Uh, social circumstances. So in a child who has a chronic condition, um, just like any other chronic medical condition, we need to consider where they live, how easy it is for them to get into the hospital uh, for multiple visits and multiple surgical procedures. And in the older child, it's important to involve them in the decision making as much as possible. So in summary, in the last half an hour, I'm hoping uh, that uh, I've been able to tell you that pediatric glaucoma is a different disease to adult glaucoma. There's different causes, different pathophysiology, and the treatment is different. Uh, it's important to look at the entire picture. Uh, there are several parameters that we consider, and we rely less on the intraocular pressure as a, a single measurement. Always look for a possible secondary cause, which could be genetic and could have systemic implications for the child and examine the parents to look for an underlying genetic condition. Once again, manage the child as a whole. Remember to refract them, treat their amblyopia. Uh, and this is a long-term relationship. Um, pediatric glaucoma is a chronic condition and these patients are with us for life. Thanks very much. Parth, thank you so much for a fantastic uh, talk. Uh, great insights into the assessment of children with glaucoma, uh, highlighting the differences between adult and uh, childhood uh, disease, um, and the, the, the difficulties, the practical difficulties you have in trying to assess children, multiple EUAs, uh, and also that, that I hadn't uh, come across the uh, glaucoma passport. What a fantastic idea, Pete and uh, uh, Joe have used, and I think if that was to be taken up across, you know, more widely, uh, that would be a, a great uh, benefit for uh, children and, and their, their, their parents. Uh, when it comes to the, the practical aspects of things in, in Sydney, um, children presenting with congenital glaucoma, are you seeing them you know, at a relatively early stage? How does it compare maybe with your experience in Pittsburgh and Birmingham? Are you noticing a similar pattern of presentation for that uh, idiopathic congenital glaucomas? Yeah, I think we're, we're lucky here that we um, have a fairly easy pathway into the clinic children fairly early on, um, which is helpful to the long-term prognosis. Um, the earlier we can get on top of treatment, um, we can salvage both um, some hope for vision as well as keeping the eye. Um, so, yeah, it's similar in, in um, Birmingham, but Obviously, the volume is uh, a lot lower here, um, which is good uh, uh, compared to what I used to see in Birmingham and, and setting. Uh, but um, relatively good access. Uh, I was just, I mentioned to you earlier, John, I was in Broken Hill uh, this morning, and unfortunately, there was a child there with uh, bilateral aphakic glaucoma because our country is so vast, we do have um, situations where access can be quite difficult and uh, a challenge for the family to uh, come across to a major center and have treatment for glaucoma. Yeah, absolutely. So despite um, you know, living in Sydney and seeing, yeah. Some of the questions coming through on the, from the webcast, uh, viewer said seeing adults who've had pediatric glaucoma uh, surgery as, as as children and increasing tendency towards 
blue rupture with relatively minor trauma in playing sport. What sort of advice do you give children who've had maybe drainage surgery, perhaps more tubes and trabeculectomy than goniotomy, um, or just advice in general for children maybe with an only eye, a poorly sighted eye when it comes to contact sports, racket sports and things? Yeah, um, look, I think that's a great question. I, I tend, most of the, these children are in glasses anyway for refractive correction. Uh, so if they can have polycarbonate lenses in their glasses, that's helpful. Um, with the only eye children, um, I do encourage them to avoid um, heavy contact sports if possible. Um, some of these children, you know, one, you know, they if it's their real passion um, and it's one of the things that they really love doing, then I advise them of all the risks and precautions to take. Another question: um, provide some more more protection. Question just come through said, would you take a child to the uh, OR uh, who's a glaucoma suspect if there was no optic cupping at all, or is cupping a must before subjecting the child to general anesthesia? You can do with the answer to this is. Yeah, look, I I, I think uh, generally you would find that uh, there would be cupping, but it's it's not a must. So, for example, Neridia, who uh, we know. Uh, despite having uh, normal pressures and normal optic disc, uh, prophylactic goniotomy is a good treatment. Mm. Who that, are at risk of developing glaucoma, yeah. uh, you no, should get on top of it earlier. Okay. And final question that's come through, which viscoelastic do you use for your angle surgery? To, um, uh, if needed, use Helon. Um, and um, it's usually easy to wash it out at the end. Um, often if uh, in that video I showed you, it was for me and uh, uh, entering directly with the needle um, means that if you haven't created a wound, you can often use viscoelastic at all, uh, which is a technique uh, that Ken Nischel taught me. But it's safe to put in viscoelastic on the table. And finally, just before you go off and deal with this trauma case, part same question to you as as, as Matt. What uh, was it that uh, attracted you to paediatric ophthalmology, and uh, what are the, the the reasons you 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 love your job? Uh, look, I think um, love the breadth of what we do. We're real generalists, um, and uh, got a flavour of that working with you in a district hospital. Which had everything from a cataract lacrimal procedure to a ptosis and a squint. And um, I really enjoyed the breadth, but I really got into medical school thinking I because uh, I just sort of love the kids and the idea of changing their life, of life forever. And then um, at the end of my medical school, I got into ophthalmology, sort of got interested in ophthalmology. And at the end of training, Kim Tan, um, passion for children and combining uh, pediatrics with ophthalmology. I think it's uh, a fantastic. Well, that's a perfect segue to our next uh, part of the, the program, which is Rebecca Jones, uh, my trainee in Cheltenham, uh, and myself talking about a day in one of our clinics in Gloucester Royal, which will emphasise just the breadth of the the, the specialty that uh, we're involved with. Parth, thank you so much for your uh, contribution today. Uh, I hope the case goes thank well uh, this evening. Catch up with you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Nine. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Rebecca. Hi. So I'd just really like to start by saying thank you, Mr. Ferris, for giving me the opportunity to present on such an amazing webinar particularly in such a esteemed company. Um, so I'll just start my presentation. So far, we've 979 people watching on different platforms. So that's great. Thank you, everyone. Wow. For joining us. <laughs> so this is the presentation that's a reflection of the clinic that Mr. Ferris and I did back in November last year. 
And I, we thought it would be nice to demonstrate how varied and interesting the case mix can be in just a routine paediatric clinic. And Mr. Ferris, I hope you'll be comfortable with uh, just chipping in with your insights throughout this as well. I'll try to. <laughs> so to make this more interactive and interesting, we'll be using the Turning Point app to host a live quiz. Uh, you can join in the quiz and get anonymously marked on your answers you go through. It's free to download from the App Store, and this is the icon at the top here that you're looking for. Um, you can also go to ttpoll.eu for access as well. Once the app is downloaded, click on Guest and then put in the session ID WSPOS. If you're on the website, put in WSPOS as the access code. You shouldn't need to put in your name or email, but you can if you want to. Uh, my very kind colleague, Sonia Mamtura, is running the quiz for us this morning. So I just wait to hear those people logging in okay. So it's the Turning Point app that you want with session ID WSPOS. Great. So to begin with the polling, a few questions to help us get to know our audience a bit better this morning. So to start off, what stage of ophthalmology training are you at? Are you a medical student, intern, a junior resident or senior resident, a fellow or consultant, or are you an orthoptist or optometrist or another colleague in the field? I'll just give you a few minutes to answer just the first question here. There's a bit of delay between the different platforms, so I'll have to leave a gap to for a lot of yes. people. To yeah, we've worked out there's about a 15 second delay between Rebecca speaking live on our Zoom uh, call, which the speakers are on, and the YouTube and Facebook feeds. So we will try and allow for that as we go through this talk. So just for anyone that's joining, if this is an interactive polling, so if you go to ttpoll.eu and then type in the session ID WSPOS to get the questions. So the next question, where are you watching from? Close to home with us here in the UK or elsewhere in Europe or in Asia, North America, South America, Africa, or with Mr. Spargo and Mr. Shah in Australia? So for our ophthalmology trainees out there, how keen are you to take up paediatric ophthalmology as your consultant role? You can rank this one from one to five. One, you'll be, you're, you know, you're definitely sold on paediatrics. To five, you're certain that it's not for you. And we're conducting this poll uh, as part of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists' uh, interest in identifying reasons why people are choosing different subspecialties. And I think WISPOS uh, management will also be interested in the results of this survey. So to look into that a bit more, the next question is what are the things that make you more keen on doing paediatrics? You can rank the choices in this question to reflect your particular opinion. So. Number one, is it the flexible way of working that you like? Or is it the widely available consultant job opportunities? Is it an interest in research in paediatrics? Is it the financial incentives that come from this subspecialty? Or is it that you like being part of the MBT with orthoptists and optometrists and nurses? Or do you like the fact that you just can't predict on day to day what's going to show up in your clinic? You can rank all those options, you know, with what's most important to you first.
And then conversely, what things put you off doing paediatric ophthalmology? Is it having difficulty examining children? I know we've got some tips later coming on from David, David Granite, so hopefully that shouldn't be an issue after this afternoon. Is it a lack of research opportunities? Is it that private practice might be limited in paediatrics? Is it that you don't find squint surgery as easy as some of the other ophthalmic surgeries? Or could it be that you have a fear of parents or getting complaints? Or is it that the training in paediatrics that you've had so far has been limited, so you've not been able to be as involved as you might have been with other subspecialties? hope that everyone's worked out how to use the turning point software now uh, so we can go into some live quiz questions about the cases that we saw in our pediatrics clinic so if you've just joined we're working with the software turning point so if you go to ttpoll.eu to join our live quiz and join with the session id wspos you can join in with our questions to begin with our cases, the first one that came into clinic this, mor this morning in November was a 13-year-old girl with JIA. Her vision on that day was 6, 7.5 in both eyes. She was first diagnosed with JIA in 2017, with her wrists, hips, knees and ankles affected. She was found to be ANA positive and had just been started on methotrexate. She didn't have any signs of uveitis at that point and she hadn't had she hadn't had any uveitis on subsequent clinic follow-ups either up until we saw her in clinic that day. She'd had that day in clinic um, 2.5 plus of cells in each eye, not quite as much as you can see in the photo, but still quite significant. But it was interesting that she was just about to be started on Humira for her joint inflammation. I think Professor Dick will speak on this later, but Humira is also really great treatment for uveitis in JIA. So we might not have been as aggressive as we would otherwise have been with the topical steroids. Uh, Mr. Ferris, do you want to talk about, a bit about what your thought process was in the case? Yeah. Obviously, uh, we see a lot of children with JIA. There's a well-developed uh, screening programme for uh, children, infants, uh, when they're diagnosed with JIA. So we see them promptly within six weeks, and depending on their age, uh, stratify that uh, follow-up. We use uh, orthoptists who actually an optometrist to uh, do the routine screening and then children who are fine to have uh, uveitis are then filtered into the adjacent uh, children's clinic which is running uh, alongside. The advent of methotrexate has totally revolutionized the management of these children. As a medical student in Bristol I remember seeing these poor teenagers with fixed flexion deformities blind from their cataract and glaucoma and hy hypotony. Uh, so methotrexate uh, usually takes about two months to kick in and have an effect on the uveitis, but the second line immunosuppressants that Andrew Dick, as you alluded to, will, will be talking about are just giving it that extra layer of protection and preventing uh, the steroid-induced complications of cataracts and uh, glaucoma. Uh, unlike methotrexate, it takes several weeks for the effect of the Humira uh, to kick in, uh, and it's allowed us now to have a sort of a zero tolerance uh, uh, approach to having sort of uh, anterior uh, segment activity in these children. The other thing you also have to be mindful of is seeing a child who is discontinuing the methotrexate in Umira, and that's often a, a difficult decision for the rheumatologist and the ophthalmologist when to discontinue treatment uh, because you get a rebound uh, uveitis uh, pre presenting. And so this child, I think we went relatively you know, quietly on the, the, the steroids because of uh, the Humira, which has been started. And then seeing her several weeks later, we are finding the eye was actually quite quiet. And that's mainly due to uh, her second line uh, immunosuppression. And as you mentioned, Rebecca, the combination of Humira and methotrexate means a lot of these children avoid the glaucoma surgical interventions and, and cataract surgery that previous generations of children with JIA uh, would, have, would have seen. Uh, it's obviously quite easy to examine a 13-year-old in a slit lamp, but if you have those children who are most at risk, young, so two, three, four-year-old uh, children who present often with uh, asymptomatic uh, uveitis, it can be difficult to examine them. So the handheld slit lamp is a really valuable uh, tool. Uh, but quite often, the, the children, if you make a game and make it fun, uh, some of our uh, 
children just love coming to the eye clinic. They bounce up onto the slit lamp, even little three and four year olds and hold on there. They're happy having their pressures checked. Um, so it's all about making the, their trip to the clinic uh, uh, as fun an experience as, as, as possible. So we'll just go on to our first question uh, of, of these clinic cases. So which of these is not a poor prognostic feature of uveitis in GIA? Is it a younger age at diagnosis of uveitis, a short duration between the onset of arthritis and uveitis, high IOP at presentation, female gender, or posterior synechiae at presentation? The question should be coming up on turning point now, so if you select your answer, it will shortly tell you if you're correct or not. So the correct answer is actually female gender. Developing uveitis is much more common in girls, but the prognosis is worse in boys if they do go on to develop it. So um, as we've mentioned, Prof Dick will be talking about this later, but just as a bit of an introduction to anterior uveitis in GIA, it's the most common cause of uveitis in children. And if a child presents to you with uveitis, it's so, you know, obviously then worth taking a history of joint pain and being aware that in the minority of cases, the uveitis can present before the arthritis. It's in common that these children would present to an ophthalmologist, though, because they don't get the classic symptoms of aching or photophobia. And they can have quite significant signs of uveitis without noticing any, any you know, symptoms. As Mr. Ferris mentioned, there's quite a well-validated screening protocol for uveitis, and in Cheltenham, we're really lucky to have an excellent bunch of orthoptists who run all our screening clinics. The risk factors for developing uveitis in GIA are younger age or onset of arthritis, uh, and those two to three years can be difficult to examine, but it's definitely worth trying to get the, the best view of the anterior chamber to rule out the inflammation. Girls and those that are a &E positive are also at higher risk. A presentation, if they just have one or two joints involved, then that's a risk factor for going on to develop uveitis. And it's worth being extra vigilant with these children with the risk factors, as there are many site-threatening complications to an undertreated uveitis, like cataract, glaucoma, band keratopathy, and macular edema. Glaucoma in children with uveitis can be particularly difficult to manage, as children are more likely to be steroid responders, so checking their IOP is essential to preserve sight and to act promptly particularly if there's any signs of optic nerve compromise. Our next child into clinic was a five-year-old little boy who we'd been seeing regularly since 2017. He was first referred due to a left esotropia, and when he was refracted, he was found to be highly myopic at minus 12 and minus 11 diopters with no significant astigmatism. His birth history and early life had been unremarkable, and there was no family history of myopia. So what could be the cause of an extremely high myopia in an otherwise well two-year-old? Options for this one are Alport syndrome, Stickler syndrome, axenfeld regus syndrome, excellent retinoschisis or FEVR. The answer is Stickler syndrome. Um, children with Alport might have an anterior or posterior lenticonus, which can lead them to get lenticular myopia, but it's not usually this significant or as early onset. axenfeld riga is this rare condition that causes bilateral anterior segment dysgenesis and leads to difficult to manage childhood glaucoma. X-linked retinoschisis causes a macular schisis, where the fovea splits through the inner layers, and it's actually more likely to cause a hypermetropia. FEVR can also cause retinal detachments like high myopia, but these tend to be due to attractional fibrosis due to the ischemia. There was a good uh, paper in I recently about the children they had in Birmingham with high myopia, and they found that the most common cause was a simple myopia, 
without any associated ocular or systemic condition. And these children often had a family history of high myopia, unlike our child in clinic that day. About 50% of their children had an underlying systemic association, such as developmental delay or prematurity. And we know that children with ROP can go on to develop a high myopia as well. Another cause of a high myopia is Stickler syndrome, which we'll go into to explain in a bit more detail. Uh, Marfans can also cause high myopia due to an increased axial length. Complications of high myopia are the same as that for adults. So things like red metonogenous retinal detachment, myopic degeneration, staphyloma and open angle glaucoma. Stickler syndrome is caused by defective collagen production and it's usually autosomally dominantly inherited, unlike our, chi- our child who had a sporadic form. There are also other connective tissue features like the flat midface, deafness and cardiac valve abnormalities. The ocular features in Stickler include high myopia, like our little boy had. Uh, as the vitreous has a high collagen content, they can have membranous or beaded vitreous appearance, which demonstrates the collagen abnormality. Secondary to high myopia, these children are highly likely to have a regmatogenous retinal detachment and are particularly high risk of getting giant retinal tears and can develop PVR. So children are quite difficult to manage if they do develop a detachment. Children with stickler can also have a congenital cataract, but they usually aren't significant enough to require surgery. Do you have any insights about the children that you've seen in clinic before with stickler, Mr. Ferris? Yeah, I was fortunate enough, Rebecca, in my training to uh, work in Addenbrooke with the the legendary John Scott uh, and now Martin Sneed and Arabella Poulsen, who are really the world experts in uh, research behind in stickler syndrome, and in particular, you know, Martin, the work he's done looking at the different subtypes of sticklers, identifying the collagen disorders. And one of their you know, teachings really was the importance of ophthalmologists in establishing the diagnosis and looking for those characteristic vitreous changes, the sort of empty vitreous, the collection of, sort of retrolentral, sort of membranous vitreous, and the beaded appearance is absolutely pathognomonic of uh, sticklers. So in cases of you know, high myopia in childhood, looking for those signs if you can on, on the slit lamp is really Im- important because we know they're present along with sort of radial perivascular uh, to retinal degenerative changes in 100% of children with, with sticklers. And these kids, as you've said, there's a 50% chance of them going on to develop giant retinal tears uh, and, and retinal detachment. And if you've had a retinal detachment in one eye, 50% of these children will go on to get a second detachment within four years of, of presentation. So it's incredibly important to, to make that diagnosis and be aware of that constellation of signs, that fat uh, uh, mid-face, often a Pierre Robin type sequence of micrognathia, soft palate and uh, palatal clefts, and often the, the parents aren't aware of the the, the, the cleft issues, so examining their, their, their palate uh, and then referring them on to uh, a centre which specialises in the management um, of, uh, of, of sticklers. Okay, uh, thank you. So um, back to our child. Later in 2017, he was refracted again and found that he'd now gone from minus 12 to minus 6 in the right eye. And then on examination, found that he'd got a retinal detachment in that eye, unfortunately. So he was seen by Martin Sneed in Cambridge, where he had a retinal, um, he had a scleral buckle with um, silicon oil. Both eyes were treated with cryotherapy as well. The left eye prophylactically to reduce the risk of future retinal detachment. When we saw him again in 2019, he was starting to develop a cataract in his right eye. And so cataract surgery was planned. So um, just have a think about what, what lens might we choose for this child. Would you want to leave him emotropic or would you want to make it a minus 12 so his two eyes match? Uh, Mr. Ferris, what do you think about this situation? The the dilemma that that Martin had to his uh, lens in the fellow eye was completely clear. He had prophylactic laser uh, uh, cryo treatment to the other eye, which we know reduces the risk of uh, subsequent detachment by a factor of about uh, eight. Uh, But there's still a a risk uh, if we were to go for an emotropic outcome, you'd have to then consider almost a clear lens extraction in an eye which was seeing well, which would still be at risk despite that prophylactic treatment of getting a a retinal detachment. 
Uh, and after discussion with the, with the parents, uh, it was felt that the best and the safest and perhaps the conservative option was to go for an implant, leaving uh, the child in balance with the other eye um, to make sure we didn't need to go ahead with clear lens extraction on the other side with the subsequent risk of, of, of retinal detachment. So uh, we went for the, the balancing uh, option uh, with this little boy. Mm, so he was left myopic in that eye. Yeah. So our next child into clinic was a six-year-old boy with vision of 612 in right eye and 624 in his left eye with a degree of anisometropia. He had initially presented the year before with uh, a left esotropia and a manifest latent nystagmus. We tried to patch the right eye, but the vision hadn't really improved. To investigate why his vision might be down, we requested a macular OTT, and this is the image that we got. This is the clearest slice we had through this child's fovea. Given the history of nystagmus and this OTT image, what else might we find on examination of this child? Might it be he's got bilateral optic atrophy? He's got iris transillumination? Does he have mid-peripheral retinal pigmentation? A yellow appearance of the macula or a lamella cataract? Those that got it right probably worked out that the OCT here shows foveal hyperplasia. There's no dip there in the centre where you'd expect, and that's a sign of ocular albinism, in which you'd also see iris transillumination. When we spoke to his mother about this, she worked in the hospital as a biochemist, and she wanted to know what the inheritance of ocular albinism was. So is it autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked, mitochondrial, or co-dominant? So ocular albinism is inherited in an X-linked fashion. So the children that you see in clinic will all be boys. Is there anything else about X-linked nature of the inheritance that, that makes this condition interesting? Mr. Fias, do you want to give some um, input about, about X-linked? Well, the X, again, you're asking the, the history of uh, males on the maternal side, whether there's a, a history of uh, people who have either nystagmus or, in the case of ocular albums, uh, photosensitivity, reduced vision, uh, which there wasn't in this child. We know that the uh, X-linked uh, um, defect is related to the G-protein uh, coupled receptors and which interferes with melanocyte transport. Uh, Aris transillumination is really important and we look for it in this child and tips for that are to make the room completely dark, completely black out, narrow that slit lamp beam, shine it through the, the pupil and look for the Aris transillumination, which is present in not all, but 75% of children with uh, ocular albinism will have Aris transillumination. Um, often it's important to, to examine the mother because you know, carriers of this X-linked uh, defect, the mums will have as a mud splattered fundus of areas of hypo and hyperpigmentation in the in the retinal periphery. Uh, and VEPs, uh, even in children without any transillumination and no nystagmus, they can get a bit of milder forms of ocular albinism, will have that classical crossing defect on monocular VEP stimulation where the majority of fibres decussate at the chiasm to the contralateral hemisphere. So VEPs, uh, there's some interesting papers looking at the role of that in establishing the diagnosis in subtle uh, cases of albinism. But with excellent ocular albinism, there can be a spectrum of visual uh, performance. And our little child, child was a good example of that. So despite having foveas that looked like that, an OCT, he had actually quite reasonable vision in his non-strabismic um, eye. 
So there's two forms of ocular albinism. Um, there's the classic ocular cutaneous albinism, where the skin and hair are deficient of melanin as well. And this is inherited in an autosomal recessive fashion. The second type, as we mentioned, is slightly less common. It's the ocular albinism that's limited only to eyes. So um, the, as Mr. Ferrer said, the, the female carriers can also have a kind of more subtle um, features of albinism, and they might just have iris translumin translumination features that you can just about pick up, not as obvious as shown in the picture here. The key features of ocular albinism to pick up in this child were the diffuse illumination, the nystagmus and the foveal hyperplasia. With the foveal hyperplasia, you, you might notice that you don't get the classic reflection from the fovea at slit lamp, but then it was really obvious on the OCT. Child number four was a five-year-old girl whose vision today had dropped significantly since she was referred from the school screening service a few weeks before. The only time that she'd come into contact with the hospital services was two years previously when she'd had a seizure and she'd not had any neuroimaging at that point. When we saw her, she had a slight left esotropia and bilaterally poor colour vision. And this is what her anterior segment looked like bilaterally. On examination, her optic discs were pale, as you can see in the photo. Given the history and the examination findings, what might be the cause of her poor vision and her pale optic discs? Could it be that she has dominant optic atrophy, labours hereditary optic neuropathy, juvenile Batten disease, post-infectious pale optic discs, or an optic pathway glioma? Unfortunately, this little girl had optic atrophy due to an optic pathway glioma, the optic chiasm. In the first picture on the first slide of the iris, you could see those characteristic Lish nodules, which were suggestive of the underlying diagnosis of neurofibromatosis type 1. The diagnostic features of NF1, other than the iris Lish nodules and the optic pathway glioma, are these cafe au lait pigmented patches that you can see in the picture, as well as freckling in the armpits and groin and the classic neurofibromas, which tend to develop a little bit later. As NF1 is inherited autosomal dominantly, there's often a family history of neuro neurofibromatosis. The treatment options that are available for OPGs are limited, unfortunately, and we had to explain to her mother that the visual prognosis was not good. Once the OPG starts to affect the visual function, the only treatment that we really had available was a chemotherapy, which is weekly intravenous fincristine which doesn't really tend to recover any visual function and is just given to stabilize her decline. Radiotherapy is not recommended in these children because it can cause more aggressive secondary tumors. And had this tumor been detected at an earlier stage, often these children are just closely observed for signs of visual compromise. Obviously it was too late in this case for that. For that. Difficulty wasn't it, Rebecca, for this uh, child, her mother has NF1, her older brother, who was only eight, had NF1 with bilateral optic pathway gliomas. And her mum was almost in denial that uh, her child, that this, her daughter had neurofibromatosis. And of course, she knew then exactly what this diagnosis entailed, having been through the investigation and treatment of her little boy, who was actually doing pretty well uh, with his, his chemotherapy. So it was a really tragic case of another child with exactly the same um, condition. But I'll let you talk a little bit about the screening protocols because this is problematic uh, mm -hmm. how we screen these children uh, to try and pick up OPGs. Yeah, so it just made me think that, you know, if we hadn't suspected that this child had NF1, would she have been screened for optic pathway gliomas? And um, we spoke about how screening in NF1 is really under debate at the moment. And there's been an excellent article recently in the I controversy section arguing for and against screening. Um, it's not really been decided what the best screening protocol is for OPGs. Um, visual acuity is obviously the easiest method, but 
it's not that accurate, particularly in young children, particularly those with learning difficulties, which are quite common in air form. Colour vision or visual fields might also be un unreliable in these small children. Um, VEPs are probably more sensitive to the change, but it's difficult to routinely perform electrodiagnostics on all these children for, you know, it's quite a, a common condition, actually. Yeah, and well, in the, as you say, when you read the papers, they blithely say mm -hmm. visual acuity, visual fields. Well, visual fields in a three-year-old, you know, mm -hmm. how reliable is that? It's just not a reliable way of checking things. And the other good point you make is that these children often have learning difficulties or attention deficit problems, some of which can actually, the attention deficit can be part of the spectrum of the optic pathway glioma. And so trying to uh, have reliable visual acuity measurements with an experienced orthoptist is probably the most important parameter. There have been some interesting studies looking at OCT, again, often handheld OCT in the younger infants, looking at declining in retinal nerve fibre layer thickness on two consecutive visits, and that's thought to have us about a 70% sensitivity and about 100% specificity for uh, progression of the optic pathway gliomas. Because 15 to 20 percent of children with NF1 will have an OPG, but only half of which will go on to cause a visual uh, a deficit. Um, mm. And the, the difficulty is trying to work out when to, to intervene. What are your criteria for subjecting a child to potentially long course of chemotherapy, which has got a still has a guarded uh, mm. um, outlook? I guess one reason to screen is that we just don't know a lot about OPGs in NF1 and what the natural course of them is and whether they actually might spontaneously regress. So if there was screening, you know, a baseline MRI to pick them up, then perhaps we would know more about what the best treatment is and when to intervene in these children. Yeah, it, the, the natural history is difficult. One of the papers that I read in preparation for this was looking at their uh, criteria for intervention uh, and one of which was you know a drop of 0.2 logmar uh, lines and or a visual field defect was a, an absolute indication for treatment mm -hmm. for those children who have a vision of less than logmar 0.1 and le less than 0.2 in their better eye that was uh, another indication to, to step in with treatment volumetric MRI looking at MRI changes uh, even a, a tumour which is increasing in size on MRI imaging doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to cause because causing visual uh, compromise. Uh, and it's a liaison with the paediatric neuroradiologist, with the paediatric oncologist. And again, it's that collaborative uh, a team, team approach that's essential for these uh, children and having good channels of communication with the oncologist, the radiologist, uh, and with the, the, the parents is key. Yeah, and then it's difficult to screen for a condition that you don't actually have that good a treatment for. I remember the discussion you had with the mother who obviously knew what the chemotherapy would entail, um, and it doesn't actually improve outcomes in most of the children. So it's quite a difficult thing to, to then put forward to the parents. Yeah, it is a very difficult. And, and that's where the help of the oncologists, who are obviously much better qualified than we are as ophthalmologists, to talk about the ins and outs of uh, treatment. And the chemotherapy is really well you know, tolerated in the main. Children go to school and they come in for the, their, their, their treatments to hospital. So it's not as invasive uh, or as debilitating as other forms of chemotherapy. Uh, but uh, it's, it, it's a difficult uh, area. Mm, yeah, definitely interesting. The next child that we had was a one-year-old boy who had bilaterally poor vision, who'd been referred by the paediatricians after a diagnosis of a multi-system condition called Joubert syndrome. Earlier in 2020, he developed a third nerve palsy, which was related to the Joubert, and he started patching to try and improve his vision. The sign that's shown here on the MRI scan is this molar tooth sign, which is pathognomonic of Joubert. Next question then. So which of these conditions is not a systemic ciliopathy? I'll give you a short amount of time to answer. Hopefully the questions are coming out synchronised with the app.
So the only one of these conditions that's not a ciliopathy is hermansky pudlak syndrome, which is actually a subtype of oculocutaneous albinism. Schubert syndrome is one type of systemic ciliopathy. And what I mean by that is that there's a defect in the cilia, which are present in all cell types in the body. So it causes this multi-system disorder. The retinal photoreceptors are specially modified cilia. So there's many types of ciliopathy that cause retinal dystrophies. Associated systemic features vary between the different syndromes, which is how you can often tell them apart. Zuba is autosomally uh, recessive, and the systemic features include hypotonia, developmental delay, ocular motor apraxia, and elongated cere cerebellar peduncles, leading to this classic molar tooth sign on the imaging. There are many other types of ciliopathies that you might have heard of, but they often have certain features which differentiate them. In cerebellar ocular renal syndrome, they might also have an ocular motor apraxia and therefore have abnormal saccades, but they would not have molar tooth sign on MRI. Children with Bardet beedle have issues with appetite suppression, so they have problems related to obesity. And then children with sinia locum can also have early onset renal impairment and renal failure. Each one is related to a different gene encoding proteins involved in the formation or function of cilia. Do you have any? Um, experience with managing other children and how you kind of introduce these ideas and explain to the parents what these children might actually be experiencing with their vision. The, the saccade initiation failure, ocular motor apraxia, you know, can occur into many different uh, uh, settings and it's important to identify you know, children with ciliopathies as, as, as one of them and quite often they can present you know, to us with uh, a child who appears not to be to be seeing, but actually the vision, depending on the underlying condition, is often reasonably good. It's that uh, difficulty forming, uh, producing saccadic eye movements, you get head thrusts or blinking and things. Um, so if you're seeing a child with ocular motor apraxia, saccad initiation failure, it's really important to liaise with the paediatrician, have complete and thorough uh, systemic examination to look for other signs of cerebellar dysfunction in particular. Uh, as you mentioned, the... Uh, RP type issues being uh, related to the photoreceptors with their you know, cilia based. Uh, and it's really sort of revolutionized our understanding of these conditions, knowing what you know, the, the, the defect is and tying in the different conditions. I was amazed, it was five or six years ago at a Biposa uh, lecture uh, talking about ciliopathies. In my embarrassed to say, in my ignorance, I had no idea just the, the breadth of uh, organs in the body that had. Uh, uh, are involved with ciliopathy, so it's important for trainees to familiarise themselves with these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's certainly a wide range of conditions that are all related and they all present similarly with RP, but then with lots of different features as well. Our sixth child into clinic that morning was a three-year-old boy brought in by his parents. He's visual acuity in both eyes with Cardiff cards, or is 1.1, uh, 1.0, sorry, and his uh, refraction was stable. He was well known to us, um, having been seen on the ROP uh, screening round from birth, though he had not developed any ROP. He did spend 12 weeks on the neonatal intensive care and he had had grade four intraventricular hemorrhages, which then led him to have global developmental delay. His mum had several questions about why his recorded visual acuity was so poor when she felt that there were certain things that he liked to do which showed to her that his vision was better. So given that this boy was non-verbal, which of these tests would not have been helpful to test his visual acuity? Would it be forced choice preferential looking, visual evoked potentials, an optochronetic drum, cardiff acuity cards, or electroretinography? Which one of those will be not used to test his visual acuity? The correct answer is ERG testing, which is used to assess retinal function, but can't be used to get a measure of the actual visual acuity, whereas VEPs can be used to get an objective assessment of possible visual acuity. The mother was asking us what the cause of his visual impairment was and whether there was a potential that it was just delayed visual maturation and he might actually get better. Whilst uh, I guess in some ways she was correct that, you know, her child had 
a normal eye exam and normal pupillary reactions, the diagnosis of delayed visual maturation can only really be made up until age one. And as he was now three and had risk factors for having cortical visual impairment like prematurity or global visual delay, uh, yeah, global developmental delay, um, it was likely that cortical visual impairment was the diagnosis. Before the age of six months, you could have difficulty making the differentiation between the two. Um, but at three, it was definitely more likely to be a cortical visual impairment. There's certain features on examination that you can pick up to suggest that it was this. But and I think there's going to be a talk later about this after the coffee break. Um, Mr. Ferris, how did you go about explaining to the mum what it actually meant that her child had cortical visual impairment? Um. Again, because she'd been under the care of our community uh, paediatricians and the uh, cause for his developmental delay, you know, had been explained. This was a, a mum who uh, was vaguely aware that uh, his difficulties could be related to a visual, uh, you know, a, a CNS problem with his uh, uh, visual cortices. Uh, and trying to explain to her that the visual system has a camera cabling and a computer and the camera the eyes are fine and even the cabling seems to be pretty good but it's the computer at the back that just wasn't translating the images being sent to into a picture that children his age would normally be seeing that's quite a helpful uh, analogy uh, Kathy will be talking about more subtle forms of uh, uh, cortical visual impairment and how we detect so I'm not going to go in, into to, to that uh, but the, the other thing to say in children with this sort of problem, maybe not the age of three, but from one year onwards, is to say there can be small incremental improvements over time. And what's important is to talk to the parents about how to stimulate their child's vision right from an early age, to encourage them to be as visually active as possible, to get the advisory teachers for the visually impaired, you know, in, involved when they're starting to go to nursery and then infant school, uh, so that they adults involved with their education are aware of what they can see and what they can see to make allowances for that. These are all really important uh, things to bring up with the, the, the parents and to try and emphasise the positive uh, aspects of what their, their child you know, can see. And again, Cathy, I'm sure, will be uh, talking about that in more depth after the, the coffee break. Mm, yeah, I remember the mum was happy, you know, because she could tell us about some of the things that she felt that he was able to do that showed that his vision was, you know, he enjoyed looking at things and the things that he enjoyed to do that related to his vision. And we were able to have a ch chapter about what kind of things we could do more to help stimulate him. I think she really appreciated that. And quite often the vision which we record in, in, in clinic, you watch the child in, in front of you and how they're playing and interacting, behaving, you think well, they must actually be performing mm -hmm. at a higher level than we can detect in the in the in the in the tests. And the parents are they're always the best arbiters of what the child you know can can see. We're only seeing them at a set point in time. So getting that feel from visit to visit of how their child may be progressing and encouraging the the, the parents uh, and you know uh being pleased with them when there has been an, an improvement, incremental improvement, even if it's only small in their child's visual performances is important, really. Yeah, exactly. The, the next child that we had in clinic was a three-year-old girl brought in by her mum who had noticed this slight droopy upper lid on the right side for the past couple of months. Mum hadn't been worried about any other symptoms and she'd been fit and well up until the, the concern about the droopy eyelid. Have a look at the photo and think what might be the cause of her ptosis. And then let me just share with you this video. Hopefully it will run OK. Uh, you can get a better look at lid position and any other features of the examination, which I think might be useful. This is Rebecca's famous unicorn pencil toy, which is a great hit with all the children. <laughs> And then in the dark. And then we put some drops in, uh, and this is the same child looking a lot happier about half an hour later. And just see what's different from this video to the first video on photo. So 
So hopefully you picked up in that first picture and video that as well as a ptosis, she did also have a nisocoria. What drops have we put in that improved the ptosis and the nisocoria? Was it apoclonidine, cyclopentylate, timolol, cocaine or pilocarpine? So the correct answer for this is apoclonidine or iopidine. I'm sure you've worked out the, the cause of hetosis was a Horner's syndrome. So apoclonidine will be useful to cause pupil dilation in a Horner's pupil due to the denervation hypersensitivity. I guess whilst cocaine eye drops could also be used to diagnose a Horner's, we aren't in the habit of keeping them in clinic or giving them to children. <laughs> so the features of a Horner's syndrome to look out for are the subtle ptosis and the myose pupil, which is more obvious in the dark. If you've got a clear history from the parents of this being new and there's no signs of any iris heterochromia to suggest a congenital horners, then you really have to refer the child to paediatrics for further investigation. In children, the most common cause of horners is a birth trauma, but it could be a presenting feature of neuroblastoma. The RCOPS produced this really informative update recently on assessing children with a suspected horners, with a particular highlight on the use of apoclonidine. Because it can cause a potentially life-threatening bradycardia and apnea in young children, it, they recommended that it be avoided in those under two years. Um, after this child was referred to paediatricians, they will have investigated her. I don't know if, Mr. Ferris, you want to talk about the results of her investigations? Yeah, she had urinary VMA testing. And again, the article in the RCF uh, emphasises the small number of false negatives you can get with that. And that MRI of the head and neck, which didn't reveal you know, any uh, sinister cause for her uh, acquired, seemingly acquired Horner syndrome. She does remain a bit of a mystery, but we haven't didn't uh, find any sinister underlying cause for her Horner's, which is obviously fortunate for her. But I would really recommend people going onto the Royal College of Ophthalmologists website, and I think you can download this in their, their guidelines. It's a really useful uh tool for investigating Horner's syndrome in, on all age groups, but in particularly uh, the children. And our use of 0.5% apoclonidine, uh, beautifully illustrated in those videos, you know, how helpful it is in establishing the diagnosis. So these are the, well, just some of the, the cases actually that we saw in that routine paediatrics clinic one November morning last year. But I think it really demonstrated how varied and interesting just a routine paediatrics clinic can be. So um, I'd just like to thank my co-presenter, Mr. John Ferris, for inviting me to talk on this amazing platform and to the WSPOS for hosting this great day for us ophthalmology trainees. And I'd also like to thank my backstage colleague, Sudo Mamtora, for running the quiz side of the presentation, and I hope it worked out for all of those involved. <laughs> Rebecca, thank you very much. Impeccable timing, 11.30 on the nose. Uh, right. we will, uh, that was just a lovely overview of what Parth and Matt was talking about, that breadth of practice that we see, we are sort of the last generalist, really. You know, there's all a neuro-ophthalmology there, oncology there, genetics, liaising with the paediatricians, uh, and that is not a completely atypical day. It was you know, quite a variety of things, but that, that you never know what's going to come through, through, through your door. So thank you so much for that and for the quiz. We're going to break for 15 minutes for coffee and then be joined by... Uh, Kathy Williams and Andrew Dick uh, taking us up to lunch. So uh, everybody get some refreshments and we will catch up with you in 15 minutes time. Good, Dara. Are you, Andrew? Yeah, trying to finish clinic. <laughs> uh, we are today very much thankful to Santin for giving us this opportunity to have a presentation. And uh, it's going to be a very important topic
Well, welcome back, everyone, to the uh, WISPOS Pediatric Ophthalmology in the Day uh, seminar. I'm delighted to be joined uh, after coffee this morning by uh, Kathy Williams, a good friend uh, and colleague, who is a consultant pediatric ophthalmologist and reader in pediatric ophthalmology at the University of Bristol. Uh, Kathy is an internationally renowned expert in the field of cerebral visual impairment, so it's fantastic to have you with us today, Kathy to share your thoughts on this important condition. Uh, over to you, you can start your screen sharing now. Thank you. And um, there we are. And we'll just go full. Is that right? Can you hear me? That's perfect. Well done. Perfect. I've got an echo of you, but I'll just plow on. So thank you very much indeed for inviting me to take part in this. Um, as John said, I'm a paediatric ophthalmologist in Bristol, and I've for a long time had an interest in cerebral visual impairment. So many families have uh, said to me and have reported to other colleagues that um, this is a tricky area, and they have been to clinics with their child who's got problems and been told, your eyes are fine, I can't help you. And the aim of this talk really is to convey to everybody in paediatric ophthalmology that whilst not everybody needs to be an expert, we all should be able to tackle the basics of children who've got brain-related vision problems. We don't say to adults who've got a hemianopia that their eyes are fine, we can't help them. And the same principle, I think, should apply to children who've got brain-related vision problems. Um, I don't know if you can stop. I'm getting the my words sort of echoing back to me. The, um, well, there we go. There is general agreement uh, that um, yeah, the, uh, the sure visual the system comprises both the eye and the brain and both are needed to make it work. Uh, we have the uh, central receiving station, if you like, in the occipital lobe, and then a number of brain areas and networks that process the visual information and help us actually use it. And without them, we don't actually have the percept of seeing. So there is general agreement that cerebral visual impairment um, refers to visual problems that are not attributable to uh, disorders in the eye or the anterior visual pathways. But beyond that, there are differences between experts as to which characteristics and which levels of severity warrant the definition of cerebral visual impairment. Kathy, if I can just stop you there for a second. Make yes, sure you indeed. don't have YouTube or YouTube or Facebook on in the background, which may be causing that echo. So can you make sure that YouTube or Facebook are not on on your laptop? Because that may be okay. what's causing the echo. Okay, hang on. I'll stop sharing a second. Because if you put YouTube or Facebook open on your computer, and you would be that may be the reason why you're getting the echo and the audio. Is that better? That's yes, certainly it is. better. Yeah. Joy. <laughs> okay. Sorry for the okay. Back. Sorry about that. We're all aware that vision is actually a, a multimodal sense. Um, there are lots of different domains of visual. There is clearly visual acuity, uh, which is uh, the most commonly uh, amongst people not ophthalmologists recognized uh, domain of vision, but there's visual field, there's contrast sensitivity. Uh, there are a whole range of functions related to our, our uh, visual cognitive or visual perceptual um, abilities. And there's eye movements, which uh, the supranuclear eye movements, the pursuits and saccades and convergence, which are absolutely key again, to us uh, acquiring visual information. And the phrase cerebral visual impairment is in fact an umbrella term relating to deficits in one or more of these domains. But as you will be aware, there are differences between experts as to which of these domains uh, should be the, the lead uh, and essential for the diagnosis of CVI, or indeed how severe a deficit has to be. And particularly whether visual acuity has to be impaired or not is uh, 
not something that is broadly agreed between group. For some groups, uh, definitely visual acuity has to be reduced, but many other groups have uh, written about children or adults who have normal or near normal visual acuity, but quite marked impairments in one or more of these other domains, and they can also be regarded as having cerebral visual impairment, if that's your definition. Uh, so, just move on. So, to basics, the epidemiology of cerebral visual impairment is a growing area. It's uh, hard to tackle. The data we have at the moment are based on population uh, studies and use, understandably, the WHO criteria for um, uh, uh, blind registration, because that's something that's easy to uh, find and quite reliable. But as you will know, the WHO criteria for visual impairment are related to visual acuity and field. They don't uh, cover other domains of vision. But we can see from these papers here that studies that have looked at the numbers of children with registered, uh, re registrable, certified uh, severe visual impairment or blindness is, is very small, uh, small numbers of children per 10,000. And more recently, uh, there's been uh, another national paper from uh, Jugni Rahi's group looking at children with certified visual impairment that's uh, of a lesser ca category, so visual acuity worse than 618 rather than the severe visually impaired of 660. So bigger numbers, but still 0.1% of the population, still generally quite small. However, I've been involved in looking at brain-related problems in children for many years, and my clinics are full of children, such children, and I appreciate that that is maybe just my practice, but I did want to know on a population level how many children have brain-related vision problems, including those with good acuity, so children that wouldn't be captured by this kind of research. So what we carried out, and I'll mention briefly, is a study to try and find this out. We recruited primary schools and we uh, used questionnaires to try and uh, sift out which children were kind of going to be most at risk of having brain-related vision problems uh, based on the literature and planned to examine those children and a sample of children just selected at random from the rest. So the questionnaires we used were um, Gordon Dutton's five uh, questions, uh, specifically trying to target children with cerebral visual impairment, but also general questionnaires about uh, behavioural difficulties, as it's reported that uh, such children have a higher rate of CVI. And we looked at children who had already been recognised as needing extra educational help. So they had, uh, in England, you call it um, a statement of educational special needs or equivalent. So uh, we recruited all these children and, and, as I say, planned to examine all of those plus a sample of uh, randomly selected children. Um, in the UK, we have a recommended visual acuity screen for children in the reception year, which is when they're age four to five. So we planned our study to be the year above that, uh, years one to six. So that's five to six year olds up to uh, 10 to 11 year olds, because we didn't want to clash with this uh, vision screening program. We also went to a special school where children with uh, recognised uh, developmental and educational needs attend to uh, test them as we assumed they would have a higher rate of CVI. So the testing protocol that we worked out uh, was based on my practice in uh, Bristol, all done binocularly with the child's glasses if worn, and their basic aim was to investigate any signs of brain-related uh, visual problems. So we did do routine tests of visual acuity, cover tests to look for strabismus, convergence and accommodation, but the specifically brain-related functions we also examined were supranuclear eye movements, pursuits and saccades, and we have evolved a very simple uh, one to five scale where five is perfect, one is they can't do it at all, and the observer makes a subjective judgment in between those, and it's moderately repeatable with between experienced observers. We also did uh, fields to confrontation and some vision processing tests. 
And as the, each assessment for each child was about 45 minutes to an hour. And we did these on site at the schools. So we recruited 11 mainstream schools and one special school, over 2000 children. The families had the option to opt out their child. And we, so we still had uh, over 2200 children participating. The questionnaires we sent to the teachers, we had a very good response for, so this enabled us to sift out the at-risk children. And we also sent questionnaires to the parents, but we didn't get such a high response from them. And what we found in a nutshell was firstly that we invited a huge number of children, more than I expected, because so many children were having extra educational help. And only about half of the children actually turned up with a consent form from their parents. And so we were able to examine. So that's why I'll present what are minimum figures, because I'm just presenting the data that we, based on children we actually saw. And if we classify children as having either a problem with routine tests, the, that's the strabismus and the visual acuity, or the brain-related supranuclear eye movements and peripheral visual field, or visual cognitive problems, you can see here that we found 84 children who had at least one brain-related vision problem and 25 that had two out of the 248 children we examined. If we assume that all the children we invited but didn't come with a consent form were normal with no problems and all the children in the rest of the population who we didn't invite were normal, then those 84 and 25 children respectively would add up to 3.5 and 1.1 of the whole school population. So quite a lot of children, much bigger than the figures we saw in the epidemiology slide. And which children had the problems? Who were these children? Was it just uh, sort of randomly selected children not performing well on the day? Well, well, no. True to what one would expect from the literature, Half the children we examined with a, a known neurodevelopmental problem like cerebral palsy or epilepsy had at least one brain-related vision problem and nearly a third had two or more. Also, again, true to what one might expect from the literature, of all the children we examined who were already recognised as struggling with their learning, so they were having extra help, four out of ten of them had at least one brain-related vision problem and nearly a fifth had two or more problems. In the random 5%, which was only 40 children, a lot of randomly invited children didn't come, there were also some children who had brain-related vision problems, but only one who had more than one problem. And on further probing, he was a prematurely born child who appeared to be managing fine at school, but his parent questionnaire flagged up big difficulties at home. So... The children we found with the brain-related vision problems were children that one might predict from the literature. And the two uh, children you can see here are two of my lovely patients from my clinic who've given me these pictures so I can use them in talks. And you can see one is in a wheelchair. He's got a known problem. The other one is a child who came to me because of uh, struggling at school and nobody knew why. And we in paediatricians examined him and found he had various problems. So in summary... We wanted to know how many children had brain-related vision problems or CVI-related vision problems uh, in primary schools in England. The tests we used obviously were limited. It was within an hour. It was on school premises. We didn't do motion. We didn't do formal perimetry. And we certainly didn't refract them. So we may have underestimated their um, visual acuity. And this was a snapshot. It wasn't a diagnostic assessment. But we did find with experienced observers that a minimum, assuming everybody else would have been normal, of 3.5% had at least one problem and 1.1% had two or more. Nearly 90% of these children had what one might call red flags. They already had a diagnosis or recognised difficulties in their daily lives. And another thing that was notable was that half of them also had impairments with the routine tests. They had a strabismus or convergence insufficiency or poor accommodation. So they, A, need uh, assessment by vision professionals and B, may already be in our clinics, uh, standard orthoptic opton clinics, but with these additional brain problems as well. And finally, to flag up, less than one in five of them had reduced visual acuity. 
So this, again, echoes that there's so many more of them than what one would pick up by looking at registrable visual impairment. And it speaks to the uh, people, uh, groups who write about the need to recognise these children with good visual acuity, but other vision problems. And this, uh, you can see this notice put out by NIH last year, vision loss in children whose eyesight may be 2020 requires new diagnostic and teaching strategies. And I think we do need to take this on board so that we can try and meet these, the needs of these children. So what about a clinical approach? As I've said, the aim uh, of this talk is to try and uh, encourage all paediatric ophthalmologists to be able to at least have a, have a go and a, do a basic assessment of such children and not ever feel the need to say that they can't help. Because of the diagnostic uh, uncertainties and differences between groups, I, I find it easiest to consider brain-related vision problems uh, as the entity under uh, consideration, rather than is it CVI or is it not CVI? Because we're all taught about the visual system, we know the brain's an important part of it, and with our medical training and our uh, knowledge of vision, we can uh, approach assessment and uh, prediction of visual problems based on that. So, like with any problem, you elicit the day-to-day -day problems of the child. As John said, we're almost the last generalist. Uh, paediatric ophthalmology is a very broad church, and we all have different types of clinic within that. So, some people will, will see children with very profound difficulties who clearly have a lot of problems in, in many domains. But other clinics will not have so many of those children. Um, and maybe will be presented with a child who appears to be struggling at school. They're increasingly not keeping up with their peers and nobody knows. So big range of children, but trying to elicit what the particular problems are for the child and the family is important, like in every um, assessment. There are CVI related questionnaire tools that can be used if wanted, and they can be very helpful to tease out aspects of the history. But key is getting a good medical history. Were they born prematurely? What other problems are going on? Are they seeing other doctors? Uh, carrying out a direct assessment and a physical examination like we normally would, doing investigations if warranted like we normally would, and referring on if more in-depth review is needed, um, but having recognised the initial problems. And there's been a, a lovely review recently um, talking about different methods of assessment, both simple and more complex, um, which uh, was very similar to what we did in the study and do in my clinic. The risk factors are very well described, as we've talked about. There's a, a congenital or very early acquired disorders like developmental brain disorders, syndromes, including the ciliopathies, like John mentioned, huge, uh, um, great deal more information now because the, the study of genetics and um, multi-system disorders, we're learning a lot more about these conditions. And they can present to us or to the paediatricians, and we need to seek out um, uh, multi-system disorders in these children. Premature birth, more children are surviving born prematurely. Those of you who are involved with ROP screening, like, like I have been for many years, know that children can do really quite well after being born, born at 22, 23 weeks, but a lot of them will carry uh, difficulties into their um, childhood and later life. Things like cerebral palsy and epilepsy also can be either acquired or... or um, due to inherited conditions. And then there's later required uh, risk factors, things like meningitis, uh, mitochondrial disorders that maybe present with epilepsy uh, at a later stage in, in childhood, or terrible things like trauma, um, hydrocephalus for uh, various reasons, and um, acute hypoxic events. All of the, anything really that can give you neuronal injury can cause cerebral vision impairment or brain-related vision problems. The children with behavioural or developmental uh, disorders uh, and various labels applied, these are tricky and these are particularly uh, children in whom we need a multidisciplinary approach because it is, we can contribute a lot, but other professionals also need to contribute. Um, but there are many descriptions of how brain-related vision problems feature in children with uh, autism, with other uh, conditions that are diagnosed on the basis of behaviour. So after taking a history, 
finding out about the risk factors, finding out about what the problems in day-to-day -day life are. Um, I am religious about the need for refraction in all children with cycloplegia uh, wherever possible. And these children, even if the family is worried about cerebral visual impairment, it, it's no excuse for not doing the basics, just so you know where you are. But then visual behaviour and visual acuity and routine tests uh, are what we would normally do. Depending on the level of ability of the child, just their, their head posture, their consistency of viewing, their, their working distance and things like colour preference can be very informative. If it's the kind of child that you'll never be able to get a formal acuity test on, you can still build up a picture of, of abnormal versus normal viewing behaviour. But a very useful test in clinic uh, I have found um, is comparing acuity with single optotypes versus acuity with crowded optotypes, because there are norms for this. And basically, a difference of three lines or more in acuity is abnormal and suggests a child may be abnormally sensitive to crowding, which is a hallmark of brain-related vision problems. Visual fields might be just uh, to confrontation. We know how inaccurate that is compared to formal perimetry, but yet it can be informative, particularly children who, who just fixate on a central target, um, as well as children who perhaps have obvious uh, delay reacting to things on one side or another or inferiorly. And pursuits and saccades, the supranuclear eye movements are, are quick to assess if you uh, don't have much time in a general clinic and they're not very specific but they are frequently abnormal in children with these types of problems with abnormal neurology and that can be a good sign that there's something going on. If you um, have uh, time or, or, or a, a longer clinic like we do there are additional quite simple tests like Leah's post box and rectangles matching test that enable you to look at uh, vision processing skills more accurately in um, conjunction with having assessed their motor skills can they turn their pronate and supinate their wrist you need to know that to then judge whether a child can accurately orientate a letter through a letterbox and whether they can match uh, patterns accurately. And it's very informative if you've seen a child who's got, say, normal crowded log bar acuity, but they can't do this sort of test despite normal motor function. You think, OK, why? What's going on here? Another uh, thing that we've uh, discovered and has, has been very helpful is repeating assessments of pursuits and saccades, but with an auditory distraction, because whilst uh, some children can manage perfectly well when it's absolutely calm and quiet and they don't have to do anything else, if there is a bit of noise going on, their pursuits and saccades become much, much worse. And that's more like day-to-day uh, -day life in the classroom. And low contrast vision is also another relatively simple test that there are norms for. And if that's uh, abnormal, that's also a flag that the child may have um, difficulties in day-to-day -day life and maybe due to their uh, neuronal problems. Then there's a whole host of more specialised tests that are available um, that you may uh, be able to and want to adopt and use, or you may want to refer to another unit if uh, that kind of assessment is needed. So there are lots of visual perceptual test batteries around, some of them uh, specifically for adults, some uh, more child friendly and a more recent one is this CVIT 3 to 6, which is very child friendly. And uh, it's also useful because the parents can see what you're talking about if you can show that the child just can't find a particular shape in a crowded picture. Then eye tracking is also something that increasingly some centres are using and is Additionally, a potentially very uh, promising tool. There's a lot of data about normal uh, eye tracking uh, measures in uh, normally developing people. And therefore, you can use that to pick up quite objective measures in uh, children and adults with abnormal neurology. Other investigations we use a lot of and that have become um, in ophthalmology generally and that uh, can be helpful with this group of children is OCT. If the child will uh, sit at an OCT uh, machine, uh, there's a lovely paper from last year showing that lesions in the visual pathway, which can cause field defects, may be reflected 
because of retrograde transsynaptic degeneration in thinning of either the RNFL or particularly the ganglion cell layers. And uh, this paper from Lena Jacobson's group showed uh, in teenagers old enough to do all the tests, examples of this. And therefore, one can predict if you've just got the OCT um, and you wouldn't be able to get, for instance, an accurate field in this particular child, if you can see homonymous thinning in the two eyes, you can predict they may well have field loss, uh, particularly if you know um, that they do have um, injuries on an MRI scan that might suggest that this is a risk for them. And that can be very useful. This is from the same paper. It shows it doesn't work for all children. If you've got very widespread uh, changes on the MRI, there might just be very widespread thinning, as, as shown here with the um, red uh, in the, say, the middle row. Uh, but they found quite good specificity. So this can be a useful tool that you can do in your normal clinic to see whether there's evidence of, of cell loss in this child's visual pathway. MRIs, many of the children with uh, difficulties that might get referred to you uh, or might the question might be, does this child have CVI or brain-related vision problems? Many will have had an MRI, either because of their premature birth or their other conditions. And there are structural signs like enlarged ventricles and periventricular leukomalacia that we know are associated with brain-related vision problems. Um, newer techniques like uh, the row at the bottom of the functional MRIs can really show us now the kind of networks, brain networks uh, involved in, in vision and how they may be normal or abnormal. Even when structure looks macroscopically normal, the way it works and the way the messages uh, are transmitted in the brain uh, is not normal. And you can see um, on the left-hand side, uh, the normal brain A, uh, with the normal networks and far fewer networks in the middle uh, child who's got the PVL in large ventricles and, and much less arborization uh, of the networks in the functional MRI scan. And the child on the uh, far side uh, has later required cerebral visual impairment. Uh, this was a, group, a lovely paper from the Harvard group. And similarly here, same paper, Broadly, what they've labelled as the SLF and the ILF might be considered dorsal and ventral visual streams, and they can be visualised using this technique of white matter tractography. Now, this isn't going to be available to all of us, but it does back up and show very beautifully and clearly that um, specific behaviours and clinical signs are associated with predictable abnormalities of the central visual system. So if you've done all this assessment, is recovery possible? What should we do for these children? And that's something that many colleagues, I think, worried about. Well, the first thing to say is to treat the treatable, give them the glasses, discuss the amblyopia. Is there a ptosis? Try and sort that out. Treat the treatable. And for the more brain-related functions, there may not be a cure at the moment, but evidence is building for some things like eye movements. There is some evidence that practice, uh, like in other areas of, of motor uh, rehabilitation, will improve. There's also evidence that enriched environments, multisensory environments, can help some children. Um, early intervention, very early intervention, uh, the middle picture here of the baby with all the tubes, that's a very early intervention to try and prevent uh, not just CVI, but uh, cerebral palsy in children who've had a bleed in the brain by washing the, the abnormal fluid out of the ventricles. So treatments are being developed. But for the moment, the mainstay is recognition of the brain-related vision problems and providing what support is available. It may be even quite simple support, like making things bigger or using a felt tip rather than a crayon to make the to deal with poor contrast. Um, that's the mainstay of what we do, and that really helps. So this uh, little diagram is meant to summarise some of those things. Ideally, a multidisciplinary approach involving eye professionals, paediatric doctors, neuropsychologists and educational professionals is 
necessary. That is definitely what we would like. But it's a council of perfection for some children. And I would suggest that if we just tease out the elements like profiling a child, i.e. testing them, seeing what their visual function is, diagnosing a child with all these clever tests and the multidisciplinary input and providing support for the child. These can all be considered as linked but slightly separate uh, aspects of caring for the child. Profiling, I think, is essential to do for children who are struggling and need help to see how much visual problems may be contributing to that. And once defects and visual problems are discovered, some initial support, telling the family that, yes, we found this, suggesting positioning, making things bigger, wearing glasses and so on, is a good start whilst the process of diagnosis is ongoing so that the child gets help as soon as possible. Now, things like who gets certified and who gets access to a QTVI, that's a specialist vision teacher, they differ in different areas of England, let alone different countries, and requires all of us to kind of share knowledge and discuss what resources and skills are available in different areas to agree an equitable solution. And we don't have that at the moment. So I try very hard to squeeze out any visual acuity or field loss in the children I assess so that I certify them if appropriate. But different people have different ways of approaching that and different QTVI services have different resources. And so we're not there yet. But if we can improve communication between ourselves and uh, different professionals involved with the children, we're all working towards an equitable service for children. So in summary, what I hope I've flagged up to you is that the ideal is for all paediatric ophthalmologists to be able to say, your eyes are fine and I can help you, as opposed to I can't help you because it's not the eyes. Brain-related vision problems, whether they fit with a diagnosis of CVI or not, are more prevalent than has been suspected. And this fits in with the well-described risk factors, which are themselves, many of them, becoming more prevalent. Children of whatever ability can be assessed with direct tests. Yes, you have to adapt to the child's ability at age, but you can do observing their visual function, their, their looking uh, behaviour, their acuity, their eye movements and their feels to confrontation in almost all children. There's a range of new uh, tests and uh, questionnaire uh, tools and classification tools that are now available to help you uh, if you're going to develop a service. But the basics and then referring to a, a unit that has more resource should be a, a available to all. Uh, and the we're waiting for diagnostic consensus, but recognition of the children's problems is absolutely key. And so my two lovely children, as I've said, uh, one uh, was clearly recognised as at risk as cerebral palsy, and the other one came up through the ranks, if you like, of primary school of having more and more problems, but now um, is getting support, both for his vision and other uh, uh, systemic problems. There are initiatives both within uh, England and international to try and um, gather up the evidence and work out a consensus statement and guidelines for diagnosis and management of these children. Um, but as I keep saying, in an initial assessment, a recognition that there are brain-related vision problems needn't wait for that and some very basic support can also be very helpful for families, even while they're waiting for more formal diagnosis of whether it's CVI or not and what it's due to. So just to show this is up to date, um, with uh, the message is with perseverance, if we plough on, we will get to um, effective and equitable care for all children with brain related vision problems if we work together. And for those who think I've gone mad, this is a picture from yesterday's news of the um, probe that's just landed on Mars after a seven month journey. So we probably won't quite get there in seven months, but hopefully we will um, by all working together with webinars like this and international initiatives to improve care for these children. And I'd like to thank uh, NHR who have funded me to do the research, the lovely John and all my other uh, lovely uh, colleagues in paediatric ophthalmology and the orthoptists who worked on the study, 
my research team and my uh, the clinically the restored special needs team who've taught me everything I know and other uh, world experts who've um, added a great deal to the research and that I've learned a great deal from and particularly obviously the children and families and staff at the schools where we did our study mm-hmm. and that's it sorry overran by five minutes Not overrun at all. Kathy, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation for, uh, as you point out, sort of an under-recognised you know, condition, and you just set out so eloquently and so simply how we as ophthalmologists you know, can help these children and their families by just thinking of the diagnosis, thinking of questions to ask, making that early assessment, recognising the problem. Because it's almost a light bulb moment for the parents when you ask them the questions, they go, yeah, no, they can't do that. Oh, they don't like playing on busy backgrounds. No, they can't recognise me in shops. And it's these just simple, it's it's like basic history taking. What are the questions to ask? You ask the questions and the parents will just come out on, on, on with it. So the work you've been you know, doing in collaboration with the orthoptist and optometrist in recognising these conditions and picking it up early, I think, uh, huge congratulations to you and, and, and the team for doing well that. And widely disseminated, this you know comes in all settings. And I know after lunch today, Ramesh will be talking about uh, their L, the low vision setup that they have in the LV Prasad in, in Hyderabad and the importance they put on visual rehabilitation and helping these children and, and really getting over that positive, positive message. You know, this is what we can do to help. Uh, and, and that's so important for the parents, really, isn't it? And for the older children is to to, to recognise that problem and put simple measures in, in place. Yes. Uh, I think that, that's very true. Recognition, uh, I expect you've been told, um, is key as opposed to being told, well, it's, you know, nothing to do with us, go away, and families feel bereft. So recognition is a huge thing, even if you can't cure it. Uh, but the simple measures just for schools and what's the sort of feedback you've had from the teachers in the schools you've been involved with? What have what have uh, they said to you and your co-workers uh, when? Oh, it's it really it's quite um, emotional. Uh, sometimes uh, that lovely lady who's a, a Senko, so a teacher who deals with the special needs, fed back to us that after working with us and hearing what we'd had to say, they changed their practice, they made some of their worksheets bigger and so on, and they had a child who they had themselves thought had learning difficulties, but then they found, no, he's fine. He can, if you give him his own work and he doesn't have to copy from the board and cover half the page, and they've changed their thinking of him, he now manages as well as his peers, he just has these vision problems, and if they're dealt with, he he can fly, and that kind of thing really makes a difference. So with specific children, it can make a big difference. The teachers say the same as the families. <coughs> Target intervention. <coughs> and as I've been asking everybody uh, today who's joined us on the on the webinar, uh, what are the reasons why you became a paediatric ophthalmologist and, and what do you, you find are the, the, the most rewarding parts of, of your, your work? We've got you know, joined by 1,300 people today on the webinar. Many of them will be trainees. Many of them may be considering what type of subspecialty to go into. Um, what are the reasons you still love going to work in the morning? Or maybe you're like me, you don't really consider it work. It's, it's, uh... Yeah, no, I, I know. Just Well, I have to say, ra- ra- perhaps uh, counts against me. Initially, uh, neurology was what I was really interested in. But I, to be honest, couldn't face all those years of getting up all night, every night. And I heard that ophthalmology was good because uh, there was a lot of neuro in that, but you slept at night. So I went into ophthalmology and then really paediatric ophthalmology is developmental neuro-ophthalmology in action and is quite fun. So it's intellectually very stimulating, as you said, with with the last generalists, but yet you can specialise within paediatric ophthalmology. It's always fun and different and you have all these other aspects to think about, like the education, the motor skills, all the clever uveitis, inflammatory. It's a very broad church and it's just fun. So intellectually and fun. And the other thing to, to point out in your particular career path, although you were trained up as a you fool in all the subspecialties and your surgery, you've elected to go into a practice which is a non-surgical paediatric uh, ophthalmologist. Yes, yes. In, in the main. And I think that's the important thing to emphasise that 
not just in pediatric ophthalmology, but general ophthalmology, certainly in, in the UK. There are pathways being developed within the Royal College for people to become non-operating ophthalmologists, medical ophthalmologists, neuro-ophthalmologists, but the same applies to, to pediatrics. Um, Yes, I think that, that's that's very true. I, I enjoyed it uh, and it was a wrench to give up, but it's because I always wanted to do research and I just couldn't do clinical, uh, you know, um, medical, clinical and research and enough operating. You know, it, it doesn't work. You have to do enough of everything to keep going. So I, I've regretted in some ways giving up the surgery, but it was a, a price worth paying because it's meant I've been able to carry on with research. Because as I say, intellectually, it's just such fun. <laughs> it is a really interesting specialty. Well, Cathy, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I'm now going to pass on to uh, your and my colleague, uh, Professor Andrew Dick, who is uh, hot-footing it. He's probably still in his uh, retinal clinic in the Bristol Eye Hospital. Andrew is Professor of Ophthalmology uh, at the University of Bristol. He's also the Director uh, of the UCL, University College London Institute of Ophthalmology, an internationally renowned expert in the field of ocular and inflammatory disease, but also a, a VR surgeon as well as a, a, a medical retinal specialist. So Andrew, thank you so much for giving up your time this morning. I hope you finish your clinic and are not disturbed with uh, more cases as you do the talk. We look forward to hearing from you. If you just click your on mute button, uh, then we're ready to go. Got it. Thank you, John, um, and welcome everybody. It's a real privilege um, to have this opportunity to speak to you today. And uh, I too hope I'm not disturbed. The clinic actually hasn't finished yet, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure they'll cope admirably. Um, and it's what I'd like to do today is really give you an update of the management of paediatric uveitis. It's something over my career I've thoroughly enjoyed. Um, it's a it's a privilege to be part of that journey with the patients and their guardians and carers and siblings. It's intellectually and academically a conundrum still, but we've made such great headway in evidence base about how to manage what is essentially anything from a simple to a very complex situation uh, with paediatric uveitis. And I hope I don't complicate it more for you going through this talk today. So, um, Moving on, just trying to work out how to work the buttons. If we look at uveitis in children and young persons, uh, it, it is a plethora, probably even more so than, than adults. By far, and I respect the fact this is a global audience, so it depends very much where you are in the world, as to what the most commonest causes of a patient, young person or child walking through your doors would be. But indeed, um, what is pretty common is, is the incidence of juvenile idiopathic arthritis associated uveitis, varying across the world, toxoplasma. I've written down sarcoid here. It's incredibly rare, and it's been superseded by our ability to diagnose what I'll come to, which is essentially the innate immune activation diseases, Sinker and Blouse. But of course, we also know we get posterior involvement and we have infectious causes. And it's gonna be very difficult to cover all of that, but I'm gonna give an idea of why it's an exciting area to get into, why it's appropriate to, to work in multidisciplinary teams for this complexity, and how we can then go and best manage the patients going forward. So if we look at visual loss, why, why worry? outside the fact that most of our patients in pediatrics by far across the world will present with a uveitis if it's not infectious in its etiology with relative, relatively asymptomatic disease. The eye will be white, it'll, it'll be comfortable, um, but there will be gradual visual loss as a result of either the inflammation, involvement of the optic nerve or the retina, development of a cataract, um, or any other aspects I'll come to. But of course, with that comes amblyopia, particularly in the vulnerable age group. So it's pretty essential we try and, one, make a diagnosis, two, put forward a management plan for these patients. So I'm going to start the story really with work that's old um, now, um, but has potentially been superseded, but the figures don't really change considerably 
which is undoubtedly in the UK and Europe, is that essentially um, JIA accounts for a large majority of the um, uveitis we see in children. And visual loss occurs in about 15 to 20% of our patients in that study. Now that isn't a full cross-sectional population study, so it has biases, but it shows us why we're having to treat these patients. And then I put this up. And the reason for putting this up is that the chronic anterior uveitis, as I said, despite the eyes looking red here, are relatively white, they're asymptomatic, and the chronic anterior uveitis, whether associated with systemic disease or not, will gradually give rise to visual loss due to chronic disease, formation of band keratopathy, cataracts and glaucoma, and cystoid macular edema as the major causes of their, their potentially irreversible visual loss. Whereas on the left, don't forget that common things in adults still occur in children and young people, and that's the B27 related, as we call it, enthesitis related disease. They may have no systemic features at this stage, but they will get an acute red eye and they may get a fibrinous uveitis just as we see in young adults uh, and well, or, or any stage through adulthood. So the complexity comes that when you first see a patient with a young a child or young person with uveitis is whether we are able to associate that with a systemic disease as they present. And that's not always easy, but it is prudent and necessary that we do look at some of the common causes of what is essentially still a rare phenomenon, which is uveitis in children and young persons. And that includes looking as to whether they have JIA, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, for which we need rheumatologists, they utilize ultrasound more readily now for diagnosis of, of otherwise asymptomatic joint involvement. We look at enthesitis related arthritis from mild discomfort with joint pains. But of course, still in children, what happens is inflammatory bowel disease. And then the really rare diseases such as Blau syndrome and tubulo interstitial nephritis. So it's really important that this, unlike some obvious B27 related first uh, um, uh, presentation in adults, that children who present with uveitis, this should be at the back of your mind all the way through. And then we can get to really, really rare stuff that, that can cause disease. And this is by no means encyclopedic. So you can go to references that will give you long, long lists. But the pragmatism of it all is common things within the uncommon disease are JIA, Outside, outside infection, JIA, enthesitis, are the two common driving features of uveitis in children and young people. So if we look at that, it becomes obvious when we see a patient potentially. It's very rare to see B27 related disease in children um, um, under the age of eight, it does happen. But after that, and in young persons, it certainly becomes increasingly more prevalent. And they present akin to um, those of adults. They will have a red eye photophobia presentation of a fibrinous uveitis, as opposed to what I've said, which is JIA uveitis. That's chronic, insidious. The prevalence of uveitis is reported at between 10 and 30% in a population of patients with JIA. So they're the patients that present to the rheumatologist, but equally we get chronic anterior uveitis without joint pain, for which they may get an ultrasound diagnosis of JIA. And then there are other rarer causes, as I put down there, which I'm, I'm not really going to um, consider uh, further at the moment. So as I said, let's go back to the risk of visual loss. Why are we really having to be diligent in how we practice in a multidisciplinary team, uh, even in ophthalmology, as well as across disciplines for the care of our, our patients? Well, that's because 21% of them in general will develop complications according to Clive's work. And I'm sure that's actually higher now we're more diligent with our treatment of uveitis. That includes cataract and glaucoma. The dependency on this is the severity of it as they present. So the asymptomatic patient 
really that's more severe with hypotony or early band keratopathy has more aggressive disease and requires more aggressive treatment, irrespective of where, whether they have joint disease or other systemic manifestations. When the uveitis presents at the onset of the arthritis in younger people, um, so as the age goes down, there's an increased risk stratification that these patients do worse. And that's certainly very true. Boys tend to work, uh, fare worse than girls. And certainly, um, as has been still classified, it's mainly the non-oligoarticular disease um, that gives you uh, an increased risk. So I'm going to mix this up because I, I wanted to. Essentially, all my work over the last 30 years has been on immunology. So I'm going to look at the problem we have. The problem we have when we see patients presenting and all of us, whether that's in a general pediatric clinic through casualty or in a, in a um, specialist clinic, is risk stratification. How do we know, one, what the disease is, two, what their risk is going forward? And all of this is thought to be an immune-mediated disease. So this is the sort of typical, is it an autoimmune disease or not? And if it is, is it related to classical immune-related genes, such as the HLA genes, and indeed, you can see some association in certain diseases, such as acute anterior uveitis, that's B27 related. That's an obvious given. Don't get worried about all of this. It's just to simply em emphasize that some of these genes that show associations are also associated with severity. And it may be that in the future, we'll be able to risk stratify based on their genetic makeup when the patient first presents, because at the moment, we have to make a decision whether we go on drops, whether we do systemic treatment, and how hard we treat these patients whilst we're seeking a systemic association or not with um, the uveitis. And this is just purely to give you an example of how far we've come, or we being the global we across the world, in developing understanding of what may be potential risk factors, not only of disease, but of severity. Uh, in our uveitis population. So the patient presents. How do we assess activity? One of the obvious things is we have classification systems of cells and flare, which everyone does. Drops come at a price because they are chronic diseases that require chronic treatments. Although some JIA is relapsing remitting, the majority is insidious and chronic, for example. And some of the work, the um, American have done really well, particularly Jenny Thorne um, with Doug Jabs, is to develop sort of an understanding of the risk, for example, of cataract development amongst children with JIA uveitis. And they are, they're basically telling us that if we persistently use more than three drops a day of any steroid to uh, these patients, so you're replacing one problem with another and even probably without even getting full remission of disease. So they now have two problems, not enough control of disease and also um, developing complications. So there's been a lot of work done and, um, and uh, Professor Ramanan, who I work with um, in Bristol, uh, with a whole group has uh, created the SHARE initiative, which is really the recommendations of how to manage uveitis associated GIA. Now, it's interesting that this has been driven by the rheumatologists mostly because they are really well connected to do this. Um, and, and that's what's happened. And I'll just go on an aside. In, in Bristol, um, when I arrived in 2020, there wasn't really a JIA service outside the screening or a uveitis service for pediatrics. So it's the first thing that we established. But very quickly, um, there was a young locum consultant called Dr. Ramanan, who then got substantive post. And in 2007, we established a joint clinic. Now that joint clinic now runs for the care of all these complex patients that come through many ways. And it's only through that multidisciplinary action that we provided the evidence now I'm gonna to come to that um, allows us to know how to best treat patients going forward. We're still trying to provide more evidence as we go through. So what did they come up to, uh, come up with? 
So they said, sure, topical steroids are the first line of treatment. Consensus is yes, absolutely. Um, they concluded that topical and systemic NSAIDs really don't have a demonstrable effect as monotherapy, but may be used as additional therapy. And the reason that was put in was because the evidence for that to say it doesn't have a demonstrable effect is quite high. As an additional therapy, the evidence level is very low, but still it's there for people to consider. Systemic immunosuppression in active uveitis is recommended, particularly if poor prognostic factors are present at the first visit. So that's go reduction, and that includes the drops. Possible. So why are we doing this? Well, I know um, many of us uh, that deal um, with pediatric uveitis, um, certainly I don't want to see too much of this, an aphakic patient because of severe disease and trying to overcome amblyopia alongside high pressures um, require ultimately quite significant um, glaucoma surgery and or cataract surgery whilst trying to control the inflammation. It is a dreadful storm to be in respective study population. They're mainly males, respective study population. They're mainly males. It's early onset or early onset with arthritis. So how do you treat? Well, I'm going to cut to the chase and say limited evidence outside methotrexate, which is certainly the first indication of systemic treatment for our patients with JIA when it's moderate to severe. And also remember that on this paper, a high number of patients with inactive uveitis relapse quickly when you withdrew methotrexate. And that is because we cannot detect, have a biomarker, are able clinically to, um, to predict outcomes. So hence the comment that you have to be on immunosuppression for a significant period of time. However, if you fail methotrexate, we need to understand where we go. And therefore, you know, the excitement I've had is understanding the role of certain agents in uveitis. And we've done that from animal models. Are they good? Probably not. Do they help us with pathways? Yes. Do they help us with introducing drug development? Yes. So with that, we were able to clearly show that common cytokines are increased um, in patients with uveitis and in children and young adults. And we were clearly able to show that one of the highest um, uh, cytokines for that is TNF, which is, of course, no surprise because it's similar in, in juvenile idiopathic arthritis without uveitis. So if we were to introduce anti-TNF agents, TNF neutralizing agents, agents that block TNF activity, all the same thing, by the way, uh, Atanaset was one of the first anti-TNF agents to be licensed for rheumatoid arthritis, but really it's very poor in adults, um, showing no effect. It had some effect in some case reports, but that's superseded with high level evidence of no effect. It has no effect in a randomized control trial of JIA. And it had in an open label study, some effect in treatment resisting JIA associated uveitis. But considering the fact it has no effect on the joints, this really hasn't gained any traction. So we designed the Sycamore study very briefly. This was to look at another anti-TNF hip inhibitor called adalimumab. This is given subcutaneously every other week, and it was brought into patients with moderate to severe disease with uh, methotrexate-resistant disease, which also required more than two drops a day in order to try and keep the inflammation inside the eye at bay. They were randomized two to one, and just a long story short, so pronounced that the trial was stopped early because of the divergence between the placebo and the treatment arm and the benefit the treatment was given. It's very unusual for a trial to be stopped early due to ethical reasons of not continuing. So the benefit was so substantial, as you can see from the p-value and the hazard ratio, that the final analysis was undoubtedly in favor of treating with adalimumab for our patients with moderate to severe methotrexate and steroid drop resistant or refractory uveitis disease, a great, great um, advance 
for the management of our patients with uveitis. However, 25 to 30% of patients who are severe fail. So we then undertook another study because one of the other cytokines that was raised was a cytokine called IL-6. You will have heard through COVID that tocilizumab is an anti-IL-6 uh, receptor blocker, and it reduces this innate immune drive that we see in uveitis and as we saw in COVID. So we did this study, which was open label, taking anti-TNF refractory patients in a, in a single arm phase two study. I'm not asking you to read through all the busyness on the left hand side of the slide, but essentially um, what we looked at was a, a um, factorial design Bayesian statistics to look to see if there was any evidence we should do a larger randomized controlled trial. And at the end of the day, the endpoint was not met. So the results didn't support that tocilizumab would be useful going forward in uveitis patients that were refractory to um, anti-TNFs. There was an indication that some patients responded, particularly um, um, if they had associated cystoid macular edema. But that is looking at a different subset of, of patients. So it shows you the fickleness, but the appropriateness of doing studies. One, it provides evidence like adalimumab to make our care better. Two, it provides the evidence of not just pushing forward where there is no indication um, of potential benefit. So the dilemma for using what are called biologics, antibody treatments, <coughs> excuse me, for the treatment of uveitis is that we could use other anti-TNF agents. Maybe if adalimumab isn't working, why don't we go back to the older version, which is called infliximab, an infusion given every eight weeks. It tends to work in B27 associated anterior uveitis. It certainly reduces the attacks of associated anterior uveitis in spondyloarthropathies such as angspond. But we don't have that evidence in a controlled fashion for JIA. But we do still consider switching to infliximab if adalimumab is failing. Why would adalimumab fail? So I'm going to go even further. This is not about us getting in here or, or asking you to do this in the clinic. It's to show you really how, what our journey, a bit like Kathy was saying, how can we get to Mars in, in, in seven months? Um, so this is our algorithm. Anterior uveitis, a grade of greater than one plus cells. We look at adverse prognostic factors, macular edema, any vitreous opacities, glaucoma or hypotony, poor visual acuity, which may be amblyopic related, I agree, but is an indicator of poor outcome, cataract formation, bank keratopathy, the extent of posterior sneakii. If they don't have any of that, topical steroids and a cyclopedia is highly appropriate. If they respond, it's highly appropriate if their cells are, are, are pushed into less than one plus or zero to keep them and no escalation is required. If, however, that is failing, irrespective of systemic disease association with chronic anterior uveitis, we should look to escalate to methotrexate. And we start on the dose given here, 10 to 15 milligrams per meter spread every week. If we achieve remission as defined, and this isn't totally going to zero cells, this is about controlling the disease where we know the sequelae of less than one plus of cells through cohort evidence is less likely to cause complications, then we just maintain on methotrexate for a minimum of two years prior to withdrawal. If, however, they fail, then we escalate to adalimumab, as described here. The dose varies, and that's just taken from trials, dependent on the weight of the patient. Again, if they respond, you maintain that for two years. If they don't, before switching, we are moving to reasons why they may not be responding. If they measure, if we measure, as we do now, drug levels and what's called anti-drug antibodies, 
we're able to assess whether one, they're on enough drug, two, whether they've developed antibodies against the antibody we're using, so we're neutralizing its effect. So let's take the fact they have high antibody drug antibody levels, which we can measure in a lab and is, and is commercially available. If they have high trough levels, we need to switch biologic agents. If they have macular edema, you could still consider tocilizumab. If they don't, you should consider infliximab, potentially. The evidence for that is low, but it gives us an opportunity. If they have essentially low trough levels um, of positive ADAs and a low trough level or, um, of, um, uh, or negative ADAs, so this is basically low amount of drug with minimal amount of ADAs, then let's increase the adalimumab dose or frequency to see if we can achieve remission. Now, we don't know whether this works yet. This is what we're doing ongoing and to see if we can maximize, obviously, achieving remission um, to reduce the sequelae I talked about and maintain them on the treatment of methotrexate and adalimumab. Finally, the management. The reason I, I just adore this area um, and the privilege to work in it is because it's massively multidisciplinary. Not only are we required to understand the uveitis, that can go from mild um, and just one-off episode to massive complexity, but also involves the multidisciplinarity within the uveitis field with glaucoma specialists and pediatric, for me, pediatric ophthalmologists for cataracts. But we have to work with our orthoptics and for amblyopia treatment and our rheumatologists for the general care. But really what's been inspirational to me is the work we do with the patient and the care of forums, the charities and the privilege to be part of that whole network that helps the child or young person and their carers and, and parents um, for um, bringing out the best in the end for the patient. We've established, uh, you know, a wonderful rapport or, or a wonderful rapport, but a wonderful amount of support through medical ophthalmology, rheumatology, specialist nursing in ophthalmology and rheumatology for the care of these patients. And of course, the most important to me as well has been the physiotherapy for the joints, the physiotherapy for the eyes with the orthoptics and the psychological support required not just for the doctors, but for the, uh, for the carers and the patient. It's a journey. It can be a very chronic journey for which they are helpful because many of these systemic treatments, whilst the side effect rate is actually very tolerable, still requires the patient to engage on that journey. And that can start from the age of 18 months or start at the age of 14, but all of which we need to support throughout their journey. Finally, if we look at the whole of the uveitis population, I also do adult uveitis, um, and I now have a, a developing a transition clinic for our 16 to 18 year olds, because 25 to 30% of our patients that I've been treating throughout our pediatric cohort enter adulthood with a chronic, persistent inflammatory disease that requires ongoing treatment. Thank you. Andrew, thank you so much for a fantastic uh, talk. Really, you know, people watching will be struck by the evidence-based practice, um, the trials you put together with the, your team and Professor Raman uh, and the flow diagram there, just ex explaining the rationale and the evidence base behind the decisions that, that you're, you're making. Uh, I think it's also worth saying, as somebody who works in a neighbouring district, you know, General Hospital, the fantastic a relationship we have and surrounding hospitals have with you as the tertiary centre. So we're managing kids on methotrexate uh, with our rheumatologists and paediatricians on our own smaller teams. But then when they need to be escalated to requiring adalimumab, they're coming up to Bristol to see yourself, Afghan Gully, Professor Ramanan, uh, and the feedback and communication between you and ourselves is absolutely, you know, fir first class. And uh, uh, we thank you for that. Some... Uh, questions 
Cataract surgery is obviously something which fortunately we're seeing less of yeah. in these children. But I'm sure the people watching you know, today who are interested to hear your thoughts on you know, the child who is developing cataract, either due to the uveitis or the topical steroid, is coming visually significant. Um, what were your, your sort of top tips on, well, if a cataract operation, say you have a seven-year-old child, um, let's make it six, still in the amblyopic age range, unilateral cataract coming on in one eye, pressure seems okay, but their vision's dropping, on methotrexate, still on two drops of maxidex. Um, yep. What okay. Going through your mind with mounting yeah, so, that. Well? So, John, thank you so much for the very kind words. The, the 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 first thing is we do have some evidence base, and this is now into the territory of where the level of evidence is much less. So, um, but what I would say is. Control, control, control the inflammation as much as possible prior to going into doing surgery. Uh, so obviously, sometimes we'll have a longer period to do that. Other times, we'll, we'll not. So there are two episode, two activities we do at the moment. The first is we will, uh, I will increase to adalimumab in order to get post-operative control of their inflammation, if not pre-operative control, prior to cataract surgery. The second is I've got a very low threshold of injectable steroids, Ozidex, particularly in children undergoing, um, as you mentioned, seven or eight undergoing surgery, even with the risk of potential raised intraocular pressure. But it's to stop the sequelae of inflammation, because I do believe what we need to do is re rehabilitate their vision well. So I do believe in an intraocular lens implantation, if able because the disease is well controlled. I do believe in a primary capsular, um, posterior capsulotomy um, and make your rectus big. <laughs> um, but all will fail if we lose control of the inflammation, no matter how hard we try. I don't think that makes any difference from my evidence or whether you decide to put a lens in or not. It's all about control of the inflammation. So if I look back at the notes, the ones that have failed more have been under immunosuppressed, or now we have the opportunity of injectables, we should use them. I'm not suggesting without further evidence we should use injectables for just general treatment, although those studies need to be done. But of course, the risk for glaucoma and cataract development is going to be significant in that age group. But as a one-off for cataract surgery, I think it's very justifiable. Post-op drops regime for these kids, you know, they're on their second line immunosuppression. The other, you had the luxury of having a period where the eye's nice and quiet pre-op. You know, surgery's gone well. Do you, Ozodex, you're, you're talking about, um, yeah. but topical steroids. So, yeah, so if everything's gone well and they have an Ozodex in the eye, it reduces that dreadful issue about compliance, understandably, of getting enough drops in the eye post-optively. Nevertheless, for the first three to five days, you should marinate the eye. So regular drops, two hourly pred 40 for that period of time. And then hopefully you'll be able to go down to four times a day with the Ozidex in the eye. Yeah. Uh, just changing uh, tack slightly, you talked about the multidisciplinary team and the importance of, of that. So ongoing, the routine screening done by maybe the nurse practitioners yeah. for the methotrexate, you know, the immunosuppression, um, can maybe talk a little bit about the systems you put in place to liaison with the families uh, for yep. those children having yep. that type of... Yeah, no, certainly. So we're, we're very fortunate to be able to do this with the systems we've set up. So first of all, the JIA screening, which um, uh, undoubtedly will, will varies from region to region around the world. Um, whether, will, ever, where, will it ever become consistent? I don't know. Um, but certainly, I just want to take one minute to emphasize we work on a big consortium now called Cluster. This is to look at risk stratification of patients with JIA and JIA uveitis. The reason being, there's no need to screen patients regularly who don't need screened, but we need to have more evidence of who they are. And there's absolute reason to screen patients much more regularly uh, of higher risk. But at the moment, of course, we have a screening program that follows our guidelines it's run by the nurses, the nurse specialists, um, who liaise with both the rheumatologists. So there's a constant dialogue between the rheumatology and the, and the ophthalmologists and the ophthalmic clinic. 
But most importantly, the patient and the carers are central. So they are communicated by a single portal for our JIA uveitis, that's through the nurse, um, who has constant telephone dialogue with the patients where required. They're given information as accordingly to their what we believe now their risk stratification. As soon as they're escalated, of which there are criteria to the clinic, uh, the criteria is very simply they've got inflammation, um, then they're seen, and then they will be decided to go in various pathways. Um, but need, So there are sort of strat, stratification of clinics in the sense of, you know, mild uveitis, moderate to severe, um, all of which engage um, rheumatology and the carers and the it's patient. Awesome. The patient. Yeah. yeah, thank you. The most, difficult, the, the most difficult thing I find, um, no, it's not difficult, the fun and challenging thing is making, understanding the severity of that disease. And when the patient's two, that can take some time because getting a two-year-old and really assessing them, well, I'm talking about my inadequacy here, is, is actually quite challenging. So if at all I'm concerned based on their sudden onset arthritis, the fact that I managed to get a quick glimpse and there's lots of cells, then they go straight nearly all, and that's not common, but they will go for an EUA because I need to understand exactly what, what the degree of um, uh, of severity is. Yeah. So that's any, one extreme. <laughs> on that topic, any tips for uh, examining uh, children younger, you know, not necessarily the, the two, three, four-year-olds with uh, uveitis, what have you learned over the, the years of your strategies with your handheld slip and for, you know, getting close to these... Uh, kids yeah i think i think two things is don't run into it so so like we all know build that rapport first um and, and i'm even happy to build that rapport first show them the equipment and bring them back um so that's the first thing i learned don't think you have to do it that day if, if alarm bells are ringing you have to try and do something I understand, but in general, you could, and it's not great for the system, I know, and it squeezes everyone's time, but you've got to buy the confidence of the, both um, the parent, carer, and, and the patient. If they notice any anxiety, they won't get anywhere near looking at that, in my view, at that age. So I'm very happy to let them play with the equipment, um, and then if they're not ready to sit down, um, say, we are going to do this, be quite firm, but, but we'll do it another day. Uh, and you can do me first and then I can do you, um, that type of approach. Um, and have fun with it. Make it make it a bit of a, a, a game in that sense. Um, but they've got to, my view is uh, they've got to, uh, whether it's right or wrong, I get more, um, they get on board more if they feel empowered and they're in control. Uh, next question. Parents are often concerned when you tell them your, your child's going to be commenced on yeah, immunosuppression, methotrexate, adalimumab. What if you've got a great data, long-term follow-up with the, these kids? What, uh, if any, are the, the, the longer-term side effects? We know about you know, liver function and methotrexate, blah, 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 but what, what do you normally tell parents who have understandable concerns about starting on? Uh, no, that's a great question and um, one of the most trickiest ones. So I think for methotrexate, it's relatively straightforward. There's about a 40-year history of follow-up or 30-year history at least of follow-up with any form of patient with any disease as a child or young person on methotrexate. I think we can be satisfied to say outside intolerance due to A, B, and C or liver function that may go off but recovers. It's a very, very well-tolerated drug in the sense of not putting patients at high risk longer term. We can't talk about 60, 70 years, but at, to date, it looks a, a fair treatment if the patient is going to be on it for two to five years. Adalimumab is a different story, or anti-TNFs. It's, it's not been used as much in children, only really over the past, at a decent level over the past uh, 15 years. So the follow-up data is much less. And of course, it's a biologic that interferes with immunity. So there is always, always going to be a concern of cancer development later on, for which you know we are very honest about. We say to date there's been no signal, um, but we can't take that risk away. So we, I am very, very honest with that, as so is Professor Ramanan when explaining that. And it's true, some patients, some parents won't do it. 
depends on the age of the patient, of course, um, because then you empower the patient who's 14, 15, and they, they become into decision-making of their own, so to speak. But younger ones, it's a very hard one. So there are times where, where I think um, there have been a few occasions, thankfully not many, where when there's been a refusal, but I do think it's absolutely going to bring the patient to harm, that we go through the appropriate processes to treat the patient. Right, difficult. And that is really difficult, yeah. Very difficult, yeah. yeah. The other thing that you touched on, and please, you did, that the psychological aspect of, of this condition, these are children who spend a lot of time away from school, coming to, to clinics, you know, in injections, which many of them, you know, but they grow to tolerate, but, you know, the hate. What sort of, you know, psychological support you find is, is helpful in, in a younger group but then we're dealing with the teenagers who are maybe coming off, you know, treatment and they've been off for a little while and then they get a flare up and they get a heart sink and having to go back on immunosuppression and they're just in that awkward period in their, their life, you know, as teenagers, lots to contend with, especially at the minute and COVID and what being at school. But so psychological support for the small ones and the, the teenage group. Mm. Yeah, so the small ones, we're very fortunate that we've been able to build psychological support through the paediatric community. I think if we led this as an eye specialty, we'd never have had the funding to get psychologists. But of course, it's inherent to how paediatrics treat, in the, in the particularly in Bristol, in the, in the children's hospital. So we now have that paediatric support. The reason for that is that, again, two things. Uh, the way they teach, so it's a bit like learning and development psychology. It's about them learning with the psychologist about how they feel and it's okay to feel such a way. Don't feel bad about it yourself. Think about the treatments um, um, and, and, and particularly what is called anticipatory nausea. So that's one of the aspects the young people get which is they know it's injection day, so they feel crap before they've even had the injection and they feel very nauseous, um, totally appropriate, understandable. But uh, with psychologists, we've just noticed the way they teach them and learn the patient through that, um, that they're able to cope with it very well, whether changing the day you take it, et cetera, et cetera. The most difficult ones, personally, are the ones you just said. They've been through a journey. It's worked. They've had a drug holiday and then they relapse and they're 15, 16 and um, uh, and everything's going on in life. Um, so, again, what happens there is we build in the psychology support. Now it becomes very much more um, young person and adult type psychology support, um, less play support, more um, true psychology support about learning about illness. Um what they what they do is recognize and point on what is their main issues and then work with them to deal with it their main issue may be stigma their main issue might be nausea their main issue might be um total hatred of the world because it's happened to them whichever one it is that working with a psychologist who then inform us and give us reports helps our rapport with the patients going through whatever it is at that age they've got to take control of the disease and understand so um it can be a longer journey and don't and i don't rush it even though i am eager medically to rush starting treatment again they they need to obviously okay. give consent but but really buy into it it's one of the you, essential components and then as you pointed out having that seamless transition many children in general pediatrics when they're going from pediatric respiratory rheumatology they suddenly the big nasty world of you know, adult medicine, where they've been really well looked at from the paediatric side. It's so important to have that continuation of, 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 of care. They don't feel like cast adrift in yeah. uh, clinics, which have a different feel to them, to the paediatric ones. Correct. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, the, the one thing I was noticing, that we were losing patients who, who were then put straight into the adult clinic, and they wouldn't turn up. Um, and, and then we, we got a group together to ask why, and, and it was for exactly what you said, which was suddenly the clinic's crowded, no one cares for them. It seems much more impersonal, the hard world, uh, you know, it's a state of affairs of adult clinics largely, even though we try not to. So, so what they do is they're brought in, um, and now the first port of call is a transition of the nursing. So they see the nurse support they've always had being transitioned into meeting the new one, taking it forward. And that 
at the same time then brings them into a clinic situation where it's not a perfect transition clinic, but we tend to try and put the younger people in that clinic. So anything from 16 to 24 type thing. Great. Andrew, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. Perfect timing. It's quarter past one here in uh, UK time. Please, everyone, we're just going to take a 30-minute break. And afterwards, we'll be joined by Ramesh Kakanoya, Ken Nishal, and David Granite for what we hope to be a fantastic afternoon. If you haven't already downloaded the Turning Point app, uh, either on your PC or your mobile device, please do that. We will be rerunning the questionnaire about paediatric ophthalmology uh, career choices in between uh, Ramesh's and David's uh, talk. So enjoy your lunch and we will catch up with you all in 30 minutes time.
Well, welcome back, everyone, to the second half of the WISPOS Pediatric Ophthalmology uh, in a Day uh, seminar. I'm delighted this afternoon to be joined by some of the founding members of the World Society. Uh, and kicking off this afternoon, we have Ramesh Kanoya, who is the head of Child Sight Institute at the esteemed LV Prasad Eye Institute in Hyderabad. I had the great pleasure of being invited to the 30th anniversary of uh, the LV Prasad and was just absolutely blown away by the setup that they have uh, in Hyderabad. And I'm delighted that Ramesh was able to join us after no doubt a busy day in the clinic to talk to us about the global perspective of paediatric ophthalmology, the global burden of child blindness, and how, in particular, in Hyderabad and in the provinces around, how they dealt with the high volume of uh, uh, cases that uh, they encountered. Ramesh, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, John, for this opportunity, and it's a pleasure to speak to all of you. Uh, very good afternoon and good evening and uh, good night to many of the delegates who are uh, watching this. I'm Ramesh. I'm speaking from Hyderabad, India. Uh, this talk is, uh, you had, uh, I think uh, you heard three or four fantastic clinical talks today. This is something different. Uh, I'm going to speak. I'm going to speak, uh, you may be in one part of the world, but uh, in reality, what exactly happens in other parts, I had an, op I had an opportunity to work in uh, US and some part of UK, and I could see some of the best pediatric ophthalmology centers around the world. But I'm going to uh, run through uh, some of the experiences what we have done in uh, India, uh, John has asked me to specifically share uh, our experience in uh, with regards to childhood blindness. Thank you so much, uh, John, for the opportunity. I would like to start uh, with the story of a three-year-old girl who hails from Bihar. Bihar is a place in uh, north of India. You can see this uh, on the map. Uh, this is where uh, Hyderabad is, and uh, this is where uh, uh, Bihar is. So it's almost uh, 1,400 uh, plus kilometer. The child is prematurely born. They could not get into the eye care. The number one reason is uh, they were not aware and they had some financial constraints. Somehow uh, this child landed up in Hyderabad. You, you can see, it's pretty obvious. Child has very poor vision and child has by cataract and as you can imagine the, the the child's age is very much obvious the child was child was five years of age you can see child is trying desperate and child is very desperate to have some kind of vision the child is doing all the maneuvers to stimulate some kind of vision be it uh, shaking the hand or even poking the eyes so generously so that uh, there can be some stimulation of the eye and the retina. Uh, this is the desperate situation of this child. Sure enough, uh, we perform this uh, difficult cataract. Uh, I, I'm showing uh, this particular case because there are some uh, things we need to understand with respect to the childhood blindness. Sure enough, we, we did the surgery. We visually rehabilitate the child with the spectacles. You can see that FAQ spectacle. It's not a switch on and off mechanism in a child. That's why Eric ophthalmologists and children, the physicians work with children, really work towards this. Child is, child's vision is not a switch on and off mechanism. It really needs kind of vigorous rehabilitation vigorous detection, vigorous early surgery, early detection. In spite of that, we could give some vision to this child, which was very, very useful for this child. There are two things. If you see this child who got the surgery very, very uh, early in life, obviously because of the, the situation, we could not implant a lens here. We had to give in uh, for the FAK uh, glass. 
and if you see this child this child got uh, implant there both of them are doing very uh, good as you can see the early surgery can make a significant difference in the child's uh, vision what you can see in this uh, three videos that's the difference so i'm going to speak about uh, pediatric ophthalmology a global perspective with that uh, sharing of that case my main objectives are uh, four folds the first one is what is a global perspective of childhood blindness for your information what i tell you prasad we are uh, trying to do uh, to tackle this through a pyramidal model along the along the line we did some relevant innovation in pediatric ophthalmology which are cost effective i will share the glimpses of that and what we need to do in terms of visual habilitation or more often it's called as rehabilitation so if you see the childhood blindness the vision 2020 we are beyond vision 2020 right now the causes are very different from adults examination and assessments are challenging as you know in some parts of the world they don't have even the instrument which are required for this it requires specific management expertise and uh, if the treatment is delayed as you can see in the the first child what i showed there could be some irreversible loss of vision and uh, blinding conditions this is the another aspect of it it can lead to child mortality and they have a large number of blind years this is the graph i would like you to see childhood blindness in terms of blind years in comparison to cataract trachoma glaucoma or um, you know some of the african countries the onchocerciasis this is what the childhood blindness can lead to if you see the 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 prevalence it definitely is more in very poor compared to high income countries as you can see in this particular slide the second part what i am showing here closely it's closely associated with under 5 mortality rate if the child is blind they are you know in a difficult chance to survive beyond one year which is seen in this graph the studies from africa versus other regions if you see here under 5 mortality is significantly high uh, in children with developing countries obviously when they have some component of blindness this is where the colored graph showing which are the hot spots for this under 5 mortality as well as uh, kind of childhood blindness this is where uh you know we are looking at an pediatric ophthalmologist where you are and what you practice what you have depending upon that you deliver this uh, care ultimately what as a pediatric ophthalmologist or ophthalmologist our job is to treat this blindness and incidence wise simple thing is that every minute in a globe uh, in the world one child becomes blind and 50% of this severely blind children die within 1 to 2 years you can see imagine the situation what it is and the prevalence underestimates the magnitude because many of the people when you do a survey they don't even survive to do this survey this is a very very interesting i want you your attention on this uh, colored map here red one is cataract uh you can see the high income middle income lower middle income and low income if you can see the corneal scarring which is on yellow which is more towards here unavoidable blindness increases as the income of the country reduces what you can see in red is a pediatric cataract this these are just examples i just want you to look at the green one high income countries the ropes was very high now it is not that it's declining it's still high but the upper middle income income and the lower middle income are catching up this is what you can see this is kind of snapshot of childhood blindness around the world in terms of uh, your economical status of the country 
And this is a very, very important slide for you to get a better picture. You can see red is the avoidable blindness. The brownish or the blackish one is the unavoidable blindness. Probably you can't do much for unavoidable blindness. Uh, typically, some uh, you know cerebral visual impairment. You've uh, you heard a fantastic lecture from Kathy today. That's more in a rich uh, countries. And as you see the poor countries, the circle becomes larger. And in developing countries or uh, poorly developed countries, the problem is paradoxical. There are avoidable blindness, there are unavoidable blindness. So the challenge becomes even more difficult. You know, do I have to concentrate on children to get cataract surgery or to really look at cerebral visual impairment or ROP blind child. So this becomes really critical. So this impression you need to have. And even if uh, at some point of your career, if you can uh, help whichever way you can, beyond your uh, country or wherever you are, it's a significant thing even in 2021. This is a snapshot of priorities for control. Uh, this is the traditional uh, classification of diseases. And the challenge around the world is health education and behavioral change among parents. This is a significant problem. Why am I talking and showing to you? Because this is a world perspective all of us should have uh, in the education. At some point of uh, uh, our life, we can contribute to these things. It's possible. More tertiary centers are required. More primary care centers are required. Secondary centers. As you know, ROP is becoming a major epidemic along with myopia. Fortunately, around the world, the scarring, the corneal scarring is reducing, which is a good news. So it is just the tip of the iceberg. We still even don't know what are all the things. It depends on country to country's uh, basis. If you look at, even in India, if you look at, the blindness varies from country to country, uh, the state to state. Uh, I'm sorry. I, in Kerala, which is a highly educated state, it's a middle and affluent income. The picture is different from a poor state like uh, Bimaru states, that is Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, and uh, if you know the geographical location of India, it's different. And it's also different, uh, you know, in terms of their economic impact. Retinopathy of prematurity is a major epidemiological problem. All of us know that. And adding to this, myopia is becoming a poo. This is another thing as a global uh, perspective we need to take in terms of, uh, it's not blinding. Sometimes it can be blinding in a later part, but it's a severe visual impairment can be caused or it can also lead to secondary uh, visual loss. So what as a pediatric ophthalmologist as well as ophthalmologists we need to think or any uh, professionals in eye care, we have to preserve and restore sight whenever it's possible. Preserve is like, uh, you know, when you have a refractive error, give glasses, control the myopia, preserve the sight. If a child has a cataract, restore that. Prevention and treatment aspects like vitamin A supplements and rubella, all these comes under prevention. And our goal as, uh, as healthcare professionals should be, regardless of the patient, wherever they are, needlessly, child should not become blind and they should realize their full potential if they are partially visually impaired. At LV Prasad, this is the model we have uh, tried to create a child sight institute where it has got a component of patient care capacity building, training, research, technology and innovation, and additional disease-specific initiatives like ROP, retinoblastoma, and care across all levels of care, which I'll come to it in a minute. This is the pyramidal model what we are working. You know, at the base, we call it vision guardians, uh, basically the health volunteers, who will take care of uh, 5,000 uh, uh, people. Basically, the center recognizes the problem, refers to a higher center, 
and tries to rehabilitate. The next level is uh, you know, vision centers and secondary centers. Vision centers mainly recognizes the problem, tries to do a refraction and then refer. At a service center, or we call it as secondary center, this is for 500,000 people. There is an optometrist and the team is led by ophthalmologist. At the base, we don't have ophthalmologists from secondary center onwards. We have uh, ophthalmologists who annually screen 500 children, 250 children are referred, 500 glasses are prescribed. These are all the things we are looking at. And then we are looking at 50,000. Every 50,000, we have a tertiary eye care center. And then there is a top level, we have center of excellence. So this is the model at Telio Prasad. This is the network we have across four states of India. Hyderabad being here, uh, we have vision centers, secondary centers, tertiary centers, and center of excellence. This is where we deliver comprehensive child eye health, looking at the basic vision screening and refractive error at the base, simple cataract surgery and simple surgery at the secondary level. Tertiary level takes care of most of the pediatric problem. And at the Hyderabad, the center of excellence, we take care of complex pediatric eye problems. And this is the milestones what we had for the last 20 years, starting from Hyderabad to other centers, where we have developed over a period of time. The Child Sight Institute. We have seen, and uh, uh, you know, it, it's one of the very large volume uh, centers where we do a lot of surgeries, a lot of screening. The volumes are very high. The motto of Eli Prasad is, equity and excellence, even if the parents or the child cannot afford, complex the complex procedure is given free of cost or surgery is performed free of cost. This way, we could reach a significant number of patients and impact this many uh, uh, children across these four states of India. This is the impact what we had in terms of restoration of slide, improvement of sight, provide rehabilitation, and preserve sight to this multidisciplinary approach across the network using all the eye care professions. They can be orthoptists, they can be optometrists, they can be uh, vision technicians, and of course, ophthalmologists in restoration of sight, improvement of sight, uh, be it refractive error or squint or amblyopia, and to provide rehabilitation for all of these uh, children, and also preserve sight through school screening, community screening, vitamin A supplements, and immunization program. And obviously, habilitate children with uh, optic nerve problem, congenital disorders, uh, unknown entities and cortical visual or cerebral visual impairment. We have also ventured our uh, uh, reach to the secondary centers that is closer to the patient's doorstep where we perform screening. We have started uh, visiting monthly there. All of our faculty go there, take care of simple eye diseases in children and also simple Low risk general anesthesia surgery also has been done in this secondary center for the first time around the world so that this can be replicated in other countries where you can see in this picture a simple surgeries are in progress in these uh, places. And we do tele ophthalmology or uh, tele consultation through uh, our own app so that we can provide uh, care even if I'm sitting at Hyderabad. I can, I can uh, uh, you know, involve with the ophthalmologist at this secondary center. So I just wanted to touch upon uh, the secondary, uh, the innovation as well as rehabilitation a bit. Uh, number one is, uh, uh, you know, center of uh, innovation at Ali Prasad is an unique opportunity for healthcare ecosystem to have access to a valuable resource for conducting research that is too costly or 
far out of uh, uh, you know uh, thing for for a normal environment in the developing countries one of the things what we have done is uh, you know to screen for refractive error we have created this uh, folding for opter using a paper folding them and then trying to see uh, you know what is the refractive error you know child looks at uh, a far off distance and whenever that child's vision is focused there it can give values in terms of uh, uh, adapters specifically in myopia it's really really useful it can be a screening as well as a kind of we can't uh, there is a very very good correlation with the final prescription as well using this uh, folding for opter which is scientifically validated uh, involving 3000 children second thing what we have looked at is uh, you know uh, whenever we, we found this are all innovation happened uh, looking at a necessity what we have uh, you know sometimes it's even difficult to teach a uh, relative afferent pupillary defect or some kind of red reflex for uh, vision technician in a peripheral location you know there is an ambient light there has to be a observer's qualitative decision when you do a simple torchlight test there should be a control of uh, brightness there what you have done is a pupil plus it's a portable device to measure pupillary response in terms of quantification of response as well as to detect any abnormalities it can be even used in a neurology unit for a uh, concussion injuries this is a pupil plus device where we have to put in front of the child's eye and it can give uh, a lights off lights on it can give a graph like this and then it can give a amplitude of dilatation onset of latency of pupil what is the velocity of constriction as well as recovery what is the amplitude this way it gives a value in terms of size shape the way it reacts whether there is any presence of relative afferent pupil defect with 30 seconds it can give a value which can be you know through eye cloud which can be stored in your uh, laptop or desktop the other thing what we have uh, found uh, especially in children is uh, how do you check the the visual field of a child you know it's difficult to do with the traditional instruments uh, what we have done is uh, you know use this uh, camera based tracking system of this uh, children like an umbrella it the child lies there and there are multiple uh, dots coming there and with the eye tracking uh, movement we can look at uh, for example this child is looking at uh, you know this is captured through a infrared camera and this can be charted on a visual field uh, uh, plot and we can know how much child has a visual field defects and uh, we can come to a kind of very good estimate how much uh, this child can see in terms of field of vision the last part uh, i just wanted to share is whenever you have a eye care facility it's equally important to have a special needs vision clinic what is unique about this clinic is a uh, there is a dedicated space specialized assessment for children with disability both in terms of visual and non visual like physiotherapy and other things and a comprehensive rehabilitation model uh, at our place we have our own setup because once you refer to another hospital they may not even go so we do a comprehensive examination as well as assessment of these children and then go on to parental counseling and guidance and intervention service in terms of uh, physiotherapy vision therapy braille all that what you can see here all the specialists are there in uh, under one umbrella of uh, special needs uh, vision clinic uh, which reaches out to all of these children uh, through this facility what we have this i think it's an important component of uh, uh, pediatric eye care everyone even during their training should be exposed to so that you can give 
uh, better care uh, for these children. In summary, I, I would say there is a significant, significant need of increasing the awareness among our uh, patients. And we should always be advocates of early detection through conferences, meetings, education modules. And, uh, you know, for example, I always tell uh, my residents and fellows, uh, you know, teach your pediatrician what are the simple things what they can do in terms of uh, pediatric ophthalmology, like looking for red reflex and identification of disease and referrals. Even in 2021, many of the uh, people are missed at the primary level or secondary level or a pediatrician level or family level. So this is important. Additional factor, I would say, is cost is always a problem in uh, developing world, uh, world. So whenever uh, you have an opportunity, try to contribute whatever, if you are in a privileged place, try to contribute for the education, training, or even, even offering your services through machine or travel or visiting professor, whatever, you should be able to participate. And the third point I have put here is timely intervention at all levels are extremely important to give that vision to that child. Always focus on salvaging vision whenever it is possible, whenever it is uh, in terms of avoidable blindness. It's extremely important. If the blindness is not uh, uh, possible to reverse, try to provide the, the rehabilitation or habilitation facilities. Salvaging life uh, is also important. Some of the cases when we talk about uh, uh, retinoblastoma and things like that, to that extent. And also I, I said at the beginning, patients can also, children who are blind, they have a high rate of under five mortality rate. So this way, you can even take care of them in a better way. As a summer last slide, uh, if you help, it's a rough estimate. If you try to help one child get their sight, you are impacting close to 10 people. This is, in summary, what we all do day in and day out. And uh, what is uh, the impact at all levels is extremely important. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, John. Ramesh, thank you for yet another fantastic uh, talk. And for those people who are watching who are not familiar with the amazing service you set up, it was a lovely summary of that pyramidable uh, structure you put in, in place. I like to touch on a couple of things. You just mentioned at the end you know, the, the cost issues. What I was struck being shown around the LB Prasad was how you managed to provide, as you said, 78% of care here at no cost. Can you just talk a little bit about how the how it's funded and how people are from affluent backgrounds who are having treatment there, pay for their care, and that subsidizes care from less wealth members of the, the community? How yeah. Uh, okay. Th thanks, John, for that question. Uh, I would say at different levels, uh, the, the, the service, what is delivered becomes variable. It can be 30% to 70%. How do you fund? There are uh, three kind of uh, uh, opportunities we take. Number one is cross subsidy. Like if some of the wealthy patients comes to us, they pay a higher package. We call it as a site saver package. We tell them, do you want to? It's like an instant kind of donation. If they are trying to, if they have, today, for example, uh, if somebody comes to me, our counselor tells them at the outset, do you want to contribute to, uh, you know, avoid men, avoiding of uh, blindness? Do you want to contribute to other underprivileged people? They will take a higher category. With that, if they support four more patients with one patient's uh, care, the four patients we can accommodate. That's number one we take care. That's called a cross-subsidy model where we use. 
this is the most important thing we utilize to give free of cost care for the underprivileged people. Second thing is, if you have seen that model, primary and secondary, there are a lot of philanthropists, local and international, who have contributed to, you know, set up this infrastructure. And even now they are contributing. Like, for example, there are philanthropists. I would like to take care of 1,000 children for the month of December 2020. They give money. We utilize that for the, the patients. And the last one is from the secondary center that's called as vision village vision complex. We get surplus money sometimes. That is also utilized for uh, these. If you look at the uh, LV Prasad model, it's not for profit model. Whatever is uh, created out of these three things are utilized to give a equal care for underprivileged people. These are the three routes we take, uh, John, to give the delivery. Thank you, Raj. ROP, obviously, you know, a, a global uh, problem. What have you? What screening? Uh, methodologies have you put in place? Who does the screening in the in the secondary centres? Um, how is that information collated? Are you using RECAMs, indirects? Uh, how is that an escalated for those children who need treatment? And have you found a drop in the incidence of uh, visual loss due to ROP since the setting up the structures you've put in place? Yeah. Um, th there are two things. Uh, in the city, all of us know we go for a screening. Personally, we go and uh, do it. Sometimes we take care of pediatrician. What happens when you go to the lower level? The population is less. The child who survive is probably, I'm taking it a real uh, world scenario. Yeah. Child who survive is less. But even if there is one child surviving that ICU in a secondary center, we have ophthalmologists at the secondary centers who are trained to screen. They may not be able to treat. They are able to screen it. And they can have a teleconsult call with the high command center at Hyderabad. And then we can decide whether this child needs a laser or we can watch. We have a, a kind of setup of a secondary center ophthalmologist screening. Number two, in some other center, we have a mobile van which can go every week and with the red cam or equivalent, we do the screening there and do it. There are different models, but in spite of that, John, we are not able to reach uh, all the children. Still, in our own network, we are not reaching everyone. We are just uh, reaching probably 30 or 40%. You know, the, our challenge initially in 2000 uh, or 2000, 1995 or 2000 was to kind of involve in Hyderabad itself, to create a model there. Now, in Hyderabad, we have a very, very robust program. Trying to reach to the secondary center that's still in work in progress, we are trying to do that through the training. Interesting. Now, the cataract surgery, what I was struck by with the sheer numbers of children you're operating on. I mean, when you talk to me also about corneal grafting, you were doing 400 corneal grafts in your Institute for Children a year, which is more than we probably do in all the United Kingdom. But just give us the viewers an, an, an idea of the scale of the, the volume of pediatric cataract that you're, you're dealing with. Uh, yeah. Uh, when it comes to pediatric cataract, John, uh, we are one of the tertiary centers. As you know, most of the people, when it comes to childhood cataract, because in India, it, it's more in lower socioeconomic status, uh, children, the cataract. Uh, uh, in a week, we do around uh, 35 to 40 pediatric cataracts in our network. So it's it's close to around 200 cataracts in a month. That's what is the number if you're asking. How do you do it? Uh, again, uh, uh, the cross subsidy we use because cataract is very expensive in terms of care. That is general anesthesia. We have to uh, give the lenses and sometimes even to the tune of providing spectacles. The, the number, how do you take care? 
because we have a robust system of our own pediatrician who assesses them and we have uh, uh, quite a number of pediatric ophthalmologists in our network who are able to operate so sometimes to the tune of 10 or 12 surgeries we do it's a huge number uh, there are uh, number wise i think managing is not a problem because we have a sms service or a phone call if they drop out we call them because follow up uh, drop out is a significant problem in pediatric cataract and also no, sorry, to ask the follow up issues you know, how do you manage follow up contact lens you know, remember or many glasses in children coming from a rural you know background that must be yeah. difficult yeah uh with regards to visual rehabilitation most often i, I can't say 100% even in an infant comes uh, i think in the first uh, talk of today i heard uh, we uh, better avoid intraocular lens but that's not the scenario here uh we try to implant in most of the children provided the eye is okay eye size is okay corneal diameter is okay there is no systemic association uh because of this dropout problem uh if you implant a lens in a child it's better because there is partial optical correction always for contact lens you raise the issue of contact lens the contact lens uptake is uh, pretty low in uh, india it's not that we don't have it if you look at uh, if i look at my practice only 15 to 20% of the people who are epic can afford or go for contact lens rest of them 80% of them go for glasses i am talking about only epic here but 30 to 40% of the children we are able to implant a lens so what do we do for a uh, uh, poor follow which we looked at i think 3 4 years ago one of my fellows looked at in the first year they will come from second year onwards we'll see that trend of drop in the the follow up rate because for some of the people it's a loss of daily wage if they travel to hyderabad we are taking two three uh, routes to tackle that john number one we are providing that care at the secondary level itself so that we we have a map where the patient is coming from we ask them to go to that center that's number one number two our counselors they give them a call in our electronic medical record system there is an option if the patient is not following up do you want to alert i know by looking at the patient's profile at the time of checkout i have that option that alerts the our counselor 3 or 4 days before the appointment system they alert that and they call the patient you are due to come this friday or saturday please do come if you can't come we will reschedule that's what we are trying to do one is the counselor route by taking the help of emr generated alert second thing is a uh, service at the door step we ask them to go to the secondary center and do the real follow up real is refraction e is eye pressure a is alignment and l is for lens parameters these are the four thing we train our the general ophthalmologists who are at secondary center fantastic ramesh thank you so much for another inspirational talk and for highlighting the work that you're doing the lv prasad from others and I think it's really important for those people watching here from uh, europe or the state or australia who you know, to get their head around the numbers of children you're dealing with and the fantastic service you're providing for children just finishing off as i did with everybody this morning a couple what were the reasons you became a pediatric you know ophthalmologist why do you love you know, the, the job that you do what are the uh, you know? okay uh the the most important is uh, why i became uh, to be on become a pediatrician i could not get because in india there is a kind of uh, competition uh, you know pediatrics radiology dermatology goes uh, for high ranks ophthalmology is somewhere in between in in that time now if you take ophthalmology is on the top so mm-hmm. i always wanted to become a pediatrician but when i when i joined the residency and then fellowship 
and uh, when i saw the uh, children who are suffering and things like that i really like the field uh, the the reason for that is you know in india uh, I, i don't know it, it's everywhere I, i can talk about myself we could see uh, the the child children who are lining up in the hospital with so much uh, blindness which you could have done something and uh, during my when i joined even in india at this point of time there is significant shortage of pediatric ophthalmologists i thought everybody whenever you ask anybody everybody used to say that i will take cornea i'll take retina and things like that but for me that passion was that i wanted to make a difference in child's life that's where i took it many many people uh, kind of discourage me saying that uh, you know learn fako it's pretty simple you will make a lot of money uh, i was aware of that you know money is one thing many people are interested i was fortunately it's not that i didn't want money but i thought i can still make a living by being a pediatric ophthalmologist and i really enjoy every bit of it there is no regrets uh, for me at all ramesh thank you very much fantastic thank you before so much. we pass on to our next talk for those of you who were able to join us before um the lunch break you would be you be unaware of the uh polling app that we've been using during Rebecca's talk and that's the turning point app so we want to just rerun after Ben Nichols talk our little short questionnaire on pediatric ophthalmology career choices uh, and to do that please in the next 40 minutes go on to the app store and download the turning point app um and then you'll be able to log in with the wispos uh, code w s p o s and at the end of Ken's talk we'll so then uh, Rebecca is going to come on live and just conduct that little 2 minute survey at the start of the uh, coffee break we're just getting a feel for why uh, trainees are making decisions about their their training uh, and it'd be really helpful if as many people as possible could download that turning point app so now I've great uh, pleasure in uh, introducing uh, Ken Nichol Ken is the Chief of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus and Executive Vice Chair of Ophthalmology at the International UPMC Hospital. Uh, Ken and I go back a very long way. Uh, I was a fellow at Great Ormond Street in 1999 and Ken had just come back from Toronto and took up his first consultant post there. He was a huge breath of fresh air, a place a, a just a dynamic individual who along with Ramesh and David have created this fantastic organization. Uh, whose webinars have been just an inspiration to ophthalmologists around the world during the the webinar ken uh, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to us about your area of special interest corneal disease because we know with juniors who are working in casualty departments confronted by a small child who's photophobic red eye you know what on earth's going on uh, it'd be great to hear your pearls of wisdom and how to assess these children and also some of the amazing and innovative work you've been involved with in Pittsburgh and in other centers so over to you thank you thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me and congratulations on uh, on uh, what appears to be a really phenomenal day so i i hope uh, if someone can give me the okay that you can see my uh, slides are we good Yes, can I do it? Okay. So, um uh common corneal diseases in children I I I think uh it's it's really important uh to remember that when a child presents to you and you're not sure what's going on clearly we don't want to put every child who you can't examine fully asleep but having some sort of strategy to examine them is is a, is a really really important thing to think about. So let's start off and talk about the symptoms and signs of how these children present and perhaps the most important one is photophobia pain watery eye and of course the the red eye um the interesting thing about photophobia is that i always say to my trainees look rule out the really nasty stuff glaucoma and iritis first so you can see a picture up there of a child who's got blepharospasm you got another child with uh, an enlarged cornea on one side and of course the cornea with harb stree 
Um, you have to make sure that you're not dealing with that when a child comes in who's photophobic. And the other thing is the, the child who has iritis. Now, the picture here clearly shows um, uh, mutton fat KP, but they're not always that easy to, to, to pick up on. And sometimes it's not always easy to get a child to sit on a sit lamp. So I'm clearly not going to talk about glaucoma and iritis, and I'm going to concentrate on the corneal issues that you may actually see. So here's a child. Um, I remember this child very well. I think it was my third week as a, a consultant at Great Ormond Street, and this child was referred in uh, with glaucoma. Uh, and I was glad they referred the child in with glaucoma because that was the thing that you know you wanted to rule out. In fact, the child had herpes simplex keratitis. Now, immediately you can see two things. If this was, uh, let's say, a, a, a keratitis due to a scratch. The child would be photophobic, right? I have his eyes closed, and it doesn't. The eyes are the same size. So if you get a hazy cornea, you're going to have an enlarged cornea in a child this young uh, who is an infant. Here's another child also referred as uh, possible glaucoma. And again, this was a geographic ulcer in a child, in, a, in, a, in an infant uh, with um, herpes simplex keratitis. Now, not common not common, but not that rare. And so these are the children that you definitely want to do an exam under anesthesia in because you need corneal scrapes, serology. You're looking for HSV, VZV, and adeno. Adeno is not that common. HSV obviously is. Um, it can be epithelial or stromal. Now, in the United States, when I first got here 10 years ago, um, uh, topical acyclovir wasn't available, and we were using gancyclovir, which was called Zergan. Um, but in children, if you can't get access to topical acyclovir, systemic acyclovir for epithelial disease does work, and you need pediatric input. Why? Because neonatal HSV is a problem because it can affect the skin, the eye, the mouth, the brain, and it can cause a hepatitis. So this is really important. The other interesting thing about herpes simplex eye disease in children is that it can often be recurrent. It, it, and, and, and if it is recurrent, they need an evaluation of their natural killer cell function. Um, in the United States when I was there, uh, sorry, in the United Kingdom when I was there, um, Nigel Klein's lab at the Institute of Child Health was one of the few labs that did that testing. In the United States, Cincinnati Children's is one of the few labs that does that testing. Now, these are two separate children. The primary infection is often, you know, subclinical, up to 90%, but you can get a conjunctivitis or a blepharokeratoconjunctivitis, and you'll often get little punctate epithelial erosions. That will be the only thing you'll see. The diagnosis is made by the skin lesions. When you get the typical keratitis, which is dendritic, obviously, you, you want to treat that topically. But there are a couple of very good papers saying that if you don't have access to topical uh, antiviral, then giving oral antiviral does work. So in parts of the world where oral antiviral may be more easily available, uh, you may want to do that. This child actually did have photophobia. And again, you can see the child's now got vascularization. This was a herpes simplex keratitis that was not recognized as being such because it wasn't thought that you could get herpes simplex keratitis in children this young. So again, um, think about it. Make sure that you've ruled out the other more kind of like uh, uh, severe issues like glaucoma uh, and iritis. But herpes simplex keratitis uh, needs to be thought about. The recurrent disease can be epithelial stromal. You can get a keratin uveitis. Um, and there have been some really good papers in pediatric uh, HSV keratitis. And the risk of amblyopia really is high. The risk of recurrence is high. So that's worth remembering. And sometimes giving oral um, antivirals is important. So acyclovir, valacyclovir, or famcyclovir are all important things to consider. But I always work in conjunction with the, um, uh, with the pediatricians for that. Okay. Now, Let's go on to some uh, 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 other things. This is a really important paper. It basically, you know, people question, you know, which uh, antiviral you should use. And, and the interesting thing was the only one that's not very good 
is idoxyuridine. It causes a lot of toxicity. So if you're in a part of the world where this is the only thing you have, try and use oral anti, uh, antivirals. Um, if you have an epithelial involvement and you haven't got access, scraping the epithelium also works. And I have, uh, on my travels around the world, had to do that. But it works. So there is, you know, if you don't have antivirals, there's still stuff that you can do. If herpes simplex keratitis is neglected, you'll end up with a desmetacil. Um, and the rare sequelae of epithelial uh, HSK is this numbular uh, keratitis. But that that's treated with uh, topical steroids um, and uh, uh, oral antiviral. You don't need a topical antiviral to, to cover that. What about the subtle keratitis? Now, Thigerson's SPK, superficial punctic keratitis, was not thought to occur in children. It does. It does occur in children. And it's something that you should look out for. It's the same symptoms. The child will tell you that they're fine, and then all of a sudden they get photophobic, they get tearing. Um, uh, and, you know, we don't know exactly why SP Thigerson's uh, occurs. We think it's viral-related, but the, the proof is tenuous. Uh, at best, uh, but it's a recurrent disease. And this was a paper that uh, a colleague of mine, Vishal Janji, asked me to get involved in. And we were looking at children who had tigers and superficial punctic keratitis. And it's interesting, you know, the, the treatment um, uh, is topical steroid. And you want to use something like uh, FML because FML fluoromethylone has a fluoride ion attack. So it's hydrophilic, it doesn't really uh, penetrate the eye unless. You're immediately post-surgery, or you've got uh, uh, an epithelial defect. Um, cyclosporin has been used. I do use it. Uh, in the United States, uh, cyclosporin is available uh, as a restasis, and I have found that that has helped tremendously. Uh, this is a protocol. Now, you know, I, I actually think protocols are really important. This is one that Megal Gangrani, uh, Gangrani, sorry, Liz Connor, and Peter Jones, Peter is a resident. Mengel and Liz are fellows coming in to work with us starting uh, in July. But I always ask my fellows who are coming in to think about protocols. If you make a protocol, if you're a resident or if you're a trainee right now, if you have a disease and you make a protocol of what you would do or what the different processes are, a bit like uh, the trainee this morning was talking with, um, with John Ferris. You know, there's an algorithm in how we think. And I find creating protocols makes such an important uh, method of thinking because not only do you have to memorize words, but you start to memorize images. And as you know, the brain's much better at remembering things if you've got an image uh, and words to, to, to think about. So let me explain why this is important. There are some cases where you have thigerson's like appearance, like this one, um, where actually that might not be the case. And this is courtesy of one of my ex-fellows, Inez Wong. Um, this case presented with SPK-like clinical features. Now, I'm going to go back to the protocol. Can you see here in the protocol, it talks about infectious causes. And it says, if you do a trial of topical steroid and it's worsening, you need to rule out an infectious cause. And in this case, it did worsen with topical steroids. And so the decision was made to do a scraping and test for microsporidia. Microsporidia can present and look like SPK. So if you have a child who has Thigerson's SPK and topical steroids make things worse, think about doing a scraping. And uh, this is what microsporidia looks like. I have seen... In England, when I was there, two cases of microsporidia with a history where the children had been um, um, swimming in lakes and ponds, etc. And uh, one case here in, in the United States. So it's not just a you know tropical country issue. It it can happen, and it's worth thinking about. So let's get to the really common stuff, right? The allergic eye diseases. When does the cornea get involved? Well, clearly when you have uh, acute allergic conjunctivitis or seasonal allergic conjunctivitis, the cornea rarely gets involved. But what happens when you have vernal and you have giant papillae 
is that the cornea is going to get involved. Now, I want you to remember for a minute the picture of this boy. I want you to look at his skin. And I want you to look at the lower lid. In his lower lid, on his right lower lid, he has a double fold of skin. That's called the double fold of denier. And it's important to remember because what we've done is that we have said to ourselves, vernal character contractitis occurs in more in boys than girls, true. The onset's usually under the age of 10. And we've said that atopic character conjunctivitis is a more of an adolescent, you know, 20 plus disease. I'm going to show you that that's not necessarily the case. And recognizing that changes how you approach these children. So you can get vernal that gives you limbal changes. This necessitates, you know, prednisolone or, or, or dexamethasone uh, drops. If you don't do that, and you don't hit this hard. If this keeps having, re happening recurrently, you are going to see limbal stem cell damage, and it's important to hit this condition hard. This is a shield ulcer. And the question is, is when you have giant papillae, why do you get shield ulcers? What exactly is going on? And the other thing to, to note is if you get a plaque on a shield ulcer, you really need to remove that plaque. That plaque needs to come off because it is going to leave a nasty scar or it's going to cause keratolysis around it. So if you see a plaque, uh, it's an indication to taking that child to the OR Firstly, to do something about the giant papillae. Secondly, to take, peel that plaque off. So what happens? Why do you get uh, shield ulcers? Well, if you think about the eosinophil, there are all these granule proteins that are actually toxic to the epithelium. And you get release of enzymes that, that actually cause breakdown of the, uh, uh, of the adhesions of, of the epithelial cells and, and, and affect Conjunctival remodeling, these are the growth factors that, are, that are, are released. So there's a good reason why you get these shield ulcers. So as I said, atopic keratoconjunctivitis always thought to be an older person's disease, but it's not. Uh, um, Dominic Bremond and I showed in a multi-center study with David Granite as well that atopic keratoconjunctivitis does occur in children. We reported 23 children between the ages of five and eight. And to recognize this, look behind the ear, their skin changes, look at that double fold of denier. This is important to recognize. I'm going to talk about uh, giant papillary conjunctivitis as, as, as it occurs in vernal. Of course, remember, it can be associated with contact lens wear as well. This has always been a really useful um, schematic for me. You know, when you see a child with uh, severe allergic eye disease, VKC, it's important to understand what drops you're using and what, how you are affecting these different pathways. Because if you're going to do a algorithmic treatment, it's better to understand what are the likely uh, predominant effects uh, of, of what's going on. So you know, allergen avoidance when you've got VKC, while it's important, it's not going to make you see a dramatic change. You are going to have to do that. But in addition, do something that affects the interleukin-5 pathway, the other interleukins-4 and 13, and think about how you stabilize that mast cell uh, in terms of drops. You know, using something like sodium chromoglycate when you've got um, uh, uh, giant papillae is probably not enough. These are all the different things uh, that you can do. There are, we're going to talk about some of these. Uh, remember, mast cell stabilizers, dual acting, they're important. And I more and more, they become my sort of first line of treatment. non are, are important to use. Just remember one thing. If you've got an epithelial defect, there have been reports of corneal melts in the presence of epithelial defects. So uh, be a little bit careful uh, 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 in using those, even though clearly when you use steroids, you're worried about the side effects of steroids. Um, fluoromethylone, less uh, IOP raising potential, unless you've got breakdown in the epithelial uh, um, surface. And of course, uh, a lot of prednol and uh, remixolone are, are uh, considered soft steroids. But again, they can cause raised IOP. So 
you're not safe uh, when you're using those. Th those are the problems that we, we all uh, are aware of. Um, one of the things that I, I have found to be phenomenal is supratarsal steroid injections. If you've got giant papillae, then there's plenty of uh, evidence that these work well. Now, if you use triamcinolone and you have pigmented skin, there have been reports of hypopigmentation of the skin overlying that lid where you inject. So you've got to be a bit careful about that. Um, but they're very effective. I mean, they are really effective. Raised IOP is uncommon unless the child's a known steroid responder to topical steroids, in which case I would not use a triamcinolone. I would just use a short acting, but still very effective uh, in cases of giant papillae to get rid of these uh, um, large uh, papillae very quickly. I mean, it is dramatic. So worth thinking about. Now, Cyclosporin, as I said, is I use it all the time because I have access to the 0.05% um, uh, application, and it makes a huge difference. The other thing that makes a difference is tacrolimus. Now, there are parts of the world where tacrolimus, the, the ocular uh, preparation, is not available. I ask the parents to use tacrolimus on the skin, on the lid, and use it sort of close to the actual margin and a little bit of it always seeps into the eye and really, really is effective. And that boy that I showed you with the atopic keratoconjunctivitis, not using tacrolimus is going to have a major effect on how quickly that child gets better. So it's important to recognize atopic keratoconjunctivitis um, and recognize that its ocular uh, um, uh, appearance is very similar, if not identical, to VKC. Look, in a systemic review of all the different topical treatments, there really was no difference. There was just a positive effect after topical therapy, independent of the class that we're using. So don't get too hung up on what you should use, you know, what you shouldn't use. Uh, the evidence is that as long as you some, use something topical, it's going to work. So this is the next uh, commonest thing. And, I, you know, I'm seeing more and more of this, uh, surprisingly, uh, or not surprisingly, I say, during the pandemic and the lockdown. And that is BKC, blepharokeratoconjunctivitis. Now, remember, um, as I talk through this, try and think about the ocular microenvironment. The ocular microenvironment is the lid margin, the tear meniscus, the tear film, the corneal epithelium, um, and the dynamic relationship of blink. And once you think about it that way, as we talk about this, it all starts to fall together. So, you know, a, a Chile, I, in the United States, I have to say Chilesian because nobody knows what I'm talking about, but you and I know it's really Chilesian. Um, when a Chilesian uh, develops in a, in, a, in a child, I always, always want to check that they don't have myobin gland dysfunction because recurrent chalasia are a problem uh, and they are a manifestation of, of uh, uh, blepharokeratoconjunctivitis. Blepharitis in children really wasn't recognized, I would say, until the early 2000s. And there have been some amazing papers uh, published, and this is a list of them. Uh, in 2007, when I was at Great Ormond Street, we published the effect of visual outcome and corneal changes in children with chronic BKC. And what we found was that the majority of children had posterior blepharitis. And if you want to know if a child has had chronic posterior uh, lid margin disease, have a look at the um, position of the meibomian glands. They should be in the middle of that lid margin. If they're posteriorized, that means so much inflammation that that posterior lamella has been remodeled by the eye and it's disappeared. That is a sign of chronic disease. It's a sign of chronic disease. And what we found was that 100% had a red eye, the chronic red eye. In the United States, these children get treated for pink eye and they keep getting it. Photophobia in 50%, epiphora in 20% but recurrent chalasia in over 60%. So recurrent chalasia, there is a problem that you have to deal with. You've got all the signs. You know, you've got inspiration, you've got pouting, you've got uh, the 
The white arrows are showing uh, telangiectasia, but they're also showing that the you're getting posteriorization and a rounding effect. Think about a windscreen wiper or a windshield wiper, and you will notice that your wipers have sharp blades. If they were blunted and were you know rolled, they would not be effective in spreading your um, the water on your windshield when you wanted to clean it. And that is what's happening here. The microenvironment is being affected. And once the microenvironment is being affected, you are going to get persistent epithelial erosions. You are going to get uh, a dry eye. And when you get dry eye, because of increased evaporation and poor spread, you're going to get more drying of the gland mouths and you're going to get more blocking. Uh, this is what I would call a really inspissated gland mouth. You can see that uh, the paste is sort of sort of gro grown out, you know, um, and the body's tried to epithelize it. Follicles are an important sign. If you've got lots of follicles with lid margin disease, um, it means it's a really it's a it's an absolute um, maelstrom of um, of, of inflammatory markers. This is the most important thing to take away. In children, you very rarely get a marginal keratitis. You get paracentral uh, uh, um, scars and, and vascularization. And in fact, many of these children that I'm showing you the pictures of were referred to me as having herpes simplex keratitis. And of course, their um, uh, corneal sensation was intact. Um, it was the lid margin disease that was causing this. So it's really important to recognize that. And this is what it can look like. You can see how dry this is. This tear film has evaporated. There's no oil. The aqueous film evaporates. And um, you are getting to the point where the mucin is going to get affected and you're going to get a filamentary keratitis. Not common, but it does happen. So why does the cornea become affected? Well, you get these paste-like secretions. You get hypercolonization, then you get hypersensitivity reactions to the exotoxins, you get pro-inflammatory markers released, and you get lid incongruity. The lid incongruity leads to increased evaporation and dry eye. That leads to corneal vascularization, scarring, and keratitis. It is the definition of a vicious cycle. So what are the treatments? I've put lid squeezing at the top. If you have corneal involvement like i've shown you you've got to take that child to the or if i say theater everybody in the united states thinks i'm going to go and see a movie in a cinema so i'm saying operating room just to make sure we're all on the same page you've got to take the child to the or you've got to do lid squeezing and then you've got to deal with the inflammation now erythromycin is a macrolide and the macrolides have an anti-inflammatory effect you are not using them you are not using them as an antibiotic. Topically, I always use fluoromethylone. I'll use polytrim in the United States. I use chloramphenicol in the UK. Uh, and you need to do warm compresses. And there's a regimen. This can take months. And you're slowly reducing what you're doing. And you need lubrication. And you need to think about punctal plugs. I use flaxseed oil. And I use before I use flaxseed oil, I use oral erythromycin. I use doxycycline if they're over 12 and they've got their permanent teeth in. So this is, um, I used to do lid squeezing with uh, a clamp. I now do it with two Q-tips and I really try to get that, that paste out. Um, we published about the use of punctal plugs in children and basically we had no infections. We got some, an extrusion rate of 25%. These are the ones I like to use and you just pop them in, make sure that the flange stays outside. You have to put it back in. And um, I, I did this awake in this, I think she was nine-year-old, um, and it really makes a difference. Do not put punctal plugs in when there's active inflammation. You only put the punctal plugs in once you're on top of that inflammation. Again, I love protocols, and I, I have to thank, uh, uh, you know, I have to be thankful that I worked in the National Health Service. I think it's an amazing institution. Uh, but, it, you know, we were, we were protocol driven there. And again, putting this protocol together helps my residents, helps my colleagues. All You're all on the same page. It's evidence based, consensus driven. Um, and if anybody wants this uh, electronically, if you email me, 
at um, kkn at btinternet.com. That's kkn at btinternet.com. I'd be happy to share it with you. So, flick tenulitis is uh, also lid margin disease related, and this was a child that we saw uh, recently, um, and it's severe. You, you know, you, you're going to have to use uh, either prednisolone acetate or dexamethasone to get on top of this, but you've got to treat the lid margin disease. <sighs> Commonest, this is a picture taken from the internet. Now, apparently, I'm, permission had been given by the parents, uh, according to the website that I took it from. Lag of thalamus, not closing your eyes at night, you know, gives you a, a, a very typical um, a pattern of punctate epithelial erosions, as shown here on the left. This on the right is not typical. Is not typical for lag of thalamus. This child has a uh, lid margin disease, and what I want you to notice is that the punctate epithelial erosions vary on this right side from being coarse to being very fine. And it's uh, the fine ones are often immune related, and the coarse ones are often exposure related or dry eye related. So this is a nice schematic. You know, when you see PEE, the location can direct you as to what the cause might be. And it's, it's worth, worth uh, knowing that. So persistent epithelial erosions, common causes in adults are trauma, epithelial basement membrane dystrophy, dry eyes, primary dry eye like Sjogren, very rare in children. Secondary like BKC, common in children. So what about in children? Look at the lids. Um, I've seen molluscum contagiosum present with PE and a red eye. Think, of, look at, uh, look for hepatic vesicles. Avert the lids. Look for papillae. Look for a foreign body. Check corneal sensation before you put any uh, anesthetic drops in. If they're normal or near normal lids, you're looking at rare causes now. Neurotrophic keratopathy. If there's no foreign body, there's no papillae. The lids are all normal. Uh, also corneal dystrophies. This is a child who presented having been treated with, for uh, Thigerson's SPK for several months, and she did not get better. And I looked at her, thought she may have some lid disease, treated it, but she again did not get better. Take the child for an exam under anesthesia, because you can get a good look. And only on the OCT could we see that there were some changes, fine changes in the anterior stroma. And based on this, and just on this, um, I decided to uh, do a panel uh, for corneal dystrophies, and she came back as having a heterozygous pathogenic variant of the TGFBI gene. Now, this gene is known uh, to be associated with lattice, but it's also associated with Reese Buckler, which I think this child is going to have. So uh, a lot has been said. What's the take-home message? The take-home message is this. Before you read these four things, enjoy being a pediatric ophthalmologist or even just an ophthalmologist who's dealing with a child. Develop a rapport directly with the child. Keep the parents involved, but tell the parents, I'm going to talk to your child. I'll explain everything as we go along. Make the child the focus of your attention because when you do that, They'll give back to you. Children love attention. Children love knowing that somebody thinks they're important. And if you talk to them and they've got their eyes closed and they say the light hurts, turn the lights down. Tell them you're not going to hurt them. And be true to your word. Don't hold them down unless you really have to do that at the very last thing so that you can walk out the room quickly. Um, if you don't get a good enough look, let's say the first time, bring them back, you know, treat them empirically with what you think might be going on, maybe some, maybe you think it's a scratch. However, if you're not getting a good enough look, you've got to think about an exam under anesthesia. If they're young, you know, let's say under two, bring the, get the parents to bring them back so they've been fasted for about four, month, uh, four months. That would be a long time. Four hours. And tell them to bring some food with them in a bottle or something. And they often will go drowsy and you might be able to get a bit of a look. Rule out the sight-threatening stuff first. If you've ruled that out, whatever's happening, you're likely to be able to make better. 
BKC and MGD present differently in children. Just always remember that. They present differently in children. And the one thing about a shield also, if it has a plaque, remove it. Because it'll leave a really nasty scar or you'll get a really nasty reaction to that uh, plaque. In the final analysis, this has been a great day. I hope you'll join WSPOS for their webinars tomorrow and on Sunday. And on that note, I just want to say a big thank you uh, to John for arranging an amazing day. Thank you. And thank you for another fantastic uh, presentation. And the, the, the point you're making at the end, yeah, I completely you know, concur with it. A rapport with the child, especially when you're going to be seeing them multiple times. Uh, I have to admit that the, your paper on managing BKC and the long-term use of erythromycin and topical steroids and antibiotics and combinations totally changed how you know, I manage uh, children. And it was because a, a child that uh, wasn't happy with the way I was managed and then went to see you privately in, in London and one of your trips back to London and you came back with the paper and it just made a tremendous difference. And probably at least 50 or 60 children I've seen since and I hadn't really appreciated the importance of that you know, months and months and months of ongoing, you know, treatment. And these kids do really well. Just picking them up and keeping them on the erythromycin and emphasizing to the parents and to GPs, it's not an antibiotic that we're given for an antimicrobial crisis. It's it's an anti-inflammatory. Um, and the change and the parents, you know, get on board, the kids get on board with it. But it's a it's a long journey for these, you know, children. Uh, yep. and if you yeah, don't and, get and to I the think parents, yeah, no. I uh, firstly, John, I'm sorry. I, 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 I hope that it did help. So it sounds like it was okay. I think the thing is that um, it's it's very low doses that we're using. So people get worried about using FF, FML for months and months and months, but you're using literally two or three drops a week, um, mm -hmm. and you you have to tailor it down. And we wrote a paper showing that on these doses, after seven years, none of the children had uh, cataracts or glaucoma or anything like that and, um, but you're right it, it's it is it's a it's a, it's a journey i can tell you even in the united states i have families flying from little rock arkansas california just for this regimen yeah. and it, it and i say to them somebody locally can do this take the paper back but it people get confidence in in, in you you know and it's um it's it's an important thing to to recognize so i'm thank you for for saying yeah, that, I appreciate really, that. It really works. And, and, and also you know, the importance of managing that child's amblyopia. And I know you're kind of you know, aggressive patching. If there have been infiltrates been picked up late, get on there, aggressively patch them. And often over months, you can see that vision picking up. Even if the cornea doesn't look that much you know, better, you've got vascularization, stromal changes, the vision with patching and working with your orthoptic you know, colleagues can get a decent visual result for, for the, uh, the kids. Herpes simplex uh, double. Are you seeing much more of that in the States than you were in the UK? That's a bit of a worry. These children who are presenting yeah. with the sort of epithelial changes you described at the start of your talk. Yeah. No, I actually, interestingly enough, I, I don't know if it's because of the geography. Um, I see more. I saw more in the UK than I saw than I see here. I've probably seen two babies or two infants with herpes simplex keratitis. What I've seen here more is bilateral herpes simplex keratitis and recurrent uh, in older children. And um, those are the ones who, when you do the natural killer cell function, not number, the function is abnormal and you have to keep them on really long-term oral antivirals. So they're not immunocompromised, but they just seem to have this, and it, it can be transient sometimes, natural killer cell dysfunction. I remember, Ken, there was a case you presented, uh, in, it might have been at the Academy a number of years ago, this child with persistent photophobia, and the young lad, you kept on looking at them, the slit lab, and really close look, there was nothing to see. Um, can you remember the, the case and what the, the underlying diagnosis was? So, a really valuable lesson, because we're always you know, anxious that when you're seeing a child, they're pretty cooperative, you get a reasonable view, there doesn't seem to be much in margin disease, the cornea looks okay, um, but yeah. that was a really interesting case because they were consistent so, in their history of intense photophobia. Yeah, so that child turned out to have 
uh, Miesmann's corneal dystrophy. And what we see, what we don't understand is, or what we don't uh, appreciate is by the time you see an adult with Miesmann's, it's been there, but there's a point, you know, it's been there a long time, but in children, it starts. And so he would get some erosions and then improve. And so you'd see the cornea and you really couldn't see uh, enough. I mean, he was great, but to do a proper retro illumination, he wasn't going to let me do that. So I actually had to do an EUA and that's where I picked up the measurement. So the exam under anesthesia, you know, we've got to be careful about anesthetic exposure, of course, but there comes a point where you think, you know, I don't have a reason for this. And of course, the other thing about photophobia is if you're sure the cornea is okay, just make sure that they don't have a, um, a cone dystrophy. But usually in cone dystrophy, they'll have some nystagmus. That will be yeah. the giveaway. Just had a question come in uh, from one of our YouTube viewers, Ken, wondering when you take consent for lid squeezing in the OR, what procedure do you write on the consent form? <coughs> lid squeezing. <laughs> <laughs> I put lid squeezing. And in the United States, it took me about two years, you know, to get the insurance companies to agree to cover it. But yeah. uh, that's what I put, lid squeezing. And now you say you moved from using a lid clamp to using two cotton buds to <coughs> yeah. Yes. So I put one yeah, one on the inside, one on the outside, and I roll the one outside up to the margin and you get much more out. You're sort of rolling up. I you know, I think I think it was uh, Tony Braun who said to me, they're like toothpaste pointing upwards in the lower lids and downwards in the upper lids, and you want to kind of roll that toothpaste from one end to the opening. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the older children using doxycycline. A question just came in. How long do we give doxycycline for in, in children and BKC? And that's because really how long is a piece of string. Yeah. So, you know, the, the children who benefit from doxycycline, I mean, obviously they've got to have their permanent teeth. You really don't want to end up giving a child these sort of grey looking teeth. Um, they normally have skin issues. So they have got uh, acne rosacea often, often. So uh, I leave that to the to the dermatologist, but you normally have to treat them for a good, at least six months to a year with doxycycline. Yeah. But Ken, thank you so much uh, again for your help with setting this up and for your input with your, your talk today. Just before we break for uh, coffee, we're going to get Rebecca uh, back on who will uh, conduct that quiz on pediatric ophthalmology. Hopefully people will have downloaded the Turning Point app on their phone. Uh, Rebecca, I'll let you uh, open up your slides there. Nice to have you back. Hi. Over to you. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. So the WSPOS are really keen to get an insight into the thoughts of particularly ophthalmology trainees on paediatric ophthalmology. So I've been asked to reprise the survey that I did this morning for those whose time zone meant that they couldn't able well, they weren't able to join this morning. We'd be really grateful for those of you who didn't get a chance to answer this morning, trainee or not, to join in either on the Turning Point app or on the website ttpoll.eu. Enter the session ID WSPOS and then that will let you through into our quiz. Anyone can join and we'd be really grateful if you could join this, this afternoon. You don't need to put in your name or email address if you want to remain anonymous. As earlier, I've got my very helpful colleague, Sunil Mamtora, running the poll. So thank you, Sunil. I'll leave a minute or so for people to either download the app or get to the web page. Hopefully you're managing to get onto Turning Point. If not, then go to ttpoll.eu and add the session ID WSPOS. I just want to say thank you to everyone who responded this morning. <clears throat> and thanks to those who are joining now. Your opinions are really interesting for the WSPOS and for planning training. I think the link for the website is also in the chat on the YouTube as well. So you can join from there if you're having trouble typing in.
So to start off, what stage of ophthalmology are you at? Are you a medical student, an intern, a junior resident, a senior resident, a fellow, a consultant, or are you an orthoptist or optometrist or another colleague with an interest in paediatric ophthalmology? There's a bit of a delay between the different platforms that we're streaming on, so I'll just have to leave a few seconds on each slide to give everyone a chance for it to come through. So next question, whereabouts in the world are you watching from? I know we've got a lot of people joining from across the world, so please let us know where you're at this afternoon. Are you coming in from the UK or elsewhere in Europe, in Asia, North America or South America, or are you having a very late night over in Australia? For those of you who are yet to subspecialize, how keen are you to take up pediatric ophthalmology when you become a consultant? You can choose from one, that pediatrics is definitely for you, to five, that it's definitely not the subspecialty for you. So to help us understand your opinion on why you like paediatrics or what's important for you in a consultant job, you can rank these options to reflect your opinion. You don't have to choose all the options, just the ones that you think apply to you. Is it that you prefer a flexible way of working? That you're keen to go into a subspecialty with widely available consultant job opportunities? Or is it that you have a keen interest in research? Is it that you're keen on the financial incentives to do a subspecialty? Is it that in paediatrics, there's the benefit of being part of a larger MDT of orthoptists and optometrists, and that's what draws you into it as a subspecialty? Or is it not knowing what cases will show up in clinic each day? So I hope I demonstrated in my talk earlier. And finally, what factors put you off doing paediatric ophthalmology as your subspecialty? Again, if you can rank all the options you think that are relevant to you. Is it stress of working with and examining children or the lack of opportunities for research? Are you concerned that paediatrics might not be the most lucrative for private practice? Is it that you don't enjoy strabismus surgery as much as other surgeries? Or are you worried that you might get complaints working in this field of ophthalmology? Or is it that you think your training in paediatrics has not been good enough, either surgically or clinically, to encourage you to do paediatrics? Thank you for letting me share the survey, and I hope everyone uh, managed to respond who wanted to join in. Um, hopefully we'll get to share the results, the results soon. Okay, and Sanol, thank you very much for uh, conducting that survey once again for us. Impeccable timing. Uh, it's quarter past three here in the UK. We're going to uh, have a 15-minute break before resuming for the final leg uh, with David Granite uh, talking about examining children and myself, David, and Yining Stroop talking about uh, strabismus surgery training. We hope you can uh, join us for the last hour of this uh, webinar. Thank you.
Well, welcome back, everyone. Well, welcome back, everyone. Final section of the World Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Stroke Businesses Pediatric Ophthalmology in a Day Seminar. I'm delighted uh, to be joined now by David uh, Granite, Vice Chair in the Department of Ophthalmology and Director of the Ratner's Children's Eye Centre uh, at the uh, University of California, San Diego. David, you were asleep this morning, no doubt, when I mentioned that at nine o'clock, the reason why our regional teaching day for trainees in the southwest of England, with an anticipated audience of 20, uh, has morphed into a worldwide webinar with an audience of two and a half thousand, is entirely due to you. I'd introduce uh, you then as a New Yorker, now living in California, uh, who always thinks big. Uh, and so we're very grateful to you for joining us today on your son's birthday. Uh, and, uh, just like thank to say, you, John. <laughs> the talk you gave uh, on how to examine uh, children all those years ago at one of the WISPOS seminars has really stuck with me, and I'm grateful for you to be able to reprise that uh, talk, uh, and it'll probably draw together some of the things that other people have talked about when it comes to examining children in clinics. So over to you. Yeah, my pleasure, John. And um, I know what a great teacher you are because uh, the very first pediatric ophthalmology uh, World Society meeting that we held, uh, John, uh, you were the one who helped us put together and it was your vision that led to the strabismus training workshop. So uh, from that, there have been multiple around the world. Uh, and, and I think uh, it changed the way strabismus is taught. And uh, at our last meeting in Hyderabad, the workshop was standing room only with people lined out the door trying to break in and all from your vision. And we'll be talking about that, of course, with uh, Dr. Struby later. Um, so one of the things that John asked me to talk about was examining children. And uh, I'm going to um, pull up my, my uh, slides now to show you, hopefully, um, that uh, what, what we've been doing and, and uh, my slides are being held back for some reason. I'm not being allowed to share. Let's see if we can get that to share. Uh, John, confirm that you're actually seeing my slides because this is uh, somehow my Zoom is working funny today. Yeah, all visible to me, David. No problem. Looks good. I think you said it's good. Uh, do you hear the sound? Because I have sound associated with this. Yeah. John, did you hear music? Or did you hear music? No. No. Okay. Um, let's see if I can, I, I don't know if I can fix that or not. I will, I'll go on, but uh, some of this requires music. So it uh, requires sound. Uh, and um, this link for some reason for my Zoom, and I apologize. I'm, I'm turning to one of those people apologizing for their technology, which um, I hate doing, but we'll see it. That's my son, um, whose birthday it is today. And we just uh, got uh, done with... Uh, letting him look at some of his presents, but it didn't let him open them. Um, and then, of course, as John knows, uh, for those of you in England, I am a very big Leicester City fan. Um, and although Ken Nishla, I don't believe, is on anymore, I thought he might want to see the, um, the Premier League table. Um, I don't think Liverpool is on. Oh, yeah, there it is at the bottom of that, number six. And my Leicester is third, uh, making it to Europe, so. Just thought I would share that with everybody. Um, in uh, in the United States, I was giving grand rounds in um, Michigan, and uh, I landed at the airport. They had a driver bring me to the University of Michigan, and every mile or two, I saw um, this sign on the side of the road, and I made the driver stop, and I took a picture of it. And we we drive off, and the uh, the driver said to me, "Why on earth would you want a picture of a sign?" And I said, I can't imagine a more foolish sign in the world. And uh, he said, why? And I said, well, really, do you need a sign to tell people that it's not okay to injure and kill others? I mean, it, it wasn't that settled a long time ago by almost every or every religion. You're not supposed to kill other people. Um, and, uh, you know, did, was it confusing that workers counted as people? So we needed a sign. Um, and then uh, uh, 15 years in jail is a big deal. And I'm trying to picture somebody driving down the road who's gotten over the ethical issues of killing other people and, and, and gotten past the idea that they might have to spend 15 years in jail 
who stopped by a fine of $7,500 in, in U.S. money. I mean, how could that possibly be worthwhile? We drove along for a few more minutes and uh, the driver said, Doc, um, did you know that Michigan used to have the highest rate of roadside workers killed in the United States? And I said, uh, no, no, <clears throat> no, because I was trying to sound like a doctor still. Uh, but I had a feeling something was coming. And he told me that since they put up that sign, that now had one of the lowest rates of roadside workers killed in the United States. See, sometimes to change behavior, you have to say things in a straightforward, clear manner. So most of what I'm gonna talk about today are the lessons I learned from a sign on the side of the road in Michigan about clarity and directness. Um, and John asked me to, to talk about dealing with the badly behaved child and I'm really worried right now. Um, uh, I'm actually going to stop sharing and see if we can change this because this all requires sound. Uh, and if you can't get my sound, then uh, we're in deep trouble. So I'm going to change over uh, and see if we can. I'm going to change over and see if we can get this to work uh, any better. So uh, this is uh, 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 one of the doctors I asked. I said, how do you deal with the badly behaved child? Now, if you're worried about pediatric ophthalmology, then what you're worried about is dealing with the child. Um, and you're, you're worried, oh my God, kids are tough. They're hard to deal with. And, and so I asked people around the world. And the first person I asked was the first chief resident I had as a resident, because he taught me all these lessons. Um, please tell me if you can hear this, because if you can't, we have a problem. Now, Julie, when you're in my office, it's like you're in my house. And in my house, you have to follow my rules. And there are two really important rules. The first one is we always listen to whatever mom says. And mom just told you not to touch anything in my office. The second rule is we always ask permission before we touch things. Now, what you were touching actually costs more than Dr. White's car. So if you break it, your mommy and daddy have to buy me a new car. So let's not touch, okay? John, tell me you heard that. David, I can hear it. Yeah, no problem. Oh, good. Great. Okay. So Daryl White's a general ophthalmologist, and that's how he, he taught me as a resident to deal with children. Uh, and, uh, you know, you'll walk into a room and kids are playing with your toys. Uh, your to Our toys are the sit lab and the indirect. And the last thing you want them to do is break it. So that's one way to handle it. Um, there are uh, other ways. So this is our eye institute, uh, and this is the children's eye center at it. We have this very nice waiting room that has a fish tank. And the idea is that when the child walks in and they feel comfortable and peaceful right away. So you're trying to build your practice in such a way that kids feel comfortable being there and aren't very scared. I asked Dr. Sawe Leo from Singapore the same question. How do you deal with a badly behaved child? Here's her answer from another part of the country and of the world. Hi, so how do I deal with these poorly behaved kids? I have a special trick, the golden box, partially inspired by um, Charlie Wonka and the Chocolate Factory behind the golden ticket. I think Dr. David Granite uses that in San Diego. In Singapore, I use the golden box. So my golden box is filled up with very special stickers and little toys and little things. And if the child cooperates, they get to pick whatever they want from the golden box. So we show them a little bit first so they get an inkling of what they can stand to gain if they cooperate with us. I also have lots of candy in my room. It also helps that I have toys R Us just across the street from my clinic. So I'll tell them if they let us do the examination properly, the parents will get them something from Toys R Us. So really, bribery goes abroad a long, long way. And you just really have to... So bribery goes a long, long way. Um, is, is there another field of medicine, of, of ophthalmology certainly, where you get to have fun and talk about candy and toys? So this is in our office, um, and this is the golden ticket that Dr. Sawe was talking about that we give to kids and we say, you can go pick a toy out of our treasure box. Does it matter? Well, let's see. So how did you get that little girl to come to the office today? Well, last night I told her that if she was good, <laughs> 
for the treasure chest. And what did she say when she woke up? To morning, the first thing she said was, do I get a the treasure chest today? And you were great today, weren't you? Yeah. Thank you. So, I mean, her anticipation wasn't, oh my gosh, I'm going to the eye doctor. What's going to happen when I get there? And also, she was excited. She was getting a toy from the treasure chest. So we've changed the dynamic and set the expectations. And I said, <laughs> the fun is just worth all of it. Now, here are some kids that I asked for Mesh Kekanoya from India to talk to me about how he might uh, deal with the badly behaved child. And he didn't send me an answer, but he sent me these videos that were the answer. <laughs> uh, scary, right? Seeing a, a crying kid. Oh my God, there's no way to get an exam. I'm going to have to do an exam under anesthesia. It's not possible to, to, to examine this kid. How do I know what the eyes are doing? Magic. Right tool for the right job. Look at that. Oh my God. Now we know exactly what those child's eyes are doing. How much fun is that that you get a chance to be able to play with a child and make a difference? Or how about this child? No, don't get near me. I'm going to cover my face. Oh, wait, what's that toy? Huh? Everyone see the isotropia? Right? So you'll be able to see that right away. When, when that happens. And, and on the bottom is my favorite way of examining baby with bottle anesthesia, right? And you keep babies comfortable and happy. So a little bit of fun goes a long way to examining a child. How about this child? Do you think we can bribe this boy? I don't know. Let's try candy. No, that's not working. I don't know. Let's maybe try something else. How about a game? He's sitting on his mom's lap so he feels safe. The lights are dim and I need to find out what his glasses prescription might be. So I need to do retinoscopy. I might pack him and say, hold still and look right at me. Maybe, or maybe I might play. All right, dude. Oh. So I'm getting his attention by playing a magic game with him and shining light in different places. I'm pulling it on his face, pulling it on his mommy's face. Right? And then, oh, look, there's a giraffe there. And now we're looking at the giraffe. And now And now it's safe. And I can play with him. So a little bit of understanding of how a child works matters. So I thought, well, I'm asking these people around the world, maybe I should ask the person down the hall. And the person down the hall for me is Dr. Shira Robbins, who's my partner. Uh, and I said, Shira, how do you deal with the bad behavior? Hi, I'm Dr. Shira Robbins at the University of California, San Diego. And this is my approach to the difficult pediatric ophthalmology patient. First off, I like to keep in mind that every family unit is different in their own way and requires a slightly different approach. I like to be informed before I walk into the patient room if there is tension. If I have a difficult patient in front of me, I think it's imperative to change the pace. So there's a whirlwind going on inside of your patient's brain and you need to change it. So the best way that I know to change that is this. That's right, silence. Silence will immediately stop what's going on in your patient's brain, give you a little bit of window to redirect that interaction. Another idea, especially in a highly energetic child, is taking a physical object and moving it quickly, such as this. This is not something that most patients will expect from their physicians, and again, it will give you that little window to change the pace. If you notice, pediatric ophthalmologists have fun at their jobs because we're always having a good time and we always have that little smile. Now, Paolo Nucci is in Italy. And I thought, well, Paolo's really smart. I wonder how he deals with the badly behaved child. Hi, Dave. Uh, let me share with you my 20 seconds of uh, uh, suggestion for inappropriate behavior of children. 
What we are trying to do in my office is to responsabilize parents, saying that uh, our place is a place in which people suffer. So any inappropriate behavior can uh, reduce our concentration, it can disturb uh, the families suffering for conditions. So if they can help us in maintain our concentration, this would be helpful for our work for the care of their children. All right, I'm not sure exactly what's going on in Italy, but apparently people are suffering there and Paolo needs to concentrate. But what he brought up is the first time we've now we've started talking about the parents. Up till now, we've distracted the child, we've played with the child, we've made fun and had a good time. But now we talk about responsibilizing the parents. So the question then is, um, do, do other people feel that way? So I thought, well, let me go as you know, far around the world as I can to the other part of the world in Australia and see what my uh, dear friend Craig Donaldson thought. Hi, Dave. You asked me what to do with children who appear to be misbehaving. Um, first of all, I need to make sure that there's not something else going on. Are they autistic? Um, if they are, well, then sometimes whistling, that sort of thing can help just to gather their confidence and attention. If they're frightened, well, then I'll try and calm them. But then sometimes you do have the child who is just misbehaving and often that situation, getting the parents on board can be most helpful. And to do that, what I do is suggest that they just have a little bit of a time out in the waiting room, maybe for five or ten minutes, and then they regather themselves and we go back and try again. I could repeat that one or two times and usually by the time the parents have been outside for five, ten, fifteen, twenty minutes, they also want their child to behave and that can be most helpful. So in his low-key way, Craig Donaldson just put it, the parents in timeout, which I think is absolutely hilarious. The other thing I want you to notice is that each doctor interpreted the badly behaved child. They all got the exact same question. Each doctor has interpreted it slightly differently, and I think that's fascinating. So Scott Olitsky is uh, another friend of ours that who um, he's always straight to the point. He, he gets it, and he gets it clear, and he always simplifies things. So I thought I'd better ask him this question because I'm sure he has a great way to deal with the bad behavior. If the child's misbehaving because they're scared or uncomfortable, I'll go slower. I'll try and reassure the child. I may even break the exam into multiple parts. And I think in the long run, it'll be a better experience and I'll get more information from that child by gaining their confidence. If I get the sense that the parents are a part of the issue, then I'll often ask them to leave the room and that will often solve the problem. Aha, uh -huh. another person who thinks the parents are really the issue, which I think is fantastic. So now we're putting it together. We understanding family dynamics. See, anybody who deals with kids does have to know a little bit of developmental milestones. You need to know which, what kids do at different ages and, and what's interesting. So it keeps me young. I, so I can talk to a seven-year-old about what they might be watching on TV. And I can talk to a 15-year-old about their video games. Um, and I... I told my wife once, I think I'm the cool doctor because I can do all this. And she's like, no, you're not the cool doctor. You're the goofy doctor. And I guess I can live with that so long as I can get the exam and uh, build a relationship with a family. And I heard uh, a little bit of your talk earlier where building relationships are important. I, I, can't, I can't emphasize that enough. Building relationships matters. So you want to understand family dynamics whether or not there's a behavioral special needs issue. You want to make sure you have a positive environment. Bribery is totally okay. And make sure you involve the parents somehow. Um, I walk into a room and I talk to that child first. That is the central person. And I think that that's really important. And I try and make sure the parents understand uh, that. And, I, and so what I'll do is I'll have a five-year-old I'll say, well, what's your name? We'll talk about what they like to be called. And the parents may actually answer differently than the child does. And that's a learning uh, moment for all of us. And then I ask the child to introduce me to the, to the parents. So they're in control of the room. And then, you know, the distraction, work, magic, et cetera. Um, the one thing that I think that, uh, oh, that this is not coming up right, but that is that, that the one thing that you may have noticed is that you never heard any one of our doctors say, chastised the child. They were patient with children. They distracted the children. They made them laugh. It's not your job to be chastising the child. Uh, and so that, that you want to be careful with. Um, Mal Goldschmidt from uh, Brazil, I also asked this question. He wrote me back. He didn't send me a video. And he wrote this. In fact, I probably have a different sample of patients. I don't actually see children that behave badly in my office. 
It's extremely rare that I can count on my fingers in almost 28 years of practice. Maybe they cry a little bit. They cry a little during retinoscopy, but I don't consider this bad behavior. What's your experience with those children? I wish you a good presentation. So I immediately felt like I was the most horrible doctor in the whole world. That marrow makes people happy. But really, this is an interpretation, and I love it because what he sees, the crying or some of the other things, it's not bad behavior. It's just children. And, and so then I decided, is there such a thing as a badly behaved child? And I needed to ask an expert. And the experts I decided to ask were my mother and my wife. My mom's a professor of education. She's 90 years old now. And she said to me, David, there are no such things as badly behaved child. There are no bad children. Maybe they're badly behaved at that moment, but they're not bad children. And my wife taught me the same thing raising my children. So I leave that with, you, with that thought is that these aren't bad children. They may be scared. There may be other things going on. Okay. <laughs> and then I wanted to segue in a few, for a few minutes, uh, just on why being a pediatric ophthalmologist is so much like being a comic book superhero. And I got this idea from a presentation by uh, someone named Jason Nazar on what entrepreneurs can learn from superheroes. And I'm going to tell you what we can learn as doctors from superheroes. Um, and superheroes are the best at what they do. See, this is where pediatric people, right? We get to have fun. I and mean, how many talks are you going to see where the flash comes up? So the flash is the fastest and we know it. He actually makes his name the flash because he tells you what he does. You are a pediatric ophthalmologist. That's what you do. So you excel in, in that. And it makes you uh, the person who helps children, right? So did, does that work in everything? Yeah. Steve Jobs said, being the richest man in the cemetery doesn't matter to me. Going to bed at night saying, we've done something wonderful. That matters to me. You do something to help a child. You help them for their whole life. There's no money that can ever substitute for the hug of a child, the high five of a kid, the tears of that parent when you've helped their child. Nothing means more than that. Superheroes are clear of their purpose. They never get it wrong. And I submit to you a superhero's purpose and a doctor's purpose are the same thing. This is Captain Marvel. He's a little cheesy because he's a kid who with a lightning bolt turns into an adult superhero. But I will submit to you, our job description is very simple. We help people. That's it. Sometimes it's about their eyes. Sometimes about other things. You can make a difference by helping a child in school. You can make a difference by helping a family dynamic, by clarifying and educating. You get to make a difference. That makes you a superhero. This is Rosa Park, who in the United States um, triggered in part the civil rights movement, but very quietly getting on a bus and sitting where she wasn't supposed to sit because colored people at the time, that's what they were called in the United States, were not supposed to sit there. And her line was, you must never be fearful about what you are doing when it's right. And I would submit to you in the, in the care of a child, the effort you do to make sure they get that care right is always the right thing to do. Superheroes speak up. It's their job. They help people by solving problems. And I have made so many connections for families, sending them to the right ENT, making sure they got the right pediatrician. It's your job to speak up. It's your job to make a difference. And that matters. Um, this is Dr. Ben Carson, and he is speaking to pre then President Obama. Dr. Carson uh, was the head of neurosur pediatric neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins. He got involved in politics, but we'll forget that for a moment. I want you to hear the story he tells. And if uh, a president can listen to it and a senator at the time, I think Very he successful young businessman. And uh, he loved to buy his mother these exotic gifts for Mother's Day. And he ran out of ideals. And then he ran across these birds. These birds were cool. You know, they cost $5,000 a piece. They could dance. They could sing. They could talk. He was so excited. He bought two of them. Sent them to his mother. Couldn't wait to call her for Mother's Day. Mother, mother, what did you think of those birds? And she said, they was good. <laughs> Mother, you didn't need those birds. Those birds cost $5,000 a piece. They could dance, they could sing, they should talk. And she said, well, they should have said something. <laughs> so isn't that true yeah, of us all? Young that we should man. say something. And, uh, if there's a problem, you should speak up. You should make a difference, change things. It's our obligation. Otherwise, we find ourselves on the menu, right? Uh, as they say, if you're at the table, uh, and you're, if you're not sitting at the table, then you're on the menu. So we don't want to be like those birds. Superheroes, 
pediatric ophthalmologist always believe they can get the job done. We always think we can make a difference. We always try. Mom and dad, yes, I know your child doesn't see out of that eye, but let's see what we can do. You heard Ken Nischel and Ramesh Kekanoya and John Ferris, and you'll hear Yi Ning and all the other people that have spoken to you today. We always are trying. How, what can we do new? How can, let's try patching. Maybe it'll work. Uh, let's give it a chance. Let's see what we can do. We are always trying. We're going to make a difference. And Helen Keller, appropriate for our discussions, said, no pessimist ever discovered the secrets of the stars or sailed to an uncharted land or opened a new heaven to the human spirit. As doctors, we are all optimists. Let's see what viewpoint makes a difference. Watch this young child. This is baseball, for those of you who don't know. I'm the greatest hitter in the world! It's like cricket. Oh! Yes. Yeah. Two. Now, three strikes and you're out in baseball. That's it. You sit down. And he's got two strikes on him. Determination. I'm the greatest hitter in the world! Strike three. Find out what you're good at. Now, sometimes we complain because we don't have all the right instruments. And in pediatric ophthalmology, you know, we didn't get the full exam. Think about glaucoma in pediatric ophthalmology. Are you getting your OCT in the visual field and, and carefully uh, getting a perfect everything? No, but you do the best you can. So I, I submit to you, is it possible or ask you, is it possible to make great music with only the instruments that you find in a kindergarten classroom. There's a television show here in the United States uh, called The Tonight Show. And he invited, the, the host invited a band over to find out whether or not they could make great music with the instruments available in a kindergarten room. Everybody knows this song. See the xylophone, the block. <laughs> a little electronic device. <laughs> Everyone knows this song. All right. I think you proved the point, right? Everyone know the next line? Let it go. If the instruments aren't perfect and you can't get a perfect exam in pediatric ophthalmology, you learn how to let it go and you do the best you can. And I promise you, just like Idina Menzel, you can still deliver a fabulous song to that family. You can still deliver great care by using all the other information that you have. Don't be frustrated, make a difference. Now, Batman is a superhero, right? What are his superpowers? He stands next to Superman, who is indestructible, super fast and can fly. And Batman's just a guy. And he decided that he would, with persistence, overcome his limitations and become a superhero. And he stands next to these people with powers. And he's just a guy. You too can do the same thing. You can make yourself into a superhero and a superstar. The people that you've heard today are just doctors that have worked hard. And if you work hard for your patients, with persistence, you can too. Can you make a difference in the world by changing the life of a child? You bet. This is Jody Williams, who won the 1997 Nobel Peace Prize. And you know what she did? She helped ban landmines. And she said, I believe it's possible for ordinary people to achieve extraordinary things. For me, the difference between ordinary and extraordinary is not the title, but what they do to make the world a better place. And we get to do that for a child every day who's counting on you, who puts their faith in you. You get to make that difference. I can't think of anything any better. Superheroes are not flawless. Iron Man always had their problems. All, all, none of us are perfect, but we need 
We need help. So what do we do? We ask for help. It's okay. It's okay to struggle, but it's what you do in those struggles that matters. This is Ben Affleck, and he won an Oscar for the movie Argo. This was his acceptance speech. I want you to listen carefully. I want to thank them, and, and I want to thank what they taught me, which is that you have to work harder than you, th- than you think you possibly can. Thanking his parents. You can't hold grudges. It's hard, but you can't hold grudges. Uh, and it doesn't matter uh, how you get knocked down in life, because that's going to happen. All that matters is that you got to get up. Violet, Sam, and Sarah, I love you. <laughs> right. All that matters is that you got to get up, right? If you have trouble getting that consultancy, cool. get up. Move on. Man. You have trouble learning something, work a little bit harder. Get up. You have trouble getting that exam, figure a way around it. it things will happen. It's what we do in those things them. that matter. Um, superheroes accomplish huge feats. If you think about this, that, that, that the small things that we do can change people's worlds. Amblyopia treatment, my goodness, putting a patch on a child's eye, restoring their vision for the rest of their life means that forever they're not worried about losing their one good eye. It means they may have binocularity. It means they may go on to do all these things in life that they wouldn't have otherwise done. Help the patient, save their world. That is an unbelievable feat that you get to do. Wow, you get you get to do that. My 14-year-old son is a soccer. He doesn't say I have to go play soccer. He says I get to go play soccer. We get to be doctors that make a difference. And what you always want is for your intent to align with your impact. Your behavior and your action have to align to make an impact. So you don't want to just say, I did everything right. If you don't get the impact, then you haven't. The idea is to do the things that give you the impact. You can't do it for glory. It is not the right reason to do it. You do it because it's the right thing to do. You will do a thousand things every day in your office that no one ever pats you on the back for. And that's awesome because you don't do it for that. You do it because you know you're making a difference and that's fine. Let me, let me give you an example of this. This is um, one of the world's greatest violinists. All right. And uh, Josh, oh, I just blanked on his last name, but he was scheduled to play in the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. in the United States for $500, $500 a, a seat. And the Washington Post, the newspaper, got him to go to the subway the day before and play like any other person you might find in the tube, for example. And that's him playing. He's the, one of the world's great musicians. Nobody cares. They're just walking right by him because they have a life and they're going by him. He said it was one of the most frustrating things to do. He was playing his heart out the most he could. He had his box of the violin box open and he was collected money in three hours. This man who commands $500 a seat made $37 and 24 cents in change. And at some point he said, I realized I was playing for the wrong reasons. It was, I was looking for the response of the audience instead of playing for the love of the music. And that's us in our office. If you're looking for the pats on the back, like he did, if these people were walking by, it's the wrong answer. The right answer is to play for the love of it. And that's what he learned that day. And it's one of the most powerful lessons I've ever learned is the here is it's what you do matters. You may not get the applause. They may not be paying $500 a night. There may be people who have no money. Those children still deserve it. Look, children don't pick their parents. And we owe it to them to make a difference for children. I think you can measure a society by what we do for our children, because that matters. We expect a lot of adults. Children, we expect a lot of the adults around them. All right. And as mentioned, I heard at the end uh, by John, we work in teams. You know, you're going to work with the, uh, the retina specialist, the cornea specialist. You're going to work with the ENT. You're going to work with neurosurgery. You're going to work with um, the family. You're a team player. And teams are always more powerful. And this is a Dilbert uh, cartoon where, as we wind up, I'm, uh, that his boss says I'm moving to a shared leadership model. He's one of you who take one piece of leadership role. And Dilbert says, what's my piece? Let's see. I have you down for something called blame. Really? Okay. One, all of us are leaders. You are a leader in your office. You are a leader to the patients you take care of. There is no room for blame. Alex Haley, who wrote the book Roots, which talks about the experience of his family uh, being brought over uh, to be, and they became slaves and where he led to. And what he said was find the good and praise it. 
Remember that as a leader, you are a leader. You run your office. Take that with you. Um, basketball is one, one of my favorite sports and the greatest coach in the United States was John Wooden. And he had this pyramid of, of, of success on leadership. But I want you to pay attention to how he defines success. This man who won the most championships for college teams in basketball in history didn't define success as winning. He says it's the peace of mind, which is a direct result of the self-satisfaction in knowing you made the effort to become the best of which you are capable. See, it's the same in medicine. We can't always control the outcome. But if you know you did your best, that's a success. If you did everything that you could, everything right, you worked your hardest, you knew the information you were supposed to know, that's success. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this last thought. Character is what you do when no one's looking. You're in your office, no one's looking. That moment you took to hold a, a mom's hand, to come out and, and to talk to the parents after surgery and to go to give them the extra time they needed, no one knows. See, reputation is what others perceive you as being. And their opinion, I don't know, maybe right or wrong. Character, however, is what you really are. And nobody knows that but you, and that's what really matters, your character. And this picture of Superman reminds me that superheroes' true strength comes from the character. And nowhere does that come out more than when you're taking care of a child. So show your character, take care of kids. And I say to you, superheroes do work the earth. They help children. And as Martin Luther King, one of the great people on, on the planet and made such a difference in the United States, said, it is always the right time to do the right thing. Congratulations on thinking about all of this. And I'll leave you with this very last quote from Abraham Lincoln in the United States, great president here who said, you never stand so tall as when you stoop to help a child. And I suggest all of you have a chance to stand taller than anyone else in ophthalmology and than anyone else, because you have a chance to make a difference for a child. That's it for me. John, this is yours. I know I went a couple of minutes over, but we started slightly late and I wanted to make sure I finished. David, a tour de force. Thank you so much for a, a, a wonderful talk. Uh, I feel that our, our next uh, talk on strabismus surgery is going to be slightly deflated. He, Ning, and I are looking at each other going, oh, my goodness. We knew we should have gone after David. Uh, <laughs> inspirational. And, uh, yeah, I think it just sums up you know, the question I was going to ask, why pediatric ophthalmology? Well, you've, you've, you've spent the last 45 minutes talking about why we do what what we do uh, and hopefully everybody watching will have taken their own personal message from um but you're totally thank you so much for giving up your time on your son's birthday we're, because we're going to move on now to talk about concentrating on pediatric ophthalmology but of course most of us are strabismus surgeons uh, as well uh, and I'm delighted to be uh, joined by Yining Strew, Director of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus at the Kingston Health Sciences Centre, Kingston and Ontario. Uh, Yining and I uh, and some other colleagues were involved in the WIFOS uh, How to Teach Strabismus Surgery webinar uh, earlier last, last year. Uh, and as a result of that, WIFOS are, are keen to try and uh, develop strabismus surgery training uh, globally. So Yining's going to kick off with... Uh, some generic thoughts about strabismus surgery, about the amazing model she and her colleagues have did. I'm going to then dovetail with some of the way we teach surgery in the UK and the way we've done it for the WISPOS workshops at World Congresses. And then I took a simple model eye, which we hope to rule out, uh, rule, rule out using in uh, some digital remote surgical teaching sessions that WISPOS is going to be running uh, next month. So without further ado, over to you, Yuning. Feel free to share. Okay, can you see my slides okay? Yep. Looks yep, great. okay. Yeah, so um, David, that was a wonderful talk. I've heard parts of it before, and um, next time you will talk after me how great pediatric ophthalmology is. And then I also tell them, regardless of what you think you're going to do, you're going to learn skills in strabismus surgery in our OR that will guide you uh, throughout residency and for whatever career you end up having in ophthalmology. So I'm going to go through that a little bit. 
So communication is key. And that's even more so I would argue in strabismus when the children are going under anesthesia. So you need to learn how to speak uh, and work together as a team, checkouts, learning about timeouts, simple things like draping the patient, um, ergonomics, making sure when you're wearing your loops or working at the microscope that you develop those good habits for your posture. Um, and if you're holding yourself in an uncomfortable position, mistakes will happen in strabismus OR and every surgery that goes forward. Very simple things like inserting that lid speculum without causing an abrasion, keeping the cornea wet. Your cataract surgery uh, teachers will appreciate that you've learned to do that correctly. So instrument handling, of course, is key. One of the uh, sort of foundations of uh, surgery in any specialty is uh, keeping that surgical field visible for the surgeon and assistant. So here's a picture showing that. And I have this picture of a the most expensive pretty uh, teacup I could find online last night. Um, and that's not because this is a UK hosted meeting, um, but to, to remind me of what my mentor Ken Wright would say is when you're holding your instruments, you want to think about holding instruments that are handed to you are uh, safe. And then of course, using a needle driver, I prefer the curved needle driver. So learning how to carefully uh, load a suture, properly load a suture when you've got a curved needle driver, and in strabismus, we teach uh, residents and trainees to do forehand, backhand, right and left-handed passes. You, you need to be somewhat ambidextrous in, uh, in all of ophthalmology and how to carefully pass those nerve wracking scleral passes. Similarly with forceps, grasping tissue safely, unlocking and locking smoothly. In a lot of ophthalmology, suturing is really not done. Think cataract surgery, it's quite rare. Um, but in strabismus, we're going to teach you how to properly suture, instrument ties, sometimes hand ties, how to perform a proper locking bite at the muscle as demonstrated here, so you don't lose that muscle. Um, and then other uh, careful conjunctival closure, your glaucoma colleagues will be happy that you learn how to handle that tissue well. Understanding needle type. So again, when you're past that needle, ensuring that you're in strabismus, ensure that you've been given a spatulated side cutting needle. So I've mentioned that by learning how to carefully manipulate the conjunctiva, especially in adult strabismus surgery, um, you know, when you go on to your other rotations where you have to carefully handle the conjunctiva, you'll, you'll be set. And of course, tenons being very careful with your dissection and respecting tissue planes. And finally, of course, we're interested in muscles. So you, of course, in the strabismus surgery uh, or become good at identifying muscles, isolating, securing them, and reattaching them. I've just listed a few extra skills that you may learn that you'll uh, apply to other ORs, amniotic membrane handling, tissue glue, Botox, to mention a few. So the question is, well, why, I, you know, why am I in this OR? How am I going to apply this? You're going to use all the skills we teach you in all of your eye surgeries. And we're all expected to be able to, at the very least, uh, repair a globe rupture. And a lot of my non-pediatric colleagues have no problem with the globe rupture, except when it comes to the muscle. Well, you need to be able to take off that muscle, find that scleral rupture, reattach it, et cetera. Uh, so at the very least, um, in for trauma, what we teach you will be very useful. And then of course, suturing and avoiding complications. So when you become that anterior segment surgeon and you're taking pterygiums off, you're not uh, inadvertently taking off that medial rectus muscle. So your learning core skills, we're going to teach you the foundation for good habits and techniques, and it's going to be helpful to you. Hopefully we convince you to go into strabismus, um, but you'll use the techniques that we've taught you as a community ophthalmologist or an academic subspecialist. And every once in a while, the question comes up, do we even need to teach our residents strabismus surgery? Um, they're not going into the specialty and it's not leaving our curriculum. And I would argue that it definitely needs to stay for all the reasons I just mentioned. So how does a resident acquire these important skills? So the traditional training, as we all know, um, maybe different from region to region, but in Canada, and I believe most of North America, you get about four to six months in the operating room on live patients with graduated responsibility under direct supervision. This is sort of the traditional model that I went through as a resident. However, that's, that's not acceptable and simulation uh, training is not a new concept. All specialties in our field and outside are taking this approach. 
the bottom line, it's better for patients. And there's, from a learning standpoint, instead of struggling to load your needle during valuable OR time while patients under anesthesia, you're going to master that outside of the OR. So it's an effective risk-free training in technical skills with deliberate repeated practice um, that allows increased OR efficiency, accelerated learning. So even before you enter your sim lab, you're going to read about surgical steps, use an atlas, look at diagrams, look at photos of uh, surgeries, watch surgical videos. And I really feel strongly, and I tell my residents this, the importance of visualizing the surgery repetitively. My One of my teachers, when I was a resident, would say, before I get to work in the morning, he was a cataract surgeon, I do 10 cataract surgeries in my head while I'm in the shower. So you've really worked out what you're going to do at the time in the OR and being able to verbalize walk your, verbalize what you're going to do for every step of the surgery. And then we're going to use simulators. So historically, um, that would be biologic model eyes. I would say now, really, that's uh, very um, historical. Other than sometimes using eye bank cadaver eyes for scleral passes, we still do that in my institute. Um, but again, that's regionally going to be different. The importance of sustained deliberate practice. Uh, with expert feedback from your teachers, and then reflective learning, whether that's watching a video of what you've done and then thinking about how to improve it, or reflective learning on the feedback you've received from your mentors, and then outcome assessments. So now we've taken the model of training residents from working hard in this simulation uh, scenario, and then applying those skills and you're you know, set when you finally enter the OR, starting at a much higher level of learning. So we use simulation surgery not only to get residents who are relatively green to surgery uh, up and going. We've also used this, as um, John and David mentioned, at simulation uh, sessions worldwide. So I've taken a few pictures here from the, the WISPOS meeting in Hyderabad, um, and I've helped run courses with Dr. Wright in the U.S. and courses here in Canada for advanced surgical skills. So there's different models that we can use. Um, again, there are cadaver eyes. Uh, there's a picture there of a rabbit eye from several, many years ago now. Um, but really we're talking about different types of non-biologic eyes. It gets away from the ethics, the biohazard, um, and just the accessibility of a model. So in the middle here is a picture of a model I'll talk about after. Uh, John introduces some other models they're using. Um, and whenever we talk about what type of model to use, we want to think about the cost, the accessibility, availability, um, and then this idea of high fidelity versus low fidelity. So I'm going to stop now. Uh, John, does that work for you? To, and then I'll talk about my model later. John, can I just add something for one minute? Is that okay? Yeah, so that was first off, I, I, brilliant. And I always wished I could be that clear. Um, and I, every time I was thinking of something, um, meaning you said it, uh, it was incredible to me. Uh, it was a perfect description. And I want to just emphasize the idea of the, the preparation before you get into the OR. Um, John Ferris told me that in so many years ago, the general public already thinks we're doing that, right? I mean, no one, no, no, no person thinks that their doctor started practicing on human beings and never practiced outside. Um, and I, the visualization and imaging part, I think, is huge. Uh, with a, one of our residents recently, we sat down to watch a six-minute recession video that I have, that, uh, one of my, my operations, and it took us an hour to go through it, uh, but stopping and talking about it, what it did. And you don't need to ever rush in the operating room, just efficient, well done surgery. But there are details that you need to pay attention to. So bravo. That, I mean, that was just that was just awesome for me to hear. And 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 Ying, I'm just gonna um, emphasize what you said. It doesn't matter what field of ophthalmology you go into, you have to know this. Uh, retina, glaucoma, it doesn't matter what you do, you're gonna encounter muscles and you're gonna encounter understanding how to do it. So um, bravo. You know, actually, just go on. If you play your slides, you know, if you play your slides now of your model eye, then that would probably dovetail into what I'm uh, doing uh, as well. So just feel okay, free well, to sure, I'll I'll do that. Sorry, uh, let me just. Okay, am I back up? You are. You can hear me. All right. Okay, so I'll continue. 
So in the next few slides, I'll just talk about um, uh, our model. And uh, here is the faceplate and the eyes. And you can see this uh, poor model has a large exotropia. And this is what the eyes themselves look like. And uh, I've collaborated, really they're uh, made and invented by my uh, colleagues in Winnipeg, Canada. And here you can see the eyes with a conjunctival layer. They've got the rectus muscles. We've also got models that we're developing with the obliques and the sclera. And you can see here the different layers, um, just demonstrating, um, you know, showing the conjunctival layer being retracted here. And here is a person trying to do a scleral pass with the muscle lifted up for application. So I want to thank Rebecca and uh, Dr. Ferris for sharing their setup for filming uh, videos and also for residents to film themselves practicing. So this is me yesterday afternoon. You can see all the snow uh, in the background. And I tried my first video of using the model. So hopefully this will play and you might need to turn up your volume. So here's our model eye. This is the base. You can see it's just attached to the base with these four bands, which gives the model an elasticity. And you can see the conjunctiva and the four recti muscles. Now you can use the model without the faceplate. I'm going to add it on top. That gives you the realistic positioning of your hands with the nose and the forehead. You can just push the eye to put it into position to access the muscles. Of course, in the OR, I'm going to use my curved locking forceps to grab at the limbus to position the eye. I'm going to demonstrate a fornix incision. So we're going to look for that so called white space approximately eight millimeters posterior to the limbus and parallel to the lid speculum. I've not put a lid speculum in just now. I'm gonna grab the conjunctiva and create that incision. Conjunctiva. And dissect into that quadrant, blunt dissection of our bare sclera. I'm gonna use my Jameson hook. Actually, I'm going to do this with the small hook first, just like in the OR. Put a little bit of lubrication on the hook. I'm going to go down and around to capture my muscle. I'm get rid of my forcep. And then I'm going to replace my small hook with my Jameson. So here we go. I've got my muscle. I'm going to switch hands and bring the eye down a little bit. Now, this part can sometimes be tricky for residents. So we're gonna carefully milk that conjunctiva without ripping it, just like in real life, over the Jameson hook. So you can see that there. So I've isolated our muscle and we would normally do a pull test to show that we haven't split the muscle. So I'm going to replace this medial rectus muscle that's been hooked with the Jameson with my grooved hook. I'm going to come underneath and carefully remove my Jameson hook. I'm giving the OR. I'd probably have the assistant helping me to retract that conjunctiva. But as I'm by myself here, I will just do that again. And sometimes you're doing it by yourself. So there we go. We have the entire muscle nicely placed. So just in the interest of time, I'll just speed ahead here. So I suture the muscle and Grab this is sort of a- sutures, make sure they're top end and disinsert my muscle. So that was a first take quickly yesterday, just to demonstrate how the model works. And then here, just to show, um, you can practice your scleral passes. This is from a meeting several years ago with application, um, has a good feel. So 
So we did publish uh, details about our model, validating it, comparing it uh, to the uh, rabbit eye in terms of its fidelity, meaning its similarity to as real tissue as we can practice on. So that's from last year, uh, JPOS, just before COVID hit. And I'd like to acknowledge my uh, wonderful collaborators in Winnipeg, neither of whom are pediatric ophthalmologists, but just have a passion for uh, developing these models for teaching. And um, this is Christian Petropoulos. He is a oculoplastic surgeon and, uh, or sorry, a plastic surgeon and Will Turek, who's an oculoplastic surgeon. So if you'd like more information, the website is there, imodel.ca. And again, I just want to thank everyone uh, for inviting me. These are my kids. It's freezing cold and snowing in Kingston. Um, and these meetings have been wonderful. And I'm so excited. I love what I do. And uh, I love it even more now that I've gotten Dr. Granite's pep talk again. <laughs> you know, thank you for that. Those stunning pictures of the model for what a fantastic uh, bit of kit. We, we're, we're having to finish at quarter to, to five uh, today because of uh, the duration of our YouTube feed. So I'll just quickly go on to screen sharing here oh, for me my back a second John while you're sharing your screen I wanted to share with you that we've uh, now people must be telling others because we've gone over 3,000 uh, independent unique viewers fantastic well, that's not great um, so this is just a quick reprise of the talk that I give with Yining. So teach yourself for business surgery. And I would wholeheartedly echo all of the sentiments you said, the generic skills that we teach as business surgeons. Faco surgery is easy. Anybody can remove a cataract. Not everybody can do a nice and extra business uh, procedure. And the generic skills will stand you in good stead no matter what type of surgeon you end up becoming, even if you're not a pediatric ophthalmologist. Financial disclosures, I had designed and run the simulated ocular surgery website and the simulation gallery and some of the products here are sold on the website. So that's my financial disclosure. Unusual though it is, it's a business surgeon to have any financial disclosures to make. Uh, these are just some of the uh, images from the model eyes, the Philips Studio eyes, which uh, we use. Uh, the basic model eye, top left, is no conge or tenons. And actually, this eye works uh, brilliantly. The extra ocular muscles are quite long. And Rebecca, who was giving a talk earlier today, on the single one of these eyes, she's carried out at least 100 reception or recession procedures uh, on a single model eye. Um, the advanced model eyes can be used for more advanced surgery, adjustable surgery, inferior oblique, but honestly, just the basic one is all you need when you're starting to pick up strabismus surgery skills. Um, the video here is of the simulated ocular surgery website. Click on strabismus, and it will take you to an overview of strabismus surgery and the Oscar PDF. Uh, if you click on that, it will take you to a downloadable version of this Validated Ophthalmic Simulated Surgical Competency Assessment Rubric, OSCAR for short. And it looks at the uh, three parameters we're using, novice, advanced, beginner, and competent to measure one's progress through the different steps of a rectus muscle uh, recession. It looks like a complicated uh, form, but actually it's very easy to recognize when you start off that you're in the, the novice column as you become more competent moving to the advanced beginner and competent column. And trainees can use that to score their own cord surgery uh, and assess their progress as they develop their surgical skills. And that's the last page of the global industry. So it can be downloaded directly from the simulated ocular surgery website. If you, when I have a new trainee starting with me as Rebecca was in August, I intentionally don't teach them anything. I say, just go to the simulation gallery uh, and watch the videos. And it seems like a rather cruel thing to say, but actually, they don't need me there to teach them what to do. They go on to the strabismus section, click on the videos here, and the one that I get them to watch to start with is the base instrument handling scleral suture uh, placement. Uh, and this is the video that Rebecca would have watched back in August as she started off her simulation this skills. Video you will look at basic surgical skills for trainees uh, about to embark on strabismus surgical training. Um, and 
here we can see the needle being grasped correctly, but this is how not to put a pass through the sclera, tips down and going too deeply, Ouch. just penetrated through the sclera cord of the retina. So the first thing I teach trainees is how to make use of a spatulated needle by pressing backwards against the sclera, the tip of the needle engages safely in the sclera and it's easy to judge the depth of your scleral pass. And the second thing is to turn your wrist round, grab the needle two thirds from the tip and then you're ready to go with your next pass. So they practice different passes, left-handed, right-handed, perpendicular to the limbus, parallel to the limbus. Uh, and Rebecca often had this just up on her laptop at home and she would watch the videos uh, and then practice it and pause the video. So you can actually teach yourself a lot of the basics. Then you can go on to perform so the session all, techniques. Uh, using the technique that my knees have practiced at home with their scleral suturing, placing not particularly deep or long pass at this point, regrasping the needle so they're ready to make the deeper and perhaps more secure pass through the rectus muscle insertion, holding the insertion with the two forceps and placing this through the middle of the insertion. It's important to make sure that they need. So once you've built up some generic skills, you can put those skills together and carry out recession and resection procedures. And once you've used the scoring rubric to make sure you're in the competent column and you've played your recordings to your supervisor, then you're ready to start uh, taking part in live surgery, but only at that stage. It's totally unacceptable for people to be operating on a child or adult, putting in scleral passes when they haven't shown their competence on models such as Yinings or a model like this. What I wanted to do, though, was to try and see if we could uh, make the development of these generic skills available across the world and what simple materials could we put together to make a model eye that would enable a trainee to practice passing a scleral pass of the correct depth, securing an extraocular muscle and then performing basic recession resection techniques. So the next video, which is actually narrated by Rebecca, the, video, the audio is coming out rather quietly so I might have to just uh, overdub it but this is her talking about how to make Hi, I'm Rebecca Jones, I'm one of the year two trainees at Cheltenham General Hospital. We just wanted to talk you through our setup for practicing twin surgery. With this setup, with the Philips Studio I, I've done over 100 recession section surgeries so that I can practice and become more confident before then going into theatre and operating on patients. I've done four lists so far, and those four lists have been able to do 16 complete cases through practicing on the Philips I beforehand to get more so the model eye is great for practicing scleral passes at the correct depth and basic suture tying and then moving on to practicing securing the rectus muscles as shown in this clip with a double arm 6-0 vigral looping double knot spending time at home repeating these maneuvers mean they become second nature before you start so that's the sustained deliberate practice that we were uh, alluding to so rebecca had been with me for six months and she's carried we out over 40 strabismus procedures, including a redo surgery, inferior oblique surgery, adjustable squint surgery. And that is really down to her dedication using the model eyes to pick up these basic skills. And the setup that we've used to record this is described here by Sunil Mamtora. Hi there, my name is Sunil Mamtora. And in this video, I'm going to be showing you how to set a toolkit for practicing simulated ocular surgery at home. Now, here we have a table set up with a ring mount. This is powered by USB. We also have a phone app and a phone stack, which you can insert your phone into so that you can record your surgery while you're practicing. You can get lots of feedback from your seniors or even stream your surgery in real time to your colleagues to get feedback on the go. If you want to keep the quality of your video even better, you can click on an additional two times telephoto link after the camera to get even better quality. Here's how to make the best quality recording. Change to video mode, then change to two times zoom, then tap to focus, and then hold down to lock your autofocus, auto exposure, and then lower the exposure. Now I'm going to show you how to share the surgical field on zoom. So click on share screen, 
and then select iPhone or iPad via AirPlay. Then, once you've done this, you'll be able to connect your phone wirelessly to the same network. In this case, we're using personal hotspot. My phone was called Sonos iPhone. Then, you want to go in your iPhone and you want to scroll down and click on screen mirroring. Select the appropriate output, and then you should see the image directly from your phone on your laptop screen. We'll now be able to share this in real time via Zoom. You might need to just tilt your phone into landscape orientation to get the best image. And here we've got a really sharp view of the surgical field, which your supervisor can see remotely and give you guidance in real time from anywhere in the world. I hope you found this video useful. So the video setup of Sunil described there and how he's connected things to Zoom for uh, a remote supervision, all of these videos and the videos on the show will be on the simulated ocular surgery website on the simulation gallery section. Today I will show you how to make a simple and cheap model eye practicing many different aspects of strabismal surgery. All you'll need to make this model is one millimeter thickness modeling film, ink on ball cut in half, and take matchsticks or cotton buds. If you want to practice making slower passes of the set depth, open hardening modeling clay can also be used, but it's not essential. So Rebecca is now describing the instruments that you require for the basic uh, practice, a pair of needle holders, some blunt-tipped Westcott scissors, some non-toothed and some tooth forceps, and a marking pen. You cut a strip of the modelling foam, one millimetre modelling foam. You can draw a cornea on it here. This is a ping-pong ball cut in half and a little bit of modelling clay. The modelling clay you set on top, then the strip of the foam, tuck it in underneath, a little bit of sticky tape just to hold it in place. And this is filmed with an iPhone 12. So Rebecca, correctly just pressing down on the foam, not going too deeply, passing the needle, turning her wrist round, and then ready to go with the next pass. And this is actually a really realistic way of practicing uh, your scleral passes. How not to do it, because if you go too deeply, you'll lose control of the needle, you'll perforate the sclera, and here you can see the mark in clay where that pass has passed too deeply through the modeling foam. Again, Pat, practicing your scleral passes parallel with the limbus, left-handed and right-handed, building up that model memory. And here she actually describes using the model clay to create a nose, you can create an eyebrow, you can make the access more difficult. So a lot of the generic skills can be practiced uh, on the model. By making two slits in the model clay, and here's some uh, cotton wool bud, or you can use a matchstick underneath that just acts as a strabismus hook. You place this underneath, like so, and that's your squint hook. So you can practice your surgery without having an assistant. So if I go on to the next clip, fixed happen, Rebecca just practicing this. Just going to fast forward it through a little bit. You take a partial thickness bite through the edge of the model, supinating your wrist to recreate the needle by orientation to the next pass. So very realistic, very cheap model, which we think anybody anywhere in the world can access this material to develop a model eye, which they can use multiple times. Again, all these videos will be on the strabismus section of the simulation gallery, so you can watch them at your leisure. In the interest of time, I'm just going to stop now, this was a video of Ed Wilson talking about the surgical workshops, but we've only got a couple of minutes to go. So, David, if you want to join us again, Yining. For those of you who have received the WISPOS uh, e blast in the past, you'll be aware that WISPOS will be holding a live, remotely supervised uh, surgical workshop. And the plan is to use those model eyes uh, to teach first year residents how to carry out the basics of strabismus surgery. So in the next week, there will be an e-blast from WISPOS looking for a first, first year residents who've done no strabismus 
done no strabismus surgery who would like to express an interest in taking part in the workshop. And what we will require is photographic evidence. You've made the model eye. You've got the camera set up shown by Sunil there. Uh, and you've got some basic instruments. And then we will select the first 20 or 24 trainees who provide us with the information. And we'll have six internationally renowned strabismus surgeons as your uh, trained faculty. And we'll use uh, breakout rooms to remotely supervise an hour's worth of basic surgical training. And we'll edit those videos and put them together and present them on the webinar on the 27th of March. Well, those training days for those lucky enough to be selected will be either on Sunday the 14th or Sunday the 21st of March. So for first residents who are interested uh, anywhere in the world in picking up some basic strabismus surgical skills, look out for eBLAST, ping us your applications. This will be another world first for WSBOS, the first ever remotely supervised surgical uh, workshop. Uh, we've just got a couple of minutes to to finish things uh, off. Uh, Yining, thank you once again for your tremendous contribution to the last lecture of the day. David, Ken, Ramesh, Andrew, Kathy, Becca, Parth and Matt, thank you for your uh, tremendous talk today. We've had an absolutely huge audience. I didn't think on a Friday when people are actually working around the globe rather than the normal Saturday, we get over 3,000 people uh, watching. I think it's a great to have this uh, on YouTube for people to watch these amazing lectures at their, their leisure with due to time zone or work commitments. They weren't able to follow us for the full eight hours. Um, but uh, something we would, I'm sure, like to repeat. And hopefully those watching will have been inspired to perhaps look more closely at a career in pediatric uh, ophthalmology. David, I'll just hand over to you for the, the last word uh, on the day. All right. I, I don't know if I have anything really to add, to, except to thank you and Yining for your, your educational efforts. I mean, these are uh, kind of what I was talking about is the giving back and making a difference. The uh, These workshops and the educational efforts that you're putting in to make a difference are, are really changing the world. So I get to, on behalf of all the doctors that you're helping train worldwide, say thank you to both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Thank you. everyone, for joining us. Uh, please look out for tomorrow's webinar, Grand Rounds, uh, and WISPOS, followed by the Strabismus Hall of Fame on Sunday. So it's a, a triple header from WISPOS <laughs> here on this uh, cold February weekend. Uh, all the best, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, yeah.